Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for coming out tonight. Today is um, Wednesday, November 17th, 2021, and this is the City of Homestead uh, presentation agenda. Uh, I'm Mayor Steve Lostner. I'm joined by several members of council with me tonight. And we want to take a few moments to recognize National Adoption Month and specifically those individuals and families who have opened their homes and their hearts and their lives to, to take those in and, and make them part of their family at all ages, from newborn to adolescence. Uh, it's, it's quite an undertaking that, that many of you have, have chosen to uh, pursue, and we want to take a moment and, uh, and recognize you tonight. We have with us Shamel Jenkins, who's the executive director and past president of the Miami-Dade County Foster and Adoptive Parent Association. Shamel, are you? You're here. Come on up and join me, please. Welcome. Glad we could get this done tonight. Is this a proclamation? It is. Okay, I'm going to ask Cynthia Hughes, my, one of my board members, to come up, and my two folks from Citrus Family Care Network, which is the lead CDC for sure. Miami Dade County, to come up. I may be hot, but I don't do it all alone. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Thank you all. All right, we have a proclamation. Um, Whereas we have a responsibility as individuals, neighbors, community members, and citizens of Homestead, Florida to recognize that all children need love, support, security, and a place to call home. And for children who are born into families unable to meet their ongoing needs, adoption offers healthy and safe family environments which help produce confident and successful adults. And families who choose the life-changing path of an adoption make a meaningful and lasting difference in the lives of some of the most vulnerable young people in our society. Whereas during National Adoption Month, we celebrate all those who have invited a child in need into their hearts and into their homes and express our profound appreciation for all who help make adoptions possible. And whereas Adoption Month calls attention to the opportunities to help children and youth secure stable connections to become independent, productive adults through permanency and part of a forever home through adoption. Now I, Stephen D. Lossner, as mayor of the city of Homestead, hereby proclaim the month of November 2021 as National Adoption Month in Homestead and urge all citizens to engage in activities that strengthen families and communities to provide the optimal environment for children to learn, grow, and thrive so that all children have the benefit of a happy, healthy, and safe home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Get my good side. Wait, do it again, do it again. I don't have one. I just stand everyone, my name is Shamel Jenkins. I'm the immediate past president and executive director, oh, okay, celebrity, <laughs> for Miami-Dade County Foster and Adoptive Parent Association. We are a 36-year-old 501c3 nonprofit organization. Um, we are responsible to speak, advocate, and help support all the foster youth, adoptive youth, relative care youth, and their caregivers that live in Miami-Dade County. And this is November, which is National Adoption Month, which was started way back in the early 60s with um, Michael Dukakis, who was the governor from Massachusetts. He had heard about it from other little cities. So by the time it got to President Ford, they decided to have National Adoption Week. Then it went through Ronald Reagan to Jimmy Carter, to finally it became National Adoption Month. National Adoption Month has seven steps. One, to tell our stories as adoptive parents and tell the stories of the children. Two, to remind you that there are children that need to have homes, and so on and so on and so on. 
What I've done is I've charged every mayor of every city, every county, I'm sorry, every city, every village, and every town in Miami-Dade County to do as you're doing today. So almost every other night, we are somewhere having our families being honored. Why? Because you guys, you, you operate for them, right? But you need to know that they're here and that they're one of the first points when there's a disaster or something needs to happen when they may need help, you think about them. People forget about kids that are in foster care. All these kids were in foster care before we decided to keep giving them a forever home. All of these kids and all of these parents are, have PTSD. All of them are separated from their biological families. All of them now are getting that extra love. But you know what? When there's a, a disaster or something, they're forgotten about. Not only are the children forgotten, but the caregivers are forgotten. None of us are rich. Well, y'all might be what, we're not. <laughs> um, I thank actually, Mayor, because you should know us. Because every year we come before you to ask for the facilities at, hi, at FICO Williams. We have them because of the pandemic, but we're still going very strong. There are actually 204 adoptive families in the city of Homestead with children in their homes between the ages of 1 and 18. There are far more than that, but we're only going up to age 18. So I just don't want to take too much time because I know you have a long agenda, but this means so much to these caregivers that are here because you're saying thank you. You're recognizing that they exist. You're recognizing that they're making children to become good citizens of this city. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> Tris, do you have anything to say really quick? Oh, yes, and we need foster parents. Um, you can be single as long as you haven't murdered someone. Miss Jennifer, as long as you haven't murdered someone, you can become a foster parent. So, and it's free. So thank you very much. I really, 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 really appreciate it. Let me tell you something. I'm a single parent. I've adopted five children. I've fostered over 300. I had to buy my own wedding ring. Isn't this pitiful? Because I'm looking for a rich husband. <laughs> but this is the sacrifices that we make. So, I, and, and wait a minute. I'm not getting paid. Hi, honey. <laughs> We are all volunteers. We're not getting paid. So I'm out here every night. So the next time I come, I want to thank Sister Russell. Make sure we have lobster ready. But I thank you all very, very much. You don't know what it means to these parents that are here tonight. Thank you. Well, we, we also tonight want to specifically recognize and express our appreciation to those individuals and, and couples who have brought children into their homes as, as part of their adopted family. I'll, I'll read what the certificate, you know, say, they all say, and then I'll ask each, uh, each of the families, the entire families, if you wish to, to come up and receive just a small token of our appreciation. This is a certificate of special recognition uh, presented in recognition of your commitment to becoming an adoptive family, giving youth in our community safe haven, a forever family, security, and endless love. We celebrate tonight those who have invited a child in need into their hearts and into their homes and express our profound appreciation for all who help make adoptions possible. The City of Homestead salutes you, presented this 17th day of November 2021 by Mayor and Council. So the first certificate I have is for Angela Brown. Are you here, Angela? Come on down. We have next uh, Christine Santiago.
William Presswood. Oh, she got it. Yeah, she got it. She's got it.
Again, thank you to all the families who came tonight and for uh, the priceless opportunity that you've given these, these children to have a real home and family life. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. That's it. Okay, so let's see, Mr. Attorney, we'll make sure that this is okay here. Again, thank you all, and I think this concludes the presentation ceremony, and we'll convene our regular council meeting in about 10 minutes. So thank you all. Sure. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'd like to uh, call the City of Homestead regular council meeting to order. Today is Wednesday, November 17th, and it is 6.02 p.m. Please rise and join with me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Councilwoman Bailey. Here. Councilman Rom. Here. Councilwoman Avila. Here. Councilman Fletcher. Here. Vice Mayor Guzman. Mayor Lozner. Here. Thank you. All right, Madam Manager, are there any additions, deletions, or deferrals? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, we would like to pull tab five, car 3394, from the consent agenda because Donum Criste Servidores del Servidor Comunidad Apostolica Hijos de Padre Pio is no longer requesting a waiver of usage fees for James Archer as they will be partnering with Councilwoman Bailey on a previously planned event on the same day at Roby George. Thank you. And uh, at this point, I'd like to go ahead and uh, going to ask for two separate motions. The first being proactive and asking for a motion and approval to extend the time of this meeting from 8:30 to 10:30. Moved by the vice mayor. Second by Councilwoman Bailey. All in favor? Any opposed? Also, I'd appreciate a motion approving the movement of tab 38, the presentations with respect to the old city hall site, to become the next item for discussion and action tonight. Moving it to the front of the agenda. Moved by the vice mayor. I have a second from Councilman Fletcher. All in favor? Any opposed? All right, thank you. So, we'll jump ahead to, to tab 38. Uh, Madam Manager, will set the stage for us. Thank you, Mayor. On June 18th, 2021, the City of Homestead issued a 163 notice to alert interested parties of the City's intent to dispose of an interest in the approximately 16 acres of real property on the southwest corner of US 1 and Campbell Drive, known as Old City Hall, for purchasing or redevelopment or rehabilitation. Responses were due on July 19th, 2021. At the August 3rd, 2021 Committee of the Whole, the Mayor and City Council discussed five responses and directed staff to issue a request for additional information to the respondents. The RFI was issued on August 10th, 2021, and responses were due by August 27th, 2021. Two of the five initial respondents submitted information in response to the RFI. 
Those RFI responses were discussed at the October 12th, 2021 Committee of the Whole, at which time the Mayor and Council directed staff to have the respondents appear at the November 17th, 2021 Council meeting with final presentations for review and discussion. And both groups are here to present, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Madam Manager. And uh, by the fact that the related group went first uh, last uh, go round, I would uh, now call upon the uh, HTG Flux group to, uh, to come forward and make their presentation should they so desire. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Before we start, just for the record, Councilwoman Fairclaw Staggers has joined the dais. And if you'll give us your name and address for the record, please proceed. Good evening, Mayor Lausner. Thank you so much for having us here. Thank you to the councilmen and councilwomen here to listen to our proposal for the Park Plaza site. My name is Matthew Rieger. I'm the president and CEO of Housing Trust Group. I'm a fourth generation real estate developer and builder. Housing Trust Group is an award-winning developer of multifamily communities. Market rate, workforce, affordable, office, and most importantly, mixed use developments. We've developed over 50 communities in the last 20 years. And as I mentioned before, we're very proud of the awards that we've won. Part of our team is Flux Architects. They are LEED certified and have a lot of experience doing mixed use as well. Also on our team is Suchman Real, Real Retail Group. They have a lot of local experience with large national tenants. Let's talk for a second about some of the awards we won, because as I mentioned, I'm very proud of those awards. Most recently, as recently as a month ago, we were very proud to accept South Florida Business Journal's Business of the Year. I've won some personal awards that I'm proud of, but not nearly as proud as the ones we've won as a team. I'm a team player, and as I think you'll see from our proposal, this is a collaborative effort at HTG. We're number 95 on the fastest growing companies in Florida, and also won Developer of the Year by the Greater Miami Chamber of Commerce as recently as 2019. Housing Trust Group, as I mentioned, is a family business. My father's been developing real estate in South Florida for 50 years. I joined the company in 2004 and took over as president and CEO in 2011. And since then, we've had some great success. Collectively, we've developed over 50,000 multifamily units, 12,000 of those are market rate units, luxury market rate units. We've developed over 2 million square feet of retail space and over $5 billion in commercial land and residential developments across the Sun Belt. Critically, the three principles of Housing Trust Group have the financial strength and wherewithal to develop any property in any city in the entire United States of America. Let's talk for a second about our proposal, and I'm going to give you a brief overview before we get into specifics. The number one thing I want to emphasize is we want to make a special place here in Homestead. We want to make sure that the residents of Homestead have access to recreation, transportation, and health care. We want to create synergy with downtown 
We want complementary uses with what's being planned downtown. Trolley stops, retail, and digital marketing efforts. Live, work, play. You hear it all the time. It's the future. People don't want to get in their car and have to drive an hour to find something fun to do. They want to live, work, and play all in the same community. We're going to create curated concepts and activities to draw traffic to the old City Hall Center. Growth and advancement. We're all about that at HTG. We do it internally at our company, and we're going to do it here with this development. We want to provide students and young entrepreneurs with an opportunity to grow through incubator spaces. We want to support nonprofits. We joint venture with nonprofits all the time, and we really help them fulfill their goals. So we want to work with Homestead nonprofit organizations whose focus is on families, education, and career advancement. Finally, local preferences. I'm local. I don't want to bring in a bunch of big firms from New York and LA. We want to hire local, we want the jobs to go to locals, and we want to create jobs that are good jobs, and we want to train the local citizens so that they can maintain those jobs and increase their pay over time. This is an aerial overview of the site. Here's pulled back a little further. And with that, I'm going to play for you a video. Enjoyed that. Before I talk, oh, can you go back to our slideshow, please? Thank you. Before I talk about Homestead, I just want to emphasize how accomplished HCG has been recently. We have over 1,100 new construction units currently in construction right now. We have 2,500 market rate workforce and affordable units in our pre development pipeline that will break ground next year. And finally, we have over $240 million in assets under management and over $415 million in real estate that we own as our three partners. So next, let's talk a little bit about Homestead and I'm gonna turn it over to Delia to take you through some of the specifics of our plan. Homestead, what is Homestead? It's agricultural, it's the gateway to the Florida Keys. It's got rodeo, wildlife, equestrian, it's adrenaline filled. It's got off-roading, it's got the world-famous NASCAR, it's organic, it's sustainable, but most importantly, it is authentic. Delia, could you please tell us a little bit about some of the specifics of our plan? Thank you, Matt. Good evening. Thank you for having us. So um, I would like to add to what Matt just um, went through with Homestead. Uh, while sitting with all of the council um, in our one-on-ones, it was very evident to us from the get-go the importance of uh, making meaningful partnerships with local nonprofits. 
and we see why. Homestead has uh, exceptional and well-established organizations that provide valuable educational and cultural programs and advancement for groups in the, the, with the most need. Some of those examples that we will partner with include the Cybrarium, the Mexican American Council, Patches, Neva King Cooper, the Seminole Theater, and Miami Day College. Combining these exceptional programs with the expected population growth for Homestead, as well as the local talent, and in addition, from what Matt explained here, the unique resources that are available to Homestead and its unique position near some tourism hubs makes it so that we believe that the missing piece here that could make all of those elements be maximized is to bring in a new concept and a food hall and marketplace incubator space. If you take a look at the upper right corner, you'll see pointed out the locations highlighted on the site plan of the two major indoor congregation spaces that we have included in our proposal. Not only did we hear you loud and clear about the desire for some event space or convention space, which we have added um, in order to include events such as trade shows, weddings, uh, corporate events, um, we have positioned that space directly across this new food hall and marketplace so that they can be complementary, not just in activity, but in making sure that the events also support that um, incubator space and some of those retail and restaurant spaces. So why are we betting on this concept? Well, food has become a trend, especially with millennials and foodies. We can see that people now want to experience their food in more curious and exceptional ways. We started seeing this with food trucks back in 2008, and still that continues to be a trend and a phenomenon. And the same started happening with food halls around 2016. They continue to pop up across the nation in all major cities, and they bring quality food and options to communities. The marketplace will complement this food hall space by providing spaces for small businesses, such as bakeries, um, artisanal products, uh, plant nurseries, farming, herbals, and textiles, to have a space to showcase their products um, in an affordable rates that they can lease. This new food hall and marketplace will promote homemade, sustainable, and organic products. And the culinary space will provide for chef demonstrations as well as be a setting for new chefs to use as an incubator-like space. On the upper hand corner again, you see highlighted the two smaller buildings that will anchor um, the wellness lake and the theater stage. These spaces total about 15,000 square feet, including uh, the large outdoor terraces on the second floor for alfresco dining. Um, these spaces are ideal for retail such as uh, clothing retail, unique fitness classes that we can bring into the area, concepts that are not really available here right now and are innovative and can bring people to the site. This is a view walking towards the amphitheater stage towards that big lake. You can see the outdoor terraces on the second floor. Again, ideal for people to congregate, to come look at the show and enjoy. We have also consolidated and uh, our proposal maximizes the location for visually exciting public art. Um, we have highlighted these areas in the map there and uh, those will be for local artists. The homesteaded art loop is a completely um, and close, I mean, joined loop that basically joins every area of the site as well as connecting 
to the bus stops nearby and providing pedestrians and bikes with a safe padded path to exercise and to commute to the bus stations. That, um, that homesteader art loop will also connect to some of the other public activities that we have provided for anyone who comes to visit the site. These include, as you can see, um, the amazing entertainment stage, which in itself is a completely um, separate event venue that can hold 500 to 600 people. This is in addition to the indoor event space. So this can hold completely unique events. Um, we have also have uh, pointed out there uh, where, the, um, with, where the homesteader loop would join into um, an outdoor gym area, a dog park, and a children's playground. All of these available for anyone who comes to visit to enjoy. Here, as you can see, some visualizations of what those green spaces along the path can be used as the activities that can take place, and the local art. As you can see, we have dedicated specific spots on our plan to make sure that they are showcased. So how can this great lakeside theater really bring unique activities to Homestead? Well, these are just a sample of some of the events that we think would be a great innovation and addition to Homestead. Not only are these events fun and family-oriented, bringing people in, they can also be great opportunities to truly partner with the Cybrarium, with the Air Force, doing events that are educational, such as you know, building and racing um, RC cars, boats, drone races, uh, making sure those are accompanied with educational talks about specific subjects, for example, aerodynamics um, with, with the Air Force. That would be something that kids would enjoy, accompanied with food trucks and as well as the food hall. The whole family can come enjoy that. Um, not to mention making sure that we have weekly, monthly, annual events. And the annual events can be, you know, something that truly showcases some of Homestead's um, talent, such as seminal theater performances, as well as even imagine the mariachi from the Mexican American Council Group um, making a great performances on that stage to make authentic festivals. This is what that space could look like at night during those events, active, being used, as you can see, the scale of this place is to be public, a public amenity for everyone. And finally, to complement all of those heavy entertainment uses and spaces, we have provided over 20,000 square feet of retail that is geared towards office space and medical and wellness concepts. So what does that mean? That includes you know, retail that revolves around beauty, fitness, wellness, hobbies, and medical office space. That was a part of our proposal, um, and it has been reduced to accommodate and complement more of um, other uses that can really bring innovative events to the site. With that, um, that's the portion uh, that is commercial and retail and office. So Max here is going to take you through the residential component of our proposal. Take over. Thanks, DJ. Good evening, anyone, everyone. So we heard loud and clear uh, the council's desire for this place to be completely market rate. We also heard concerns that there might be too much density. So what we're proposing is 280 market rate units, and that's going to be comprised of 250 Oh, I'm sorry. That's going to be comprised of 250 residences and 30 live uh, work units. What I call the wing uh, buildings that you see up there, those are comprised of the first story retail and four stories of residential, while the rear building is going to be a five story residential. All the residential buildings are going to be able to share on the same resort style amenities 
of rooftop decks, fire pits, swimming pools, uh, fitness rooms, uh, and you know, loaded uh, clubhouses. The live work units have a dedicated have dedicated studios and an additional 7,000 square feet of dedicated space. Now, what this is important is that these art studios are going to be able to provide you know the, the opportunity for local artists to be able to partner with local schools and provide art classes. They'll also be able to participate in our own Park Plaza art festivals, which would be monthly events that we would have in partnership with our own you know, food festivals or farmer's market. Uh, this truly lets the artists of Homestead be able to live and work and sell their crafts directly in their own zip code. The added benefit, obviously, is with these residents is that they're going to be able to share the same amenities as everybody else. Now, at HTG, we design and build H -E -H, uh, each HTG, HTG home as an escape from the outside world. We want people to be able to come home and be able to disconnect from the stresses that they have outside their doors. And to that end, what we do is provide every single luxury that we can to the residents that stay in our homes. You know, each home has an open floor plan with typical standards like quartz or granite countertops, smart tech features like smart thermosets and smart fixture, uh, light fixtures, stainless steel and energy efficient appliances, oversized walk-in closets and seek, uh, sleek wide plank flooring. Now I mentioned before that we have this resort style living that we feel very strongly about in HTG. Uh, this provides a feeling of home for the residents and provides their own destination. Besides being in Park, uh, Park Plaza, they have their own destination coming home to their community. Some of the uh, amenities that we have at Park Plaza that we offer, just to name a few, would be demonstration kitchens, fitness centers, rooftop pools, large clubhouses, outdoor kitchens, and barbecue areas. In regards to transportation, uh, you know, we could take advantage of uh, future transportation changes. Uh, for instance, the Homestead Trolley could be uh, creating stops here as well as connecting to down, uh, down, uh, downtown Homestead for better synergy and connectivity. Uh, our new Homesteader Art Loop, which Dilly had mentioned, would be able to uh, connect with the proposed bike connections and running path to complement the future Miami-Dade Rapid Transit station that's on 312. And additionally, with the 800 parking stations that we have and charging stations, we're gonna have plenty of parking for the leasing and commercial that everything's gonna lease up quickly. We also heard that there was a concern from the council that they don't want what we provide here at Park Plaza to take away from what you guys have done an amazing job uh, over at downtown Homestead. Uh, we think there's a true synergy here and a great way to have something that's complementary to each other. We don't have to compete, 100%. We wanna be able to provide services that is complementary to downtown Homestead. How do we do that? Besides being selective in what we uh, uh, lease to in terms of uh, Park Plaza, uh, Suchman Group, who is our retail partner, has offered to be uh, the one who sources and coordinates retail tenants between locations between the two so that we, we are not you know, stealing away from other people's uh, uh, ideas. And the other thing that we're planning on doing is want to create a joint social media marketing and branding between the two locations so that it's not Park Plaza versus Downtown Homestead, but we are both of the same. Another thing that we're, we're expecting to implement is partnering with the retail at Downtown Homestead so that we're providing residents of Park Plaza discounts so that they themselves are going to Downtown Homestead to go to the movies, go to the bowling alley, to be able to enjoy those uh, services. You know, at HTG, we, we are all about local business hiring and training local residents. This is something that's very important. Matt had mentioned it before. We want to make sure that when we come into a community, we are providing to that community and making sure that they're better off after we're, you know, after we're, you know, done with what we're doing. Um, we commit to hiring up to 75% of our budget from local and minority businesses. In addition to that, we're gonna be offering job training and uh, job placement. We're also gonna be throwing 
job fairs so that local residents are going to be able to uh, have an opportunity to work not only in the construction side of it, but also uh, in the actual retail and commercial establishments. And lastly, we plan on working with our subcontractors and our GCs to create an apprenticeship program so that we are able to teach residents of Homestead uh, new trades so that they could further improve their lives. And lastly, regarding uh, sustainability. It's very important to us, it's very critical. Uh, Park Plaza was gonna be an NGBS, is going to be an NGBS gold standard. In addition to that, we're gonna be providing things like rainwater harvesting through the Wellness Lake, green roofs for building cooling, uh, bioswells for rain runoff. Uh, we're also gonna be providing native uh, vegetation and you know, some of the features that we're going to be having uh, for the units are going to be energy efficient lighting fixtures and appliances and many other things that meet the gold standard. And with that, Matt's going to go ahead and speak about the economic benefits of the city of Homestead. Thank you, Max. Our proposal will provide $415 million of economic benefit to the city. Why is that? We're not going to own the land. You guys are going to own the land. It's a 99-year ground lease. It's your property. You guys maintain ownership. This is not contingent on anything. This is not dependent on any kind of financing. Additionally, we're going to retire the entire $8 million plus loan that's currently on the city's books, and we're going to do that at closing. Finally, we believe our proposal will create $1.3 million of annual recurring economic benefit to the city by virtue of a 15% participation in the net cash flow operations of this entire development and community. Our timeline is as follows. Assuming someone is selected today, we want to undertake pre-development activities immediately. But what do I mean by that? It doesn't mean I'm about to take a plan in for, for approval. We want to meet with the community more and again. This is a development for the community. We want more community input. We want constant and continual community input to build what the community wants to see on this site. And we are expert at doing that. We've done that over and over again at our various developments. That's what I said, we're a team and we collaborate. It's because we want to include the citizens of Homestead in the overall planning of this development. We hope to close on financing in 2023, at which time we'll make a payment to the city of north of $8 million to retire their loan. We believe we'll complete construction sometime in the following year, in 2024, and have a grand opening in 2025. With that, I'd uh, like to play the video one more time so you can see what we're providing after we've gone through the specifics of our plan. First time you saw it, it was just a pretty picture. Now you see what everything actually is.
genuine thank you to each of you for your time. We welcome any comments you have or questions you guys may have for us. Thank you, Mr. Rieger. I think uh, what I envision is we'll now have the presentation from the related group, if they're here and ready to go forward, and then we will uh, have public comments and then questions and comments and uh, potential action from council. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Mayor. Appreciate it. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, congratulations to our new, newly elected uh, council members and uh, to, to, to all of you. And, and again, thanks for accommodating us today uh, for our, the, the official presentation uh, for what we think is a, a very important uh, project for us. Again, my name is Albert Milo. I am the president of Related Urban. Um, and just big ones. So, again, the this this is a today is a is 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 an exercise in 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 what 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 I think we do best, and and it separates us from from a lot of other development companies and that's that's the fact that we that we we try to listen right so um, we we've been here myself as a principal have been here at, at, at all of the meetings uh, you've, you've seen me um, I've been able to uh, gather that dot, that that input from 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 the council some of it um, here from the dais some of it in some of our um, personal meetings um, but and you'll see, uh, the, this is an evolution of of some of that input, along with the community input that we've done. You know, if there's one thing that that for sure separates us is is the fact that I, I clearly understand. You know, though we have a lot of experience, and though we have a lot of financial strength, and though we've built a lot of units, I I, I do understand that this is a, a a collaborative process, and there's a reason why, you know, we have. And I have, you know, two ears and one mouth, and that is for the simple reason that we want to we want to listen. And and you'll see today some of the uh, additions and, and modifications that we that we've done based upon that the fact of, of that we've been listening to to the council and, and to the community. So um, the the. Uh, our vision for this, this site, and, and, and it's, it's always been for this to be a signature uh, project, right? That's why we're bringing our best-in-class City Place brand. This is not a concept, you know. This is something that we have done as a company. Um, you see here City Place Doral um, is a true, functioning, built, live, work, and play destination. This is part of the related brand. Here's another example, City Place Homestead. Once again, another project that was in a area that was a challenged area at the time and now it is one of the most thriving areas in and around downtown West Palm Beach. So again, you know, it, it's important to have some real experience in designing and developing these type of mixed-use projects. It's not necessarily about renderings or concepts. It's about being able to execute on that plan. Here's another example. You know, we were the first developers to create residential in the Wynwood area, and I'm sure most of you have now heard or, or maybe you've even seen what's happened in Wynwood, right? So. We were the first to put our flag down and, and bring residential into an area that was previously mostly just part of the um, industrial and then the arts program started and we brought residential, we brought office, we brought hotel, we brought world-class public art, and we brought food and beverage, state-of-the-art restaurants to the area. 
Another example, Coconut Grove, Park Grove. This is the old Coconut Grove bank site. So again, another project that used to be a one-story um, bank building on South Bayshore became a total mixed-use, high-end development, including home ownership, our new corporate offices, um, again, signature restaurant, food and beverage, top, top of the line public amenities and public art as we do in everything that we built. Talking a little bit about our financial strength, and, and even before I get into our financial strength, let me, let me take it a step back about, about corporate history. So our, our, our company was founded in 1979. 42 years we've been building and developing. Started here in, 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 in Miami, and some of our accomplishments are over 100,000 units that we've built and managed, over $50 billion in capital raised, and we've worked on projects not just locally, not just in Florida, but nationally and internationally. So we have every type of development and product line in the real estate field, except for industrial space. You know, we've got international condominiums, we've got international hotels with luxury brands such as the Ritz Carlton, Armani, Alberge, SLS, you know, we have established working relationships with the top of the line hotel brands. We've got established working relationships in top world-renowned chefs, world-renowned restaurateurs in our current projects. Again, we don't rely on outside entities to try to um, generate those relationships for us. We have those relationships. Um, here you can just see some of the lenders and the investors that we work with. You look at that list, I mean, it is all of the major financial players, you know, in the U.S. And those are, again, established and existing relationships that we have. Talking about our specifics of our, our financial strength. We provided audited financials to, to the city. Um, in those audited financials, if you, if, you, if you reviewed them, you saw that we have over $430 million of net worth. 260 million of that is liquidity. So that's important because when you're trying to do a project of this magnitude, a lot of times you have to invest your money up front. Why? Because you have to be the first believer in the project, in the vision of the project. Then sometimes the lending institutions will follow, but you have to have sufficient liquidity to execute a vision of this kind. So it's very important. We provided firm financial commitments. We have updated commitments on our numbers. So it's not about, again, pretty pictures. It's about the ability to execute, and the ability to raise capital. We've never said that we were uh, subject to any type of competitive financing. We've always proffered that we would invest our own money, including monies in a qualified opportunity zone, which this area is, to make this project you know, come to fruition. Experience of public-private partnerships, you know, that's our niche. Here you see just four of the latest municipalities that we've partnered with. Um, that work has yielded over $1.8 billion of public-private partnership experience. So when we talk about selecting a partner, again, I think it's important for that public sector partner to make sure that their private sector partner is going to be able to take the project to fruition. And again, $1.8 billion 
is a lot of development of public-private partnership work. Um, talking about rankings, we were ranked the sixth largest multifamily developer in the United States last year by Multi-Housing News. And we've developed over 10,000 units of mixed income, uh, of mixed use alone. This is what I think is extremely important. We are a vertically integrated company. And why, why is that important? And, and what, is that, what does that mean? First of all, Related Urban, who I'm the president of, and, and, and I have um, the authority to, to, to negotiate and, 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 and bind our, our company, is the development arm which will design entitle, finance the project, right? And negotiate with our public partner. Once that is complete, then our affiliated company, our general contracting entity, which is Fortune Urban Construction, builds the project. Why is that important? Because that gives us the ability, number one, to control costs because we have direct privity with the subcontractors. Number two, it gives us the ability to determine how we're going to award those subcontractors and gives us maximum flexibility about how we can hire local firms and we can hire minority firms. It also gives us maximum flexibility and, and accountability in order to have local hiring. Why? Because we can enforce those provisions on our subcontractors and have those uh, instilled into their contracts, right? It's not about, hey, we're the developer and, and there's an issue and point the finger at the general contractor. Well, there's no finger to point with us. The buck stops with us. We are fully integrated. If, there's, if the council has a, a question, if anyone has a question, they know who to reach. Um, and lastly, once the project is constructed, we also manage it long term. We're not flippers. We're not here to develop a project, try to work out a sweetheart deal with the council, and then stabilize the project, and then flip it for a profit. Why, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, you can do that. You have a long term lease, and, and, and you sell it. And then the council thought, that you had certain things that you negotiated, certain things that were proffered, but now the entity that you did business with is no longer at the table. And so this is extremely important because, again, from cradle to grave, if there's a question as it relates to City Place Homestead, the call is for me to deal because we are fully vertically integrated. Now let's talk a little bit about the development itself. Um, again, this is a class A mixed use uh, development. Um, some of the enhancements and, and modifications that we made are shown here on, 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 on this uh, slide. Um, we, we've always had a, a conference space and a hotel um, area, which again was one of the comments that came from the council. We added a rooftop lounge to that component to, to continue to have, again, more avenues for uh, entertainment there. We made some modifications to some of the office space to create, again, more space for additional restaurant space. And we, one of the other significant modifications that we made is we added a home ownership component. We think it's important to not just have rentals, but we added a market rate homeownership component. Again, Related is built, you know, not just multifamily housing, but we're known as the largest condominium developer uh, probably in the country. You know, so most people think that's all we do. But in reality, you know, we have all different type of uses. So that is a component that is unique to our proposal. We think that it's important for people to come and live here, invest here, but we also think it's important for them to have an equity position 
in the city of Homestead. So that's why we added a home ownership component to our proposal. Again, back you know through the overall program of the of the site, we've got 50,000 square feet of ground floor retail. We've got you know space set aside for micro retail, um, and as we originally discussed, we proffered to reserve 10 percent of our retail space for homestead nonprofits to be able to participate uh, in that in that space. And some of our nonprofit partners are here today. Um, the, on the residential side, it is a class A residential market rate uh, building. We actually have 336 units on the rental side. And like I mentioned before, we added 100 units for um, the home ownership piece, okay? We've got 13 live work units and we have 6,000 square feet of gallery space and of tech incubator space. We've got an acre and a half of what we're calling the Central Park, which is the, the main spine of the development. And you'll see some of the ideas that you know, could be, uh, and uses that could be uh, accomplished with that space. 837 parking spaces. We've got four, four, uh, four, four 5,000 square foot uh, restaurant spaces including rooftop dining and our hotel component, which as I mentioned previously, we added a rooftop lounge and it, and it includes the 10,000 square feet of conference space that we had previously mentioned. Here is a breakdown of the actual residential. You know, we're under 30 units an acre. It's actually 26 units an acre. Um, again, 336 rental units, 100 home ownership units, there's a breakdown between the unit types, and more importantly, you see our home ownership piece is intended to be all two-bedroom units, about 1,000 square feet, to, to be sold as condominiums. Here's a shot of the Central Park area and some of the activities and, and the families that can uh, uh, participate and, and how and a feel within the fact that it's, it's all part of the mixed use concept. So you also could be, you know, living in, in your unit and overseeing the green space and stuff or your kids playing and so on and so forth. So, so that is an important component of having that neighborhood uh, feel. On the retail side, again, we talked about we have 50,000 square feet of ground floor retail. And there you see some of the lifestyle shots and, and the type of retail amenities that we're uh, proposing. The four restaurants, you know, strategically located on the, on the perimeter side, the larger ones. Um, so some on the corner of Campbell and US-1, um, and the other ones facing US-1, one within the ground floor of the hotel. Um, so those are the larger restaurant spaces. Any other smaller uses like an ice cream shop or, or, or things of that nature, smaller, would be in the ground floor retail facing Central Park. Here's another shot of the, of the park. And again, you see the ground floor retail there uh, on, the, on the bottom uh, left. Hotel, again, the idea is to do, you know, we heard different concepts of hotel that um, so in some of our, our discussions, we heard that there's also a need for a little bit of an extended stay component. So it's flexible. Uh, we made that modification and it could be you know, more for extended stay that can serve the base and other, other um, uses in the area that sometimes you don't want a traditional hotel room which, which you don't have a kitchen or a kitchenette to, to be able to uh, stay for a longer period of time. So, you know, we made that modification. Principle number two is designing for wellness, right? So we want to create spaces that encourage physical, emotional, and mental well-being. And, and these are just some ideas of what that space uh, can look like and what are those uses uh, can be. Um, again, you see the Central Park area, you see some of the designated uh, uses, you know, outdoor eating areas, bike and pedestrian path, dog parks, and just general uh, uh, outdoor space for, for families to, to enjoy. Community events, you know, things like 
again, yoga in the park, uh, different type of, of food events. So that was always, this has been in our plan from, from the inception. This is not a new concept. We always envisioned having a master uh, outdoor Central Park uh, area. This, this is another important aspect of, of, of our proposal, and, and that's the fact that, and I talked about that previously, that at the old city hall, there's some, there's some actual components and, and some murals um, that, are, that, that are like stone that, that are really nice, actually. So part of our proposal is to try to, uh, when, once the, the demolition occurs, take those off you know, carefully and try to reuse that as part of preser preserving the history of the site and part of this art walk concept that, that we are, are proposing in our site. And you know, some of those uses could be along, you know, running east and west along Campbell. Connectivity to downtown, um, extremely uh, important. Again, it's been in our proposal from day one. We never, you know, wanted to uh, make it a, a competing uh, vision. But, but again, this is the gateway. This should be envisioned as your gateway to your downtown, to your historic downtown. So we've always had the concept of connectivity to all of the different uh, uses within uh, the immediate area and the downtown area. Um, incorporating a stop for the trolley, um, which is part of pretty easy, you know, and how we've cons reconfigured the site to make sure that you have that strategic stop and that trolley can connect from, you know, City Place Homestead to events happening in and around downtown and either at the, here at City Hall or Seminole Theater or any of the other uh, places in downtown. Bike routes. Also, we've considered, you know, how to strategically connect, you know, the location of the site to some of the other uses and make sure that we have multimodal type of, of transportation and, and, and that we think that through up front. So not, not, we understand not everyone's going to ride the trolley, not everyone's going to ride uh, the BRT, not everyone's going to want to drive their car. So we have to be strategic in how we think through how to connect all of the different uses in the neighborhood in the area. So we've given that some thought as far as, you know, some of the potential bike routes. And this slide just shows you, again, um, all of the other community assets that are in and around the site, you know, the parks, the educational facilities, again, historic downtown, historic, you know, sit, you know the city hall. So it, it, it just puts it into context for you, you know, the proximity of the site. And another extremely important principle is, you know, we want to make sure that we promote local art and local tech in the community, right? So we want to create spaces for artists and innovators to be able to create, connect, and exhibit their work. Again, we've had this in our proposal and this concept since the inception. You know, we always propose to connect the portion of the site, the western portion of the site that abuts the power plant on Campbell to the actual site. And that's how we created this, uh, you know, NQ uh, space and, and art space and there there's a an example of where where it is that little parcel on the top left is that it, it abuts the the power plant and you see how we can connect the you know city hall proper site to the to the little portion across the street right now it's just sitting vacant it's underutilized and that's a great connecting point to your mass transit and to now draw into the bigger, larger uh, development. Again, it'll contain 13 live work units, 3,000 square feet of gallery space, and 3,000 square feet of tech incubator space. And lastly, uh, resilience. You know, um, we will be pursuing uh, all of the uh, different uh, resilient um, components. We will, we will be achieving an NGBS gold standard. Again, it's been in our proposal since the inception, um, and these are some of the different components that allow us to achieve that and be GS Gold. And, and, and as it relates to sustainability, if you, if you look at our, our site plan, you'll see that some of the buildings are not really configured 
uh, in the traditional way. You're not going to see any straight bar buildings or straight rectangle buildings like that. And you, so you might see some configurations that might be a little bit different than you're accustomed to seeing. And there's a reason for that. The reason is this site has tremendous mature trees. You know, we have walked the site with our professionals. We design around those mature trees. We want to make sure that those trees are preserved. Why? Because if they're cut, you can't replace them. Those trees are probably 40, 50 years old. So that's why you see those different types of configurated buildings to make sure that we work around those trees. That's a big component for us. Here you see some of those sites that I mentioned previously and how we've worked to preserve you know, all of those uh, mature trees. And now this, this is just some ideas of, of how that Central Park area and the, those linears, that, the linear parks and, and how, what are the type of activities and the type of uses and how you can generate community access and community interest in the spaces. And here, here are some actual examples of that. Here's some additional classes and, 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 and again, events uh, working in that space. This is a, a, a snapshot of our most recently completed building, Gallery River Park. Uh, it was completed in April of this year. Um, it's across from Marlins Park, and there um, you'll see just some of the finishes that we do and some of the artwork. I mean, the picture on the bottom left is our lobby um, of the project. You see, you know, this is our business center on the bottom right. You see some of the finishes, and, and there's our fitness center. So you get a feel for what our, our, our buildings look like. And these are actual pictures. These are not concepts. The arts, and, and I touched on this a little bit uh, previously. And again, Related was, was, was founded in 1979 by, by George M. Perez, who was, was my partner. Um, you know, and one of the things that George has is, is always been a supporter of is the arts, right? And he's instilled in us in every project that we do that the arts need to be front and center. And the reason for that is because it changes the living experience for, of a project, right? It's not just about housing. Uh, you know, anyone can build housing. Anyone can, you know, put up a building. That's not that difficult to do. But not anyone can build a community, you know, and that's what we want to focus. And we think one of the best ways to do that is by focusing in on the arts. And here, you know, Mr. Perez is the main benefactor of the Perez Art Museum in downtown Miami, you know, based upon his gifts to the museum. He's also, subsequent to that, invested and opened a, 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 a gallery slash space warehouse in the Alapata district of Miami to showcase some of his uh, uh, private collection. But more importantly, he wants to make sure that the community has access to this art, right? So he's now fostered uh, all types of programs where, with the school system, um, with, with, with all different organizations to be able to now have access to a free space that is uh, not, it's, it's, it, I guess for lack of a better word, a private uh, museum. But, but that's a big component in everything that we uh, do. Here are some of the you know, public uh, art installations. And again, this is not conceptual for us. You know, I, I, I heard um, previously when I was here at the, at the last meeting, you know, I stayed after, after the council, uh, you know, uh, voted and, and asked for this meeting. And, and I was able to listen a little bit that, that Homestead has been trying to, for many years, institute a public art program, right? I, I know Susan is here her today, and I, I hadn't met her until, until that day. And I heard her passion and her, her willingness to, to, to and, and the time that she's invested to try to uh, create this public art program. And it seems like she's been at it for quite a few years um, trying to do that. So what I'm here to say is we support that vision wholly. I mean, I, I think that the council was, was very supportive of what she's trying to, to accomplish. And again, these are not placeholders. These are actual buildings and public art installations that we have done as a company. And here's another uh, shot of just different art pieces throughout some of our different 
uh, developments. Many of these are from, you know, uh, art, uh, artists, you know, from, from around the world, but we've also have a in-house, you know, young artist program where we fund through our own philanthropic uh, foundation programs for up-and-coming young artists. So we want to make sure that we have the access and the opportunity for these artists to do what they're best at, which is to be, be creative, right? But it's sometimes very difficult for them to have a chance to work on signature projects because they're young and up and coming. So sometimes they don't get a chance, but we have a special division to focus on that. Amenities, these are some of our actual shots, again, of some of our buildings. You know, for us, it's, it's about lifestyle and, and, and that and, and that package and that amenities package that we bring to anything we build, regardless of what income level we're building for. Some of the interior uh, spaces and uh, interior design uses, also additional art pieces within some of our uh, buildings on the inside. Finishes, right? here again, actual pictures of our gallery at River Park that we just was recently finish some of our model units so you get an idea of you know what our market rate units uh, actually look and feel like and again community community engagement as I, I started this this discussion with is going to be something that we're always going to um, incorporate we know that once the council makes a decision that that's not necessarily the end it's actually the beginning it's the beginning of that community engagement process. It's the beginning of the entitlement process. It's the beginning of, you know, that collaboration to really uh, incorporate the final vision uh, for, for the development. Some of our community partners that we had um, talked about partnering with, you know, our architectural team is Siskovich Architects who are here today. Uh, we have uh, Branches who, who is, uh, a community-based organization, and they're also here today. Um, we talked about, you know, supporting uh, through uh, different uh, initiatives with our tenants and our, and our homeowners to support uh, events and functions at the Seminole Theater. Um, we also talked about proffering space for the Homestead Center for the Arts. You know, I know when I, when I met Charlie, she mentions, you know, we've been doing this for a lot of years, but, you know, we've never had a permanent home. I said, well, once City Place Homestead becomes a reality, then you will have a permanent home because that's another, you know, organization uh, that, that has been trying to do a good work here in the area. And just today, you know, as part of that community, continual community outreach uh, process, we, we, we had a discussion with the Speedway and NASCAR to, again, to promote um, events and to promote you know, children to have access to these different events at the Speedway. So, uh, unfortunately, the uh, presentation was already finalized, so I wasn't able to add them uh, as one of the community partners, but I'm here to tell you that, yes, we had that discussion today, and we're going to be uh, doing that collaboration also uh, with NASCAR and, and the Speedway. Local hiring, I mean, we're, we're a, a Hispanic-owned firm, we understand the importance of trying to hire locally and giving a minority businesses a, a, a true opportunity. We know that local firms and, and minority firms hire locally, and that's a big component for us. Um, and as it relates to values of contracts, again, we initially, this is not a new concept for us. We, we always proffered 75% of the value of our construction costs to, to local firms. And, and again, back to what I said about vertically integrated, this is not about a slide or a, you know, getting up here and saying we're going to do this or we're going to hope to do this. This is not about, you know, goals. This is about commitments, you know. Um, the, the benefit of having a vet vertically integrated development company, again, is that construction arm is ours. 
So if we have an agreement and that is something that is part of our development agreement with, with the city, we can make that happen because we have contractual privity with the subcontractors. This is not a, about later saying, well, pointing fingers, yeah, we wanted to achieve this goal for local contractors, but we couldn't because we hired XYZ general contractor and XYZ general contractor didn't, didn't meet the goal. No, that's not the case. And I will tell you this, we are very proud of the fact that we were the first and the only developer in one of our major redevelopment efforts with Miami-Dade County in, in the Liberty City area to voluntarily proffer the first community benefits agreement with the county. And so that was a contract with the county and the community. And so it's not, again, about slides, pretty picture, or goals. It's about having the ability to put something in writing that everybody agrees to, that everybody works to. Talk about job training initiatives. We are also the only developer in the state that I know of that has a approved apprenticeship program with the Department of Education. There's the certificate. What does that allow us to do? That allows us to take unskilled workers and put them in a construction job site. Once they've gotten their safety training and they're, and they're, and they're cleared by OSHA, and they're able to learn a trade. And, 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 and the fact that they can learn a trade is the, the, the multiplier effect of that is, is, is enormous. It's, it's almost immeasurable. We've had many programs where we train ex-offenders and we allow them to get, you know, to, to come back into the workplace. A lot of times they, they have a hard time getting jobs. Well, these type of initiatives, again, are what allow us to, to do this. This is not us relying on an outside uh, entity, an outside nonprofit, or someone else to be able to do an apprenticeship program. We do it ourselves. We're licensed to do it. There's a certificate from the Department of Education. And lastly, talking about economic benefits of the, of the project. So one of the, one of the um, comments that came out from the council meeting last time was, again, that you would like to see some more market rate housing. Um, I know in the last iteration, and there's things that have changed around, we always had, you know, half of our project as market rate housing at the time. I think our competitors had 100% of their project as affordable housing. Um, now they say that they're going to produce 100% market rate housing. But based on the um, financial benefits and those changes that the council required to higher percentage of market rate housing, I can tell you between the two phases, the residential and the commercial, the city stands to receive $464 million of direct financial benefits over the, long, the life of the project. In addition to that, the economic development of both phases is an additional $144 million. And lastly, that new piece that I talked about earlier about 100 home ownership units, condo units, those are going to generate over $30 million of home ownership equity. Simple math, 100 units, two bedroom, two bath, $300,000 a unit. $30 million in equity, new taxpayers, people that are fully invested in the city of Homestead. You add those three components, and we have $638 million of total economic benefits for the city of Homestead. And lastly, again, and this is a, a, a full rendering of our uh, development, but but I, I, in, in closing, and, and I know we're going to field some questions later uh, from the council, but, but I, I, again, I, I just want to reiterate the fact that it's, it's important, you know, for the council to pick the right development partner. And 
Who's the right development partner? It's a partner that has the experience to do these type of mixed use projects. A developer that has built these type of mixed use projects. A developer that has the financial strength to deal with turbulent times, right? We're currently dealing with inflation of over, you know, higher, the last 31 years, the highest inflation rate in the last 31 years, right? So those are things that can hamper, you know, a developer that's not experienced enough or a developer that may not be capitalized enough to deal with some of those financial uh, tailwinds. We're dealing with some instability at the Federal Reserve, right? There's, there's talk about what are interest rates going to be next year? Who's going to be the chair of the Federal Reserve? What's going to be the economic outlook? So, so I say that by, to, to, to state that time is of the essence. You know, we've, 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 we've talked about this uh, project. Again, everything that you've seen today is a compilation of a lot of the input that, that this council and the community gave us. But, but time is important because it's not your friend in development. You know, you can have an opportunity today and because of other outside conditions and market forces, that opportunity can cease. So I think it's important for the council to, to make sure that once you make this selection, that you know you have a partner that is gonna be there with you to be able to deliver uh, what they said they were going to deliver. So again, thank you for your time, and I'll gladly take any questions at, at the proper time. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, and in dovetailing on the comments from both of the uh, proposers' representatives tonight, this is truly a collaborative public amenity, public-private partnership. So in that regard, I would at this point entertain any questions or comments that any member of the public who's here tonight would have with respect to these presentations. Unfortunately, we're going to have to put you on the three-minute shot clock, but just go ahead and line up. And uh, when you come forward, give us your name and address for the record and be mindful of the time limitations. Come on down. Somebody's got to break the ice. Come on down. Good evening. My name is Isabel Pike and I live at 15720 Southwest 76th Avenue, Palmetto Bay. So, so nice to see everyone this evening. I'm here to actually speak on behalf of branches and support the related group um, proposal. So Related Urban is actually already an incredible partner of branches. I'm the senior VP of development at branches. Many of you may know our Branches Florida City site. Um, branches is a local nonprofit. We serve primarily in Miami-Dade County and what we really do is we provide life-changing opportunities to working poor families and their children. So our Grow and Climb programs serve children and youth, and we provide after-school programming, youth development. Our Climb to College and Career program is incredible. Right now we have 47 kids in college, all first generation, that we support and actually make sure they don't just get into college but actually graduate as well. Um, we serve 500 children right now at all three of our sites at Branches throughout Miami-Dade County, so Branches Lakeview in North Miami, Branches South Miami, and Branches Florida City. We also serve over 15,000 adults every year through our ACHIEVE programs, and those programs all focus on financial wellness, so personal one-on-one -on -one financial coaching, free tax prep, small business development. Again, I think really what sets Branches apart is that we provide two generational programming for children, youth, and adults to make sure that they are really become financially stable. Um, this new project in Homestead would be incredible for Branches because we'll be able to secure space in Homestead. Now, of course, we are located in Branches, Florida City, which is about 10 minutes from here, um, but we need to expand. We are at absolute max capacity at that site, and that is a brand new building. So I think, I don't know if any of you have visited, but we built that building in 2015. We serve over 250 children and youth and their families at that site, and we would very much like to expand in South Dade. I'm sure you all know South Dade is an incredibly underserved community. Um, the Children's Trust has already off the record sort of committed to supporting our expansion in South Dade as well as other funders. Um, so we'd be able to again, 
provide life-changing opportunities to more families living in South, South Dade. And again, um, we are working with uh, Related Urban right now on a permanent brand new home for Branches South Miami because we are in a temporary location right now and we're partnering with them on the, their Somi Park project. And that's moving along nicely. We just saw the plans. We're so excited to have a new permanent space in a neighborhood where our families actually live and our kids will be able to walk two branches um, and walk home and it's, it's, we're very excited about that. So hopefully we'll also have a, a future branches in Homestead and I, I hope that you'll support this project. Thank you. Thank you for coming down tonight. We appreciate your comments. Good evening. Um, Susan Sorrentino, 2610 Northeast 3rd Drive. Uh, both of the presentations seem to come up to a level of, get, of honoring the fact that we need art in our community. Um, at the last presentation at Cal, there was a big separation. Uh, the related group had all those things, uh, the live work space and gallery space for artists. Um, but just the aesthetics of it, uh, I think it was just beautiful the way it was presented. Now we have two very slick presentations and they look great. And you want to know what it comes down to? Who do you trust? Someone who has done this over and over again, who is willing to work with us. Someone who put together from October 23rd to now a presentation that looks like we wanted it to look, more aesthetic, uh, less office space. The farmer's market that they presented, farmer's space, I think they called it, where they have fast food, uh, the first presentation. I don't think we need more fast food in the community. We need upscale restaurants. We need just a different quality of life than what is out there right now. We have lots of fast food. We have lots of chains of, of restaurants. But what we want is the next step. So I just um, present it to you that way. I lean towards the related group just because they've done it a million times, guys. They know what they're doing. OK, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sorrentino. Anyone else in the peanut gallery? Come on down. Hi, my name is Harris Kleinkoff. I've been here for less than one year. This is my first meeting and I'm having a great time. I heard the presentation by both groups. I moved here from Boston and South, Day, South Boston completely gets renovated every year. And it's an interesting place to live. But the essence of it is, are there enough schools? Is there enough public transportation? Is there enough money to buy, uh, to pay for fire departments, police departments, policemen, first responders? And I thought the first group said there was a $1.3 million annual profit for Homestead. Is that enough money to pay for all that? The second group, which was also a great presentation, I didn't hear any final numbers as far as a profit. And you can't run a city without money. You can have all these beautiful places to live. I mean, the first one looked like Disneyland. I wanted to go there. But is there enough money coming back to the city from either one of these groups? I don't know the answer to that. Who's supposed to give me that answer? All right, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Hi. Good evening. Not, not really. I'm Valerie C. Schultz. I live at 1771 Northwest 17th Street, and I also have a property over in um, Sonora and Malibu Bay, so both sides of the highway. 
And mostly it's, I'm not looking for answers, but just doing quick math between this presentation and the one that I think may be coming up. I'm just averaging two cars per all these proposed residences. That's like 1,600 cars. And I'm being conservative because just go over to any of these um, places over, especially on the east side, there aren't just two cars. There, there's got to be at least four cars for every house when I drive around in there. The roads, the condition of our roads are awful. Where, where, the traffic is, anyway, I'm not, that, I know I'm beating a dead horse on that one. Evacuation, what, what, what's going to happen if we have a really big storm? How are we all going to get out? I'm not going anywhere, but everybody else seems to want to leave. And, and the gentleman before me, great answer about the schools and our first responders and, and the payment of that. And water and sewer. I thought I had heard the city of Homestead, our water and sewer was maxed out. I might have read that a long time ago. And just all that construction makes me crazy, and I, I've lost track of our nuclear power and where we're getting our electricity. But if I don't say something, shame on me. But those are my concerns as a longtime resident of, of Homestead. So. Thank you. Thank and I think we all share your concerns, and I those are <laughs> answers we're all going to hope to get. I just keep seeing the stuff go up. And Thank you. Good evening, I'm Katie Martinez. I live at 3529 Southeast 4th Street in Homestead. And I just wanted to, um, I just kind of came in on the last presentation and I want to um, say how much I'm grateful mm -hmm. for the interest in art. I'm a music teacher here in Homestead at Gateway Environmental K-8. through I'm the middle school band and orchestra teacher and I really do appreciate the arts um, and I love the fact that there there's more involvement in wanting to incorporate spaces for art especially since they did away with Lozner Park I'm not sure what the direction is on upcoming performances I know my students have actually performed at Lozner Park before um, at the Christmas tree lighting ceremony so um, I just wanted to kind of mention that I appreciate that and hopefully there'll be a space for a stage area for students in our, commu in our community schools to come and share their skills and their, their beautiful um, abilities. And also again, I wanna thank um, the direction of the board and bringing in the arts to our, our, our wonderful city. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak who's here with us? Good evening, come on down. Uh, hey everybody, <coughs> oh excuse me. <coughs> Brandon Clark, I'm at 1456 Northeast 40th Road. Um, glad to be here, glad to see the attention uh, that Homestead's getting. Uh, I too support uh, the arts. Um, I also do have a background in architecture, so I can see some of the nuances that are effective uh, and something that I would appreciate uh, actually where I live. So I do want to strongly suggest gallery space. My garage isn't enough anymore, um, so I really would like you know, better space to actually uh, showcase uh, what's happening. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for being with us tonight. Anyone else? All right, is there anyone online? No one online. All right then. Before we go to council for uh, questions and comments, I just want to share my observation and thank both of the uh, proposers here tonight for, for top-notch presentations. From my vantage point, you both had the rapt attention of this room, with the exception of a couple of you who were playing with your phones, who shall remain nameless. but. Never have I seen such focus and intensity from an audience in a non-land use item before us. So, you know, the, the eyes of Homestead are on us and, and both of the proposers and their proposals as well. And um, I'd like to, I've, I just want to start and uh, 
go down the line, starting with uh, Councilwoman Bailey, if you're prepared to, to go forward with any questions or comments you may have. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I agree completely. I think that both presentations are amazing. I have been driving by that lot every day, multiple times a day, and just daydream and wonder what could be. Um, I've really been trying to make pros and cons, um, and I think what makes this one so difficult is that both applicants have the power to massage things here and there, add things here and there, so um, I honestly would love to hear a little more from my colleagues relate, um, related to the financing, because that's one of the biggest sticklers, I think, for us. Um, you know, both with your visions on how we can connect to the downtown. I appreciate that so much. Obviously, the arts, I could not be more excited about. Um, as far as the design and the view from the corner of Campbell and US-1, I'm still leaning towards HD, HTG. Um, but then Related comes in talking about the trees. I love that. So. It's on. It's, it's really, really difficult one. If um, if I could reserve a little bit for the end and listen to some conversation on the financing, I would really appreciate that. Certainly, thank you, Councilman Wood. Councilman Avila. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Related and HTG for for your months and months of preparation. This is a lot of work, and we invited the community to come out and give us your ideas, and you did that. And so I want to make sure that at least my sentiments of appreciation are relayed to both of you. And, that, and I hope that um, you are able to find from us transparency and um, collaboration in trying to get a product on the table that we're willing to move forward with, hopefully sooner rather than later, for the best interest of our city and our residents. There are so many things that I love about both projects. I've written countless notes on pen, paper, and in my phone. So I know that I've got a lot to review over the next couple weeks. Um, I'm not sure if we're planning as a council to make a decision tonight, but if I had to, I think I would be able to make a decision. So I do want to hear more from the rest of my colleagues, um, but I did have some questions related, if you could please. Could you clarify with regards to the timing on the closing of the contract, construction, and when you would have your grand opening? That was something I saw in the prior uh, presentation. Thank you. Yeah, so um, as part of our um, proposal, we, we talked about that we, we believe we can uh, break ground within nine months of award. Um, that'll you know consist of two to three months of community engagement and then uh, five or six months of you know designing and finalizing permitting and, and breaking ground. So again, um, we, we've committed um, to the financial uh, quali quali uh, qualified opportunity zone investment. We had that uh, in the proposal and we have, like I said, obtained already our financing commitment. So as soon as we can you know, obtain that permit from the city of Homestead, we can break ground. So we're estimating in the next nine months. Thank you, and then if you can stay for just a minute since you're up at the podium. Um, could you tell me why you decided to not keep the lake? What um, were some of the thought process behind that in your style and design? Yeah, so again, you know, the, the lake is, is not for, for two, two, two reasons. Of, I mean, one of the things is, you know, unfortunately there's some infrastructure that seems to be fairly new that was built on that corner of uh, Campbell and US-1. It's, you know, it's a little bit, the site kind of is elevated in that area, and it seems like that was recently completed. So one of the things you want to do is, I don't, I'm not necessarily uh, sure, you know, if that infrastructure can be moved. You know, we, we were looking at that, but it seems to be uh, fairly new. So, you know, we, we tried to come up with a way to step back a little bit from that. Um, and as it relates to the site itself, um, we wanted to, again, preserve more of those mature trees. So we were very cognizant of the trees and, and where those trees are. So a lake can be 
reposition. We do have a water feature within our central park, so it, you know, it, it could be moved. So that's easily to replicate. Unfortunately, trees, no, right? So if, if we take down one of those mature trees, then we, we can't replicate that. So it's just a function of where it, it is, but we do have a central water component, and we felt it was better to move it more in the middle of the site rather than in the corner of the site. Thank you. And could you expand a little bit on the homeownership component of the project and, and where and when the homeownership association could affect tenants of commercial space or how are they separated or related? Thank you. Yeah, it's, a, it's an excellent question. Um, the, the idea is that, you know, the homeownership component will have its own uh, condominium association. Um, they'll have their own self-contained amenities. Um, they will be part of a larger master association where the rental community will uh, maintain, you know, uh, some of the common grounds. Um, that's another one of the benefits of having, again, a, a, a company like ourselves that we, we're not flippers. We, we maintain our assets. So we will be in control of that master association, which will, will deal with some of the common area elements and the Central Park and those uh, uh, components of the site. The condominium, once we you know, reach 90% of sales, will eventually start the turnover process. So they will have their own condominium association, which will also have a vote as part of the overall master association that we will uh, control. Thank you. And then with regards to the community benefits, um, how do you do you see the community benefits tying into the relationships with NASCAR and with maybe some programming for racing or how do you expand on that? Did you mention both? Thank you. Yeah, so so the the idea with NASCAR is to again include uh, different uh, events where we would support those events and provide as part of, with part of our profits to give back to the community um, where they can have free access to some of these events. So that's kind of the idea that we talked about today with the NASCAR folks. And, you know, um, we said, yeah, we, we'll, we'll definitely uh, work uh, on that. As it relates to the community benefits agreement, again, we were the, we were the only developer that has ever proffered that. Um, and, and that's a, a basically a contract in addition to the traditional uh, development agreement um, where once we have this community engagement process and once we kind of outline some of these uh, additional community benefits that are separate and apart from, you know, how many square feet of retail we're building or how many units we're building, that's something that gets memorialized and is part of our contract with the, with the city. Um, and that's something that, you know, we, we, we work and that's kind of like our, our, our guidepost to, to make sure that if we said we're going to include, you know, certain provisions for the community that, you know, that we stick to that. Um, and, and again, just to reiterate some of those, I mean, we proffered 10% of our retail space for homestead nonprofits. Um, we proffered, you know, uh, promotional uh, partnerships with, with the Seminole Theaters. We proffered uh, trying to find a, a permanent home for the Homestead Center for the Arts. We proffered bringing in a partner like Branches, which you heard from again, and providing them space to provide services for the community. So those are the type of things that get captured and memorialized in a community benefits agreement. Thank you, and I think I'll rest for now. I may have more questions later. I appreciate thank it. You. Um, I, I wanna that, um, thank you. I want to say that for the council, thank you, that there's, as I mentioned, there's so many great things on both sides, um, but I think that this project it does satisfy a demand, uh, regardless of which um, developer we go with. It satisfies a demand that, that is, is being made in our community. Um, organizations need space to have presentations, hold events. Um, we've we've uh, extended those options out to our own courtyard here at City Hall. I know that when Lausner Park gets finished with the construction, that'll be an additional venue, but I don't think that um, one competes with the other. I think that Related did a great job with zooming out and showing us how this project can correlate with our downtown area. So if, if the council doesn't mind, I'd like to direct some questions to HTG. Thank you. If I can have HTG time. come up.
Thank you. So I, I'd like to give you the opportunity to do a, a, a better job at zooming out and, and telling us how you, you, you see this project tying in and having that synergy as you, you state in the, in, the, in the presentation that it has. How, explain a little bit more if you don't mind. Okay. Sure. Max, I believe there was a slide here. Julia, do you want to take me to that? Yeah, if you go to the synergy page. So what was your what was your question specifically? So the, one of the things that was important to us is to make sure that there wasn't any conflict between us and downtown Homestead. So we were going to make sure. Um, I'm not sure if you could put those slides up again or not, but it's page 26 of the slides. What we were going to do is 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 work uh, with obviously with the city of Homestead and also with Suchman Group, who is also here with us today, uh, to make sure that we were working together to uh, make sure that there was complementary services and retail between the two. So we weren't uh, neutering one with the other. Uh, we also were gonna be provide the trolley or, or, or work with the city to be able to provide uh, more trolley stops between us and the city of Homestead, as we said before, um, um, in that regard. Uh, we're also going to create joint social media marketing and branding between the two so that uh, it's not one competing against the other. And, and I think the, the slide really explains what we're trying to do here when we differentiate. So Homestead Station is large entertainment anchors, okay? Retail and standalone restaurants as opposed to our, um, our food hall concept where the Park, the Park Plaza Campbell site will be small businesses, incubator retail concepts, health offices, startups, and pop-up culinary concepts. So we're really trying to, as we keep mentioning, complement what's going on at Homestead Station with the proposed uses uh, that we have for Park Plaza Campbell. Thank you. And can you explain why we wouldn't be able to close until 2023 under your presentation? Sure, so when you look at our timeline, and as I mentioned, a critical component, uh, I know that uh, related urban group mentioned, you know, they would undertake three months of, of meetings and, and design charrette with the community. We don't want to put a time frame on it. If the community needs six months, they're going to take six months. If they're going to need nine months, we're going to give them nine months. We want to put a shovel in the ground, but we want to put the right shovel in the ground. So we're going to take as long as it takes to do this right. The one thing I'll just add to that is, you know, a typical construction timeline from, you know, site acquisition to, you know, putting a shovel in the ground is, you know, a, a year. Uh, if we're at the end of 2021, but we're not doing this alone. We're doing this with the city of Homestead, and we're doing this with all the residents out there. Uh, we're going to be listening to every single one of the council members as well as the, uh, the residents to make sure that this is a, a destination where they're going to want to go, they're going to want to enjoy, and that they're going to be proud of. So uh, our timeline shows a 2023 timeline to, con to uh, commence construction, but, but we would be more than capable to try to start sooner if we have everybody on board. But we're not going to shove anything down someone's throat and uh, just proceed without anybody's approval. And again, this is an estimated timeline. Thank you, and I, I'd like to compliment you. Did you want to add to that? Well, no, I, I mean, I just wanted to add that um, that also as part of experience just through time and as we have seen, when it comes to the rezoning that's going to have to be done or that special district, there's we know and we expect that there's going to be a lot of comments back from not just the staff, but when the item comes to you guys again, it's not just the charrettes and the, all of the comments that we're going to get from the public there but the public that will only maybe attend those meetings will have new comments and it is very likely that, you know, it will continue to be delayed for some months more and that's okay with us because again, it's just refining the product. So that was just the other component there. Okay, thank you. That concludes my questions, but I wanna um, compliment you on your, the curb appeal that um, is right at the corner of Campbell and US1 where you incorporated the lake. I really do love the design and the concept. 
Um, but to be honest, I'm, I'm not sure if, if the project as a whole with the way that the parking was so segregated and clumped together is the, is the best way to use that space. So I am um, leaning towards, in terms of design, towards the related project. Um, but uh, again, I'm sure open to hearing well, everybody's. Point out, though, that, that we specifically designed it that way for environmental concerns and to preserve as many trees on the site as possible. Uh, if, if you'll see the difference between ours and our competitors, we have a lot less buildings, and we are very sensitive to also the trees. And one thing I'll just mention about the parking and the site plan, this is not just us. We're partnering with the city of Homestead. This is not the site plan that we submit. A, a lot of these designs are a conversation right now, but we're going to be partnering with every single one of you and your, your planning and zoning staff to make sure that we are doing the best site plan for the city of Homestead. We're going to be talking to all of you. Uh, if, if you see changes or differences that need to happen with the site plan or the parking, we're going to listen. So good to hear that both of them are very open to evolving the project to meet our needs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilwoman. Very insightful. Councilman Ross? Thank you, Mayor. We're two hours into this, huh? And I just finally got to say a word. My first words. Good evening, everyone. All right, so both of these presentations are great. Right? They offer amenities, they offer all these things uh, to the city. Um, someone walked up and pointed out the fact that the infrastructure is going to be taxed, traffic is going to be taxed, road conditions are issues, and those are all things that we could look at in the future. Um, gentleman walked up and made a very good point, and I always like to get to this point, and I'll invite both of you back up to answer this question. What's the bottom line yearly, income-wise, to the city so related you can come up or HTG to answer that question because th that's a big deal for me that was one of the reasons why I pushed so hard not to sell the asset but to lease the asset so that we had a continuous flow of, of revenues for the city for, for, for generations to come so that's okay. one of the big points for me thank you councilman for your question uh, as we mentioned before, we are proposing a 99-year ground lease where the city maintains ownership in accordance with your desires. Our 15% of net cash flow roughly equates to $1.3 million of recurring annual revenue to the city. That is comprised roughly of $600,000 per year for the residential component, $450,000 per year in commercial cash flow from the commercial component, and also $225,000 of other income we'll call it other income from special events that we propose. And we had a, a pretty elaborate slide on some, some really creative ideas we had for special events on both a weekly, monthly, quarterly, uh, semi-annually, and annual basis for the city. Great, thank you. So your, your, your estimate would be $1.3 million per year for 99 years, basically. That's correct, right. plus, plus $8 million at closing to plus retire 8 million the city's to debt. Relieve the, the debt, correct. Okay, great, thank you. So, uh, Councilman Roth, uh, just to answer your question, um, the annualized cash flow in the first year of stabilization based on our performa is a million six thirty four just for the market rate mixed use project. That grows annually, you know, based on uh, income projections over the the 
the life of the project. For instance, if you go to 10 years down the line with that same uh, figure, it grows uh, to 3,233 at 15% when you apply the growth factor of the income and the expenses. So that's why um, I mentioned earlier that our projected cash flow over the life of the project just on the residential mixed use side is $382 million. So it grows every year. We're not proposing a fixed, you know, $1.3 million. Um, that's not counting the commercial component, and we're certainly not counting any event revenue for the city. So I'm talking about actual stabilized rental income, a million six thirty-four out of the gate. That grows again. Ten years, you're already at three million. Twenty years, you're you know almost double. That's the power of compounding. So, as we continue to explore and do our research as a as a dais, um, I would request that both of the groups provide us with your working performers that project out what the revenue and income will be to the city year one through year 99, because um, none of us have seen a performer like that, uh, so we can anticipate what the city's revenues will be for the old city hall site. Yeah. So if uh, I'm can, actually prepared to give that to I'm you I'm sure tonight. you are, but I want to give equal opportunity me, so. to everybody. So, so um, that would just be one of my requests, that we have that performa so we can see um, how this all uh, tends out for the city over the course of the life of this agreement. Thank you, Mayor. That's all I have for now. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Councilwoman Fair Claus Staggers, are you prepared to go forward at this point? Always ready, Mayor. Thank you. So, full disclosure, it was a huge sacrifice for me to be here tonight. Um, so my phones are chirping because the one who knows the rhythm of my heartbeat is in Nicholas's Children's Hospital. So I'm not turning my phone off. So I'm sorry, I love you all, but I'm a mom first. But I'm prepared. I've been very attentive, and I have some feedback. Uh, HTG, I think you really put yourself back in the game tonight. You really bought, brought it, you stepped up to the plate, and I feel like it was the UM and FSU game that was this past weekend. Like one was up and one came back, and it's just a nail biter to the end. So, so thank you for that, for, for being very attentive. You brought your CEO down to do the presentation. So as I say when I like things, I'm here for this. With that, I really um, appreciate the, the specificity with that synergy in the downtown, that cascading alongside of supporting our downtown district with very intentional approaches to connect to the downtown with the discounts to create that foot traffic to the downtown to that social media um, collaboration to to bring more attention to the downtown i think that is amazing because one of our um, points was the fact that we didn't want our downtown to be abandoned we've invested so much in that downtown so for this project to kind of overshadow that I think would be devastating, would be a travesty. So thank you so much for not just promoting the connectivity to the downtown, but really putting plans in place to connect to the downtown. I also, um, I think you, you knocked it out of the ballpark with the visual. Like what will this look like beyond the little dots and the little trees? What does this look like? And I think you did an amazing job at um, visually displaying that. The iterations that you have inside of the residences, I think they are platinum. I love that. And for me, I don't think it's about whose bank account is bigger, but who can actually deliver. And I think both of these entities can deliver. So essentially at this point, it's a level playing field um, for me with the related group and i had this conversation with albert earlier because i was very direct and i asked once you develop how do you stay connected to this project do you flip it do you make money you know give us a million here or whatever a year but then turn around and sell it off for 350 million or whatever and you are very clear that you main you maintain your connection to the project and you discussed 
that vertical integration, that alignment, which I think is great. So my question to HTG, how do you maintain your connectedness to this project once you build it? Because I am not interested in anyone who's going to come in our community, develop, and go. So can you have a conversation and articulate how do you um, stay connected after you construct? Thank you, Councilwoman, for your questions. I, I want to uh, comment about one thing that uh, our competitor mentioned, and that is our cash flow is not fixed. It is a percentage of the overall cash flow in the development. So the better the development does, the better that cash flow looks. And as with our competitor, we believe that cash flow will be increasing over time. Councilwoman, to answer your specific question, HTG, like related, is also vertically integrated and we are not merchant builders. You don't see my name in the paper selling properties. I don't sell. I build and I hold and I want to give them when I'm done with it to my children and pass them down to my grandchildren. We move into a community and we want to be long-term stakeholders for the duration of the 99-year ground lease. Thank you. And, and speaking of being connected uh, to the community and maintaining your presence here after you construct, I appreciate the fact that both of you are maintaining that commitment and aligning yourselves with um, very reputable and deserving nonprofits in our community. I see some team related and I see some team HTG, but it doesn't matter which nonprofit is aligned to either one of you. I think what's most important here, and I articulated this at our last uh, meeting, that there is a um, partnership with our nonprofits who do very important work in our community. So thank you both for um, partnering with these very deserving entities, particularly our schools, even King Cooper, um, South Dade, um, South Dade Skills Center, Miami Dade College, you know that really pulls at my heartstrings. So I really um, appreciate that. I guess I'm not, you know, and I, I appreciate my colleagues and, and, and their vision and they're looking at the numbers and how much we're, we're getting annually per year. I don't really look at that piece that much. I, I, I tend to look at what the residents, what are they gonna feel? What does it look like for them? And I think about density. How many cars, the stress on our infrastructure, 280 versus 436. So that, that gives me heartburn a little bit because beyond less units per acre, my residents don't speak that language. So I think it's very important to not let the density get lost in all of this, um, getting so caught up in the dollar signs, and I say that very um, affectionately. Yeah, that, that was intentional, right? If, if your bottom line is cash flow, we can put more units in there. Do your residents want that? Can you guys handle it today? That was a question that was an intentional decision on our part. And thank you, thank you for respecting that. I think if we, We'll move forward with either one of these projects. I think we need to really think about the density that we're bringing um, into this area. And then I'll say finally, um, before I rest, is the fact that when the community, some of the residents came up to speak, I think that was a great opportunity. Um, I wish we had more here to weigh in on this project and give us their feedback from their perspective. I recall, Kate, when we had our, we're out on the street with those legacy projects, Seminole Theater, Police Station, Cybrarium. We had so many um, community conversations. We spoke to all stakeholders to get their input on what they wanted to see and, and our vision for this community. And this is prime real estate here. And this is going to be another legacy project. I think it's very important that we allow the community to weigh in on these conversations now as opposed to later. So I thank you, Mayor, for inviting the community to come out and speak. I think we need to take it to the streets and get on the ground and have some of those conversations with um, all sectors of our community. Thank you. I'll rest Thank you there. very much. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Fletcher. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank both Urban Related and HTG for their presentations tonight. Um, you know, some uh, very positive, 
uh, discussion points tonight from my colleagues, but I think the most important thing is both of you came out here and you both want to partner with the city of Homestead. I truly believe that, that this is the it place in Miami-Dade County right now. This is where the center of everybody's going to be looking at over the next couple of years to help help uh, improve the south end of this county. So although there may be uh, some pros and some cons in both projects, I do want to personally thank both of you for, for the pre presentation tonight. Before I get to my specific questions, I know we did talk a little bit about infrastructure, um, and I'd like to ask the city staff, have we, have we told our lobbyists that we need to start going after those federal infrastructure programs that were just recently signed by our president? Yes, Councilman, that's something that we're very actively working on. So, uh, you know, for, for everyone's uh, knowledge here, again, there, there's a lot of things going on in the city right now where we have some, some basic traffic issues that, that need to be discussed and, and fixed. Um, personally, uh, I will ask the question of the individuals here shortly. Um, I wrote down a lot of questions, so you got to give me a second to go through my my chicken scratch here so um, I'll start with uh, urban related if I could um, so we've had the had the discussion tonight about density uh, you know the, the word was brought up I know you've added a few homes or a few uh, units to your your uh, presentation are you flexible on that number of units to go either down or is there a way we can come to an agreement with, with us where we might be able to come to a even kill on, on density for that particular project? We're flexible on that. Um, that's a, again, a conceptual plan, but I, but I, will, I will tell you, um, like I mentioned previously, there is a, there's gonna be a, a number to find that right balance to be able to create, uh, you know, as Councilwoman just mentioned, that legacy project, there's a balance to, to be able to have that real signature mixed use destination project, right? Because if you don't have the right amount of density, then your project is gonna be more of a traditional commercial center, which I think you have plenty of in and around the old city hall site. So yes, are, is there flexibility in the density number? Absolutely, that's, you know, that's something that, that we're here um, able to, to, to ma maneuver and massage. However, there is a finite number if you really want to create a signature mixed use project, you can't have you know, it tilted where there's too little density. No, and I, I appreciate that. Um, I know we talked about this briefly after the last presentation, but uh, did we ever, did you ever do a traffic study or get some impacts on uh, the traffic impacts for that area? So, you know, we've talked about it with our design uh, professionals and the traffic study is always a function of the final product that you're trying to develop. So again, this is conceptual in nature. Um, and so we haven't uh, officially uh, ordered the, the traffic study and, and you know as it as it's um, in regards to the final project however you know I think it's important also you know back to your question on density right not only is it important to uh, have that right mix between residential and commercial to create that that type of, of project but if there's a location in the city of Homestead that probably warrants more density it's a location like this one and, and, and the reason for that is, again, you're on a main and main uh, corner. You're adjacent to public transportation, right? So this, this is probably one of the more unique opportunities that, that the city has to promote true live-work type of, 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 of development. So that's also something that will be taken into consideration in this traffic study, so because when they do these analysis, they are going to give value and consideration to the fact that it is a transit-oriented development by by the fact that it's next to, you know, public transportation. Yeah, so I appreciate you pointing that out to me because that's, uh, you know, as a layman, I'm not really involved in the, in those type of uh, discussions. But 
understanding that it is a transportation hub, it can allow for additional density. And I think that's a very important point for all of our residents to hear. Um, I do agree with uh, your design features, especially there on that corner of US-1 and Campbell Drive. You know, to me, that's our signature piece of equipment, signature piece of land. And we have that very unsightly equipment that we've, we've staged on that corner. Uh, Why well, I don't know that happened, but uh, you know, you drive by, it's really not what you want to see. Um, I will say just quickly, and I'll come back to HTG momentarily, that uh, the design feature of the restaurant on the corner is much more appealing to me. Uh, that lake uh, over the years has, has been an eyesore. If you go by there now, there's, there's a lot of uh, you know, ducks and grown up grass, and it's not really maintained to the best that it possibly can be. So uh, years ago, we found a, 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 a dead body in the bottom of that lake, and nobody knew it was there for years and years and years. You know, it was like 26 years the guy was sat in the bottom of that lake, and nobody knew it. So to me, lakes are, are one of those very inherent risks uh, that some of these uh, uh, establishments, you know, put in place, and, and I, I, I just don't care for the, the potential of uh, what could happen in a lake. So uh, we'll come back to that momentarily. Um, yeah, I mean, and from a back to traffic st standpoint, it's not the most uh, proper use on a main and main from a traffic perspective because, yes, if there is an accident or something, it's very easily to actually veer into, into that feature there. And if you could just real quickly uh, kind of build on your, your idea of the building trade apprenticeship. So I'm in, you know, the the construction type of world, you know, at the nuclear plant, and I see that our building trades are increasingly declining. Uh, we don't have young people wanting to get involved in those, uh, but yet it's a very lucrative uh, occupation, you know, and uh, your, your apprenticeship program, is that, you know, from cradle to grade, you know, cradle to, to actually assigning a, a solid as a journeyman in an apprenticeship trade? Yeah, and, and, and again, that that program came about out of necessity um and 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 the reason why i say that is because you know uh, some of our uh, public private partnerships have federal uh, regulations as it relates to employment and one of the challenges and and we talked about and as you know councilwoman avila asked me about the community benefits one of those one of the aspects that we put in in this in this first development that, that we uh, did the agreement with was the um, idea to hire, again, ex-offenders, right? And so when that came about there, you know, some of these uh, federal regulations um, are well-intended but hard to uh, maneuver. Um, and, and why do I say that is because if you are a unskilled worker, whether you're an ex-offender or just a, 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 a young person that wants to uh, learn a trade um, or someone that wants to change careers, you know, it's difficult. There was no process by which you can, you know, take an unskilled person, give them the safety training with OSHA, and then give them the proper tools and allow them to start working on the job because the regulations didn't allow for that, right? And, and, and in, 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 a, in a very simplistic way, it's because if you have a skilled person and they make X amount of dollars on the, on the site, depending on who they work, you know, what subcontractor they work for, you can't pay the unskilled person the same dollars because they don't have the skills. So, you know, we went to Miami-Dade County Public Schools Adult Education, um, and we found a way to partner with them. And it's through the school board and we got our certification with the school board and the Florida <laughs> Department of Education, where now I can take an unskilled person, a young person, um, anyone, get them that safety training, bring them on the job. They'll have a three-step process where they'll do on-the-job training for three years with three, uh, two increments. So at the end of the third year, um, they'll, they'll have a certain amount of on-the-job work experience, and they also have to do classroom uh, hours, 
And once they complete that in a three-year period, now they have a journeyman's license. So now, to back to your point, um, you have the ability to, to, you have a skill that you've learned for that, 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 that's going to feed you for a lifetime. And, you know, I think that, I think your point is very well taken. And this is something why we took the bull by the horns and we said, we're going to have our own apprenticeship program. Is because too many times, you know, we, for whatever reason, frown upon, you know, trades and the work that trades uh, are, are, can, can do. And I can show you real life examples of incomes that these trades people make and compare that in many instances to non-trade work, you know, college educated uh, professions, right? So yes, there's a, there's a, a real need for quality trades uh, um, and, 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 and subcontracted work. And that's why we created our own program so we can have our own feeder system of young people, ex-offenders, anyone that wants to plug into learning a trade and getting on a job site and feeding themselves and feeding their family for uh, the, the, the rest of their life. Yeah, I do appreciate that uh, tremendously. And you, I've seen that in my own you know, uh, skill set uh, over the years that the declining uh, apprenticeships uh, here currently, we just don't get the, the, the young people aren't interested in that and that on the job, hands on work anymore. Yeah, it's about exposure, Councilman, right? So if you, you don't know what you don't know, right? And so, and if you've never been exposed to something, you know, um, then, 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 then you don't have any, anything to compare that by. So this program allows you that exposure, you know, and as part of the apprenticeship program, we can move you through different trades. You know, you might be able to work, uh, you know, for a month with the plumbing contractor and you might say, okay, I like that. Or the next month you might work with the electrical contractor. The next month you might work with the drywall contractor. So that allows you that exposure and that flexibility to have a young person to say, you know what, I, I, I prefer uh, the low voltage or I prefer the electrical or I prefer this, right? So it kind of, it, you know, I, it, it, tracking, it tracks them, you know, right? They pick their, their, the track that they like best. And then and, and again, they move on that, they get the on-the-job training, they have to get their classroom instruction, um, and eventually they get a journeyman's license. Okay. Uh, one final question that's going back to the timeline. Uh, initially, you talked about nine months. If we were to award you a contract, you would start, uh, you know, construction. If that, if that was the case, you know, what, was your, what would be your anticipated completion of all phases of this project? So, you mean there's, you know, three components, right? So there's the, the, the larger mixed uh, use component with the 336 units and the retail. Um, that's the one that I said we can, you know, start within the, uh, the, 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 the next nine months. There's a home ownership component which has its own requirements. It's going to have pre-sale requirements. It's going to have marketing um, requirements. Um, so that probably, uh, it could run concurrent. It depends on market, you know, uh, conditions, right, and how fast those units will sell. Personally, I think, again, we, we, we are very optimistic about the future of Homestead, and we think that those units, maybe $300,000 may not even be the right number by the time we get to promoting and marketing those units, but um, I think they're going to fly. Um, I think they're probably is going to, the demand is going to exceed those 100 units, so it might be that we have to balance and maybe you know, there, there's a need for more home ownership units potentially um, in there. So we'll, we'll let the, the market dictate on that. And then the second piece is that commercial piece, right? So again, we got to work through uh, the, the final design and the financing. Now, there's no reason why they can't run concurrent, right? I'm not, I'm not standing up here today and, 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 and promising that to this council. Uh, I'm telling you that we can break ground with the first uh, phase there within the next nine months. I'm telling you that we will satisfy your debt, you know, at closing, like we said, from the first document that this uh, city received from us. Um, so you'll have those, those immediate savings of, you know, the $465,000 a year to reappropriate to other city services. So that's the commitment that you have 
uh, from us on that. And the other phases may run concurrent. They may run a little bit uh, behind that, depending on, on the market. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Milo. Thank you. Uh, for HTG, um, if, if there was to be some additional thought process to that, that corner development there on US-1 and, and Campbell Drive, again, that, that's our primary signature piece of property here in the city. Um, I don't think it should be a lake, personally. Uh, I'm one of seven people up here, but I would like to hear some other ideas for that. You sure, and, and we're very open to being flexible in that regard, and I just wanted to clarify, when we say lake, for all intents and purposes, you'll see water, but we're talking about something that's two feet deep. Yeah, it's, it's a stormwater retention pond, more than anything. It's not like a 20, you know, foot deep lake. Uh, Oh, another thing that I'd just like to mention is that since we will manage and maintain our community, we will be maintaining that lake and, you know, looking for bodies as, as uh, apparently was an issue. <laughs> so we would be uh, taking every so single step to make sure that that lake is beautiful, it's aer um, aerated and um, taken care of. And it will look like it did in the picture if we, you know, move forward with that concept. And as we've mentioned countless times now, we're very open to working with you and the community to come up with the very best plan we can for this development site. Okay. Sorry, let me just skip through this one second. You're talking about 280 units as your current suggestion or, or plan. Um, no retail. I'm no. sorry. No. Uh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Folks. There's no home ownership in that. No. That. No home ownership. And, and one thing I'd like to mention is that there won't be a contingency to wait for all the phases to be developed. We are going to be moving forward. Um, I know our competitor had mentioned that, you know, depending on market standards, they'll start the home ownership whenever it happens. We're going to blow and go once we get an approval. We're going to move forward. And, and let me also point out, as an ex and former reformed attorney, we're proposing a 99-year ground lease. You guys are the owners. I can't sell what you guys own. Yeah, and fi my final question it really has to do with aesthetics of the whole project. Most of yours is parking lot in, where I see uh, urban relateds is building in the parking lot. So you take away some of those sight lines of, of looking at cars and, and that. Um, is there potential to possibly change your architectural structure where you have that community uh, type look from the outside in rather than parking lots and paper? Yeah, so actually, initially, the uh, original idea is basically if you imagine those buildings right on Dixie, that was the original concept. But once we, and that is why we consulted with a, a retail consultant that has experience, we wanted to make sure that not just, you know, that not just our residential portion was figured out correctly, but that the retail was also positioned the best it could, not just parking ratios, which we, which we examined with them closely, but that was actually one of the comments that we received from them. Of course, I think that if that is something that's very important to the city to line up that street, it's something that with the consultant, they can start basically looking out for tenants and see if it is actually possible to get tenants with the layout that you're referring to, which is with the buildings lining and the parking not being visible. But um, basically, it was their input as experts that lease up is a lot more quicker and successful for retail that sees, or at least they appreciate that the, that the people driving by can see that there's parking available. Again, that is something that can be examined in conjunction with the retail consultant, just to make sure we don't want to have empty spaces, we don't want to have unleasable retail space. We're estimating a roughly a million three in payments to the city. It's not a million three if we can't lease the space. So it's a combination of what's going to work and also what's aesthetically pleasing to you and to the city. Understood. Thank you very much for your time.
again, thank you for the presentation. Um, you know, based off of, of what I've seen and had discussions over the past uh, month and a half, you know, I, I'm leaning more towards the the urban related project just based off of the 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 tenure that they have in the in the in this line of uh, building uh, with the mixed use. Um, you know, immediately, you know, within a very short period of time, that they're going to take over that uh, eight million dollar cost that we currently have which is about $660,000 a month. So if we put the sale off for four or five months, you're talking another couple million dollars. So uh, as we move forward, uh, again, my, my leaning would be more towards the urban-related project. Um, I'd like to hear from the vice mayor and the mayor's comments, and then we'll see where we move from there. Thank you. That's all I have. I know the vice mayor has been anxiously and somewhat patiently waiting to jump in and your time. No, but it's great to hear the uh, comments from the colleagues, and thank you, Mayor, for the time. I also want to thank uh, HTG and Urban Related for putting together really, really impressive presentations. Um, it's good to see that these types of companies with the caliber that you guys have are, are have an interest in doing business with, uh, with the city of Homestead. And we're in a unique position uh, for our residents to prosper and for the city of Homestead to have residents that no longer have to look elsewhere for uh, to work and for entertainment. That's a great place to be. We all know that land inventory is scarce at the moment. Homestead uh, has a lot of good land, a lot of good land that we can develop. So that's keeping Homestead in a very, very attractive place. <coughs> But as the newest member on this dais, um, we've got to make sure that what we do with that old city hall site uh, is the right decision. It'll be our biggest decision uh, that we make in the history of Homestead because that's pretty much considered gold to me in terms of a, of a site. It's iconic, it's got tons of history, and it is truly the cornerstone of this community. So we need to make sure that without a doubt that the agreement that we decide to move with is the absolute highest and best for the residents. Coming off of a campaign, you know, the residents tell us that they're going to hold us accountable for us making the right decision. And, you know, they talk about density, they talk about traffic, they talk about all those things. And coming really, really quickly off of a campaign makes me think a lot about that we get one swing at the bat with this particular site. If we make the wrong decision, because for many years, it's been kind of the, the notion that the city of Homestead kind of accepts whatever developers put out, and seeing the proposals that you guys have put out today, I'm starting to see that change in the city of Homestead is starting to make its standard a lot higher. But what are we actually comparing? We're comparing two proposals and nothing else. What is the benchmark of those proposals? What are we actually comparing these proposals to? The way this was put out in the notice, we didn't really give any direction as to what we wanted. The proposal was put out there. We asked for the uh, private sector to come and give us some, some input, and we're here. So for me, it's, it's too much to, to absorb uh, in such a short period of time. Um, how do we know we're actually getting the best deal for the residents? What are we comparing it to? The developers will tell us, hey, this is uh, what we're giving you, 15% of net cash flow, 10% of net cash flow. Is that the best we can get? How do we know? It would be great to have staff you know, do, do like an independent study to tell us, hey, we've reviewed other municipalities, and in other municipalities, they do it like this, and these numbers seem to be right on with other municipalities. It'd be great to see a university, you know, weigh in on it, an urban planning uh, department or, or school of a university say, hey, we're gonna, put our, we're gonna put our stamp of approval because it meets the standards that we think it's great in urban planning. We can get a financial advisor to provide an opinion so I think that when we make these types of decisions where you only really get one shot and one bite at the apple, it has to be the right one because Homestead has made some 
very bad decisions in the past, and we don't want that to happen again. So with that, I'll rest, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I want to, you know, kind of comment. I've got a couple of questions for each of the proposers, I think, and kind of address some of the questions and comments that um, my colleagues have espoused and, and, and try to address some of those. Um, one item that really jumped out at me tonight and, and, and thinking back to not only the discussions that we've had about this project, but other projects as well, certainly our former colleague, uh, Councilman Shelley and um, Councilwoman Fairclaw Staggers have been very protective and very vocal about that we not compete, if you will, with the efforts and the, the scores of millions of dollars that have been spent to, to make downtown a, a go. And I just want to, to kind of share my observations in, in that regard because I think that that is important. Now, the backdrop of what I'm about to say is, is in talking to, to management staff and getting information, we've all had concerns recently about um, the lack of forward motion at Homestead Station and the things that the, those out in the community are telling us they would like to see. It's come to my attention that, and I don't mean this in a demeaning manner, but that Homestead Station really can't accommodate a big box restaurant. You know, when we hear out in the community and on the campaign trail, we need more and better places to eat and, and more, more entertainment. So, so here's the observation I have in, in that regard between the two proposals. As, as the HTG proposal was going forward and talking about the, uh, the food hall and, and some of the spaces they have there, I'm kind of thinking this seems to be a better fit with what I think we all envision for not only Homestead Station, but the storefronts downtown. Okay, and reconcile that, which is my personal observation, that it seems that the related proposal, as it exists at this point, is more amenable to those bigger box um, dining establishments that don't necessarily fit or maybe not even be appropriate downtown so that that's that's one thing I I looked at there as to kind of striking that balance as to you know we we've got to let the market kind of dictate what to a certain extent what what goes on at the city hall site versus not driving the final nail in the coffin of, of downtown we've, we've got to strike that balance so that was that was an observation I had there um, I want to say that, you know, to, to echo, you know, several of our comments, the, the money isn't everything. The concept, the use, the money, and the aesthetic for me are all important factors. I'm not saying they're equal, but they're all very, very important factors. And... You know, we've all... We, we've heard tonight from the proposers that, that density is, is a negotiable item. That what's been put before us is a, a conceptual plan. And I just want to be very clear that if we go forward, I am very willing to forego um, monies over the term of the lease in exchange for uh, addressing the density, the traffic, and, and those issues that come along with, with the, uh, the higher number of units. And in that regard, I wanted to clarify a couple of things. I, I recall that in the related proposal last month, there was some discussion about retiring the debt and a couple of more phased payments of more or less a million dollars each and then at some point beginning those, those annualized payments. Is, is that correct? There was the immediate retirement of the debt and then some other benchmark events that provided for additional payments to the city. That is correct, uh, Mayor. Um, our proposal 
in the first phase, which again is the mixed use phase, uh, anticipates retiring the debt at financial closing, so you have immediate savings of that. Once the project uh, reaches stabilization, that's when the cash flow participation starts. But you are correct. In addition to that, um, there are additional capitalized lease payments for the other phases that also happen at the uh, cl financial closings of those phases, along with eventually uh, additional cash flow participation. But you are correct. Hey, thank you. I just wanted to be clear that that was still on the table and that I did not mishear that last month. And to reconcile that, and, and I'll look to HTG, uh, the proposal as it exists now is the retirement of the debt at closing at, with simply those annualized payments going forward. No, none of those additional interim payments. Yes, that is correct, Mr. Mayor. Hey, I, you know, I, I just want to be, you know, have that clear so that we're all comparing apples to apples and and not mixing concepts. And I, you know, again, as I said, I wanted to be sure that I didn't mishear or misunderstand what had been presented by, by either side. And again, you know, I'll be clear, um, money is not the begin all or end all for me on, on where we go forward. Thank you. Now, Vice Mayor, to address your concerns, some of the concerns of, of, of some of you talking about community input. This is how I would envision the process going forward. That if tonight, and I hope we do, that if tonight we direct staff to begin negotiations of a development agreement, to enter into a development agreement with one of these two proposers, that before that agreement is approved by this council, we're going to have those traffic studies. We're going to have that financial analysis. We're going to have that comparison is 15% the, be the best deal for, for something like this. We're going to have those workshops where the community gets to come to um, conveniently scheduled meetings and see actual renderings and facts and figures as to what is proposed to be executed. So tonight is just the first step on a fairly long journey to get to the execution of, of a development agreement to implement this, this concept. So I, I don't want the public to have any misconceptions that if we go forward tonight that we are approving density, that we're approving a look, that we're turning a blind eye to traffic concerns or density concerns, we would simply be going forward in the next step of negotiating a deal with implicit a development agreement that implicit in that process is our financial and logistical analysis of that, as well as multiple opportunities for the public to have, have input. And again, I'll be real clear. You know, for me, if we go forward tonight with authorization to staff to enter negotiations with one or the other on a development agreement, it's, for me, it's not an endorsement of the plan that's been put in front of us tonight. For me, it would be an endorsement of financial ability, experience, and kind of a, a concept that would be closest to what I would personally feel would be appropriate for that site, you know, obviously subject to some, some public input. Um, I think Councilwoman Bailey touched on it early, early on that, it's, you know, you've been looking at that empty site for a long time and it is time to to do something, and again, I'm not going to jump off the cliff just for the sake of jumping off the cliff. But again, just so the public understands, the debt on that site costs the general fund of the city of Homestead $662,000 a year. To be exact, that's $1,813.69 a day, day in and day out that could potentially be utilized and enhanced for the other everyday and special issues we need in this community. So, you know, and that's re in that regard, that's why it's, it's my hope that we will at least take the next step and authorize staff to enter into a, uh, a development agreement with, to begin negotiations, to enter into a development agreement with one proposer 
uh, or the other. And again, thank you all. I, again, the, the, the rapt attention and silence and intensity in this room from this side of the dais is, is incredible. And it's encouraging that, you know, again, as I said earlier, the uh, eyes of Homestead are on us tonight and will continue to, to, to be so. Uh, thank you all. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> um, this proposal went out, I believe, in June, right? June, J in July. July, they were, re they had a, a month to, to respond. So my colleagues and yourself have had some time to review. I am simply humbly asking for time to truly analyze both proposals so that I can wrap my head around these proposals the same way uh, everyone else has had a chance to as well. So I, I'd make a motion to defer. Okay, the Vice Mayor has proffered a motion to defer any action on this matter tonight. Is there a second to the Vice Mayor's motion? Out of respect to my colleague, um, I would proffer a second. Thank you. All right, we have a motion and a second to defer any further action on this item tonight. Do we have any discussion from council? Councilman Roth? Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I understand the reason of deferral, uh, except for one of my requests, which was, I think, alluded to by you as well, uh, the financials, uh, the uh, performers, of each of these uh, uh, applicants to the project, um, we, we could kick it down the road for many months if we want to, uh, but we're at a stage that both of these applicants have uh, proffered up excellent, excellent plans, spent, I can imagine, tons of money to bring a vision to this council that we didn't know we wanted, and it evolved into something I think we're coming close to being able to make a decision on. I also think that if I would have known this meeting was going to take this long, we would have done a special call meeting specifically for this item. Um, we've got other people here waiting for hours now to have city business heard. And I think if we could make it a date certain, bring this whole thing back next week, if we can get a quorum. Next week is Thanksgiving's week, so we have an issue there. Um, but I think to rush either which way, whether it be a decision tonight without having some of that information available to us, although it would be made available, but we're cutting out one of the developers uh, by saying, let's negotiate tonight uh, with A or B. Or do we wait another two weeks, three weeks, whatever it is, so that we satisfy our thoughts, our concerns, and our needs. Uh, and I think it would give the vice mayor some extra time to do what he needs to do as far as uh, getting caught up to these projects. Um, I'd be willing to do something like that. I don't think tonight's the night to specifically designate based on the questions I think that are still lingering out there tonight. So. Maybe we could re-phrase re, re, uh, the motion um, and this for tonight so we can move on to the rest of the business we've got because we're going to be here. It's, it's almost it's 29 now, so we're going to be here a long time tonight. I'll listen to thoughts. Councilman Alvaro. 
Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have no problem with giving you more time, Vice Mayor. I think that we have all had the privilege of meeting with these um, applicants in our offices, expressing our concerns and our requests, and they have been amicable, and I doubt that they're going to have any problems with meeting those um, arrangements for you. Um, I do would, I would like to ask that we do give some direction to um, our attorney, maybe, to consider looking at you, um, options throughout the city to transfer units um, to this site to accommodate the units that we're trying to add here under the rezoning. There may be an opportunity there. I don't know, maybe. So um, if we can at least have staff work on that while you catch up and we set that date certain, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Anything further? Council Fletcher. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, I appreciate my colleagues' uh, thought process and understanding, uh, you know, and wanting more time. But I can tell you just from you know, historical stance that, uh, you know, two years ago I sat on this council and I was given a big decision to make, uh, you know, at the, at the hiring of our city manager at that point in time because we had one that uh, uh, decided to leave us. Um, there's decisions that we have to make. Okay. Um, as I've said before, I believe timing is everything. As we continue to kick this can down the road, and that's what I see it again, we've tied up uh, several people here for over two and a half hours tonight uh, discussing something that we spoke two and a half hours about last meeting. Uh, we continue to have the same discussions over and over. Nobody wants to make a decision. We need to step up and do the job that we were elected to do. Not, not barring your comments. I understand your, your thought process, but again, the rest of us have been here for, for a couple of years now, and we've been dealing with this issue for over uh, three or four months. So. Um, I would just offer that we take into account that we have tied up a lot of people's time here this evening, that there's a lot of money that has been spent by both applicants, and we make a determination and decision on giving the city manager some direction to work towards an agreement. And in a month's time or two months' time, if it's not the right agreement, it still has got to come back to us. We're still the final say. Give that a little thought is all I ask. Thank you. Any councilman, vice mayor? Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. If we want to be specific on the amount of time for the deferral, then I'd be specific to defer to the next council meeting. Just to make it very clear. And again, um, this is a lot of information to take in if you've been here for a week. So um, what I'm asking, I'm not asking for uh, anybody to spend any more money. Uh, I'm not asking for anything else. I'm asking for time for me to understand what's in this package. Basically the same amount of time or slightly less amount of time than you guys have had. So the motion would be to defer this item to next council meeting. Madam Clerk, have we been able to establish a quorum for a special call on December 1st? No, Mr. Mayor. We have not? No. Okay. Because I had requested uh, potentially a special call on another issue on December 1st. Um, I don't know. Is anyone certain that they are not available on that day at this point? I'll be returning from traveling, so I'm not sure that I'd be able to accommodate at this point. Not, I might be able to. I have to double check the calendar. But back to your motion. Can you include for attorney to look into those units, the transferring of those units? Is that month enough time for you, Matt? Okay, thank you. Well, but certainly, but that, you know, that's going to have to be something that's agreeable by whoever is awarded the right to negotiate as well as the owner of the units to be transferred. You know, simply saying that it's doable is not the end of the story. Yeah, I, if it's the direction of the council, I can just look into the concept and how it would work, and I could, you know, we can bring something back to you to help, so that if you're interested in that concept um, at the, the next meeting when we have that discussion, um, and we can talk about the different machinations and how it would work. Mr. Milo. I just want to, you know, clarify a few things on the record, especially, you know, to, to vice mayors, uh, Concerns, you know, um, I respect the fact that you know you're. This is your your first uh, 
council meeting um, and that you're asking for more time to understand the proposals. But just a little bit of history of kind of how we've gotten here, right? So the fact that this has been a fluid process, right? You know, we've gathered information from the council. We've heard, we've met with you. Um, we, we've made modifications to the proposals and stuff. It seems like, yeah, we come and we, we discuss this and then time, what, what, it, what it does is, uh, are you envisioning what we proffered today on the record to be our proposal? Or are you envisioning another bite at the apple by which, you know, for instance, we provided home ownership, our competitors didn't, for them to now come and say, hey, we'll make this modification also, or what, can you tell me a little bit about how you envision that, that, that prime right, No, uh, like, like I've said before, I, I like the projects. I like both projects. But I don't feel like I've given, I've had enough time to reach out to um, my staff and to get answers back or to reach out to a network of people that I know that may be in academia to say, Hey, is, is this a good project? Because the only thing we are comparing is your project to uh, another proposer's project. But I'd like an independent third party to say, hey, this is normal. This is normal uh, with, with uh, private, pu private public partnerships. And I think we owe it to the community and to the residents to say, hey, we've dotted every I and crossed every T. We've looked under every hood so that nobody can say to me, hey, that was pretty rushed. I mean, you got there, you made a decision on your first go round. So I apologize if this is costing you guys money. Uh, all I'm asking for is 30 days or to the next uh, council meeting. But again, with the caveat that what was proposed today is what you're going to consider and vet? Correct. So you're just trying to look for an independent opinion from academia as to what Academia could be a financial advisor. Um, for example, you, you, in, in the proposals, there'd be something that's 15% of net cash flow. I, I don't know what that means. I mean, I know what it means. I mean, if we work the numbers backwards, you know, there is, a, you know, potential gross income from the units that are going to be built and there's going to be income from the retail part of that. We have no idea what the construction cost to you guys could be. It's a vertically integrated company. So I know that there are some efficiencies there, but what if, what if we could get 30% and we just didn't know, we just have to take your word for it. No. So I think, I think that goes to my point The the issue is, is it that you have two viable proposers here? Right? Uh -huh. I think all of you uh, have articulated the fact that you like certain aspects of a plan, like certain aspects of the other plan. You've you had five proposers when this process started. Only two of them have continued to come to this council and accept, you know, input from this council, continue to spend time, money, and effort to try to find a way to, you know, pro, you know promote the, the, the site. So now that's, that's kind of what the question I was trying to, 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 to ask is, we've put what we're proposing on the table, right? And again, there's some similarities, there's some differences. But as it relates to, you know, questions of, hey, is there proposer number three, right? Let's just use that as an example that might not be anyone that even participated in the initial process. So are you envisioning now saying, hey, it's now a new proposer that wasn't part of this process to come in here and say, hey, council, you know, maybe I can build this project and maybe I will give you 30%. That's not what I'm proposing. All I'm saying is I would like to uh, have until the next council meeting so that I could dive into both proposals and then come up with the answer that I feel most comfortable with. And that's what I've respectively asked my colleagues to grant me time for. Because again, this is day number one, and I don't want anyone in the community coming to me saying, you didn't ask all the right questions. Is that fair enough? 
Fair enough. Because no one likes to make decisions uh, in a rush. No one likes to feel pressured in making a decision. I think you feel most comfortable when, when, when you have studied A to Z. And then you make a decision. Fair enough. Thank you, Mayor, sir. Mayor, if I may. Council Walden. Thank you. Um, I want to clarify that um, I think the right decision would be to make a choice tonight. But out of pure courtesy to my colleague, to my vice mayor, I am happy to get, give the extra time. And so with that, I'd like to call the question. Well, if I may, if it would change your perspective at all, this is my view of the vice mayor's request. Since the last Friday of August, at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, our vice mayor has known he was going to have a seat up here by virtue of being elected by no opposition. This matter was pending at this point. He is not a stranger to our staff. He previously served on this council for eight months. He knew he was going to be here. He could have asked those questions. And I'll tell you something else. A few days after our council meeting last month, I handed him the section out of my council book that dealt with what we had before us at that time. So respectfully, I don't buy that you haven't had the opportunity, you've known you were gonna be here, and I provided you with information, and it's not like you didn't have a relationship with staff to be able to come in and ask those questions and have anything clarified. I think that it's really disingenuous uh, of you at this point, and I'm sorry, I didn't wanna have, you know, the first meeting of my second term start this way, but, um, you know, we've gotta move forward. I don't know what your real agenda is. I guess we'll see it at some point. But I tried to clarify your concerns by saying, I felt the process would include those kinds of analysis as the development agreement was crafted. So bottom line is, clearly I'm probably gonna lose. Again, I will not support a deferral on the basis of that one member claims he didn't have the opportunity to fully educate himself on this issue tonight. The question's been called. Let's have a roll call vote just on so the I motion clarify, to defer. Just so I can clarify, Mr. Mayor. We've got families, we've got jobs. You know, when you're campaigning, you, we went from one unopposed campaign to a vice mayor campaign. So I could have a packet of information not necessarily having all the time in the world to go through it because you are, you're sitting up here on the dice and y your job is to do that. So it's unfortunate that I'm asking for 30 days and it, it seems to be that I've got this hidden agenda and all I'm asking is to allow me time to get my head wrapped around this. That's all. Mr. Thank Vice you. Mayor, I'm not Superman but I had a dying father and a campaign that was a hell of a lot worse than anything you ever ran, and I managed to do my job as a member of this council during that time and educate myself and make the time to do what needed to be done. So we have a motion and a second, and the question's been called. Let's have, and the motion is to defer this matter to the next regular council meeting, which is December 15th. Is that correct? Madam Clerk? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Call. Councilman Raw? Yes. Councilman Fletcher? No. Councilwoman Avila? Yes. Councilwoman Fairclaude Staggers? Yes. Councilwoman Bailey? Yes. Vice Mayor Guzman? Yes. Mayor Lozner? No. The motion carries. Thank you all for coming tonight and with my sincere apologies and embarrassment that it has come to this once again. We've been here for three hours already tonight. Would anyone object to a five minute recess? All right, we're gonna take a five minute recess. All right, thank you, we're back.
More than five minutes, but who was I kidding when I said five minutes? All right, we are going to pick up the agenda at uh, the first reading of car number 3398. Uh, this is uh, agenda addendum item one, Mr. Pearl. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this is first reading of an ordinance of the City of Homestead, Florida, amending the City Code of Ordinances by amending Division 2 competitive bids of Chapter 2 administration, increasing the purchasing limitations, providing additional exemptions from competitive bidding, and updating several provisions, providing for severability, providing for inclusion in the code, and providing for conflicts and an effective date. Thank you. All right. We need a motion to add addendum item 1 to the agenda. Move it. It's been moved by Councilman Ross, seconded by Councilman Fletcher. Any further discussion? Roll call, Madam Clerk. Councilman Fletcher. Councilwoman Avila. Councilman, Councilwoman Bailey. Yes. Councilwoman Fairclaude Staggers. Yes. Councilman Raw. Yes. Vice Mayor Guzman. Yes. Mayor Lozner. Yes. The motion carries. All right, Madam Manager, staff report. Thank you, Mayor. This item was actually the subject of discussion at the last cow meeting. And as discussed, over the past six months, the city has seen a marked increase in the cost of goods and services it procures for day-to-day -day operations. This trend is confirmed by both the producer and consumer price indexes attached as exhibits one and two. As a result of these increases, the city is beginning to experience delays in procuring goods and services due to the existing purchasing limits, which have not changed since 2005. Consequently, these delays are negatively impacting city operations by adding an additional 30 to 60 days to the current procurement process. Staff recommends that the Mayor and Council approve the proposed amendment of the City Code of Ordinance Division 2 competitive bids of Chapter 2 administration, increasing the City's purchasing limitations from $25,000, $35,000 to $50,000, $65,000, and updating several other prov provisions to streamline procurement processes. And notably, this increase, if approved, would not include the City Manager's authority for $25,000 for professional services. It's just for goods and commodities. Thank you. Any questions from council? All right. We'll uh, open the public hearing. Is there anyone in the audience or on line wishing to speak on this matter? None, appear none appearing. I'll close the public hearing and entertain a motion for approval. Moved by Councilman Fletcher. Seconded by Councilwoman Bailey. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Councilman Raw. Yes. Councilwoman Avila. Yes. Councilman Fletcher. Councilwoman Bailey. Yes. Councilwoman Fairclaw Staggers? Yes. Vice Mayor Guzman? Yes. Mayor Lozner? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. Next item, consent agenda, tabs 1 through 12. We'll entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Moved by Councilwoman Bailey, seconded by the Vice Mayor, Madam Manager. We pulled the one item from consent, Mayor. Just right, to with the exception of uh, item 5 that has been resolved without action tonight. Um, we have a motion to second. I just want to be very clear. I've heard some chatter. I am totally and without reservation in favor of this premium and hazard pay. My reservations were with respect to the vaccination payment. I philosophically have a problem with that, but you know, as logistically and procedurally the way this went forward, I wish it could have been done, could have been done differently to, to sever those two items, perhaps. But um, I want to be very clear and unambiguous that I have no reservations about the, uh, the across-the-board premium and hazard pay, as we call it. And upon reflection, I'd like to be registered as a no vote on tab 12. I'm not really down with spending $156,000 on a piece of art that uh, came at the end of a big presentation and was nothing more than a black and white pencil drawing of what was proposed. There was a lot of nice colored pretty stuff as to what the guy had done in the past, but really no, whole, not a whole lot of detail as to what we were buying. So um, I could just be recorded as a no vote on tab 12. So all in favor of the consent agenda? Aye. Any opposed? All right, next item. Mr. Pearl, are you taking this one? Yes, Mr. Mayor. 
Please be advised that the following items on the agenda are quasi-judicial in nature. If you wish to comment upon any of these items, please indicate the item number you would like to address when the announcement regarding the quasi-judicial item is made. An opportunity for persons to speak on each item will be made available after the applicant and staff have made their presentations on each item. All testimony, including public testimony and evidence, will be made under oath or affirmation. Additionally, each person who gives testimony be, may be subject to cross-examination. If you do not wish to either be cross-examined or sworn, your testimony will be given its due weight. The general public will not be permitted to cross-examine witnesses, but the public may request the counsel to ask questions or staff or witnesses on their behalf. The full public agenda packet on each item is hereby entered into the record. Persons representing organizations must present evidence of their authority to speak for their organization. Further details of the quasi-judicial procedures may be obtained from the clerk in accordance with uh, Code Section 2-591. Any lobbyist must register before addressing the council on any of the following items. At this time, council members must disclose any ex parte communications concerning the items on the agenda. Councilman Fletcher? Yeah, I've uh, had discussions on tabs 13 through 21 and 23 through 27. Thank you. Uh, Councilwoman Perry Falls Staggers, any ex party to report? Yes, I've had conversations with the applicants for tabs 13 through 21. Just make sure. Yes, 13 through 21. Um, same as uh, thank you, Councilwoman Bailey. Same as Councilman Fletcher. Councilwoman Owl. Uh, tabs 13 through 21, and I recall Tropical Villas, so I'm going to say 22 just in case. Thank you, Councilman Roth. Uh, tab 13 through 21. Thank you. Thank you, and I uh, also echo the uh, conversations reflected by Councilman Fletcher. All right, Mr. Pearl. Uh, at this time, the clerk will swear in any persons who wish to testify in any of the quasi-judicial items. Please stand and raise your right hand. Do you hereby swear or affirm to tell the truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God? Thank you. You may be seated. Ms. Pro, we're going to take 13 through 21 as a bulk item. And um, tab 30 as well, which is uh, the prop share agreement, uh, the related prop share agreement to the, this application. Um, if, as per usual, if it's your will, I'll, I'll read all the titles into the record. We'll have a collective discussion, and then you can vote on each item individually. Let's do it. All right, uh, bear with me for a moment. You feel free to take another recess. Uh, <laughs> A resolution of the City Council, tab 13, is a resolution of the City of Homestead, Florida, granting a variance request from Section 30-111, sub 1, building site area requirements of the City Code of Ordinances to permit a minimum 5,000 square foot lot where a minimum 7,500 square foot lot is currently required for the development of 97 single family dwelling units out of the total 377 residential dwelling units proposed for the development of a new residential subdivision located on approximately 42 acre parcel of land generally located north of East Maury Drive, east of Northeast 13th Avenue, south of C103 Canal and west of Southwest 167 Avenue, Farm Life School Road as legally described in Exhibit A and providing for an effective date. Tab 14 is a resolution of the City Council of Florida granting a variance request from Section 30-154 front yard requirements of the City Code of Ordinances to reduce the minimum front setback for detached single family homes to 14 feet and 7 inches where a minimum of 25 feet is required for the development of 97 single family dwelling units out of the total 377 dwelling units proposed for the development of a new residential subdivision located on approximately 42 acre parcel of land generally located north of East Maury Drive, east of Northeast 13th Avenue, south of C103 Canal and west of Southwest 162nd Avenue, Farm Life School Road as legally described in Exhibit A and providing for an effective date. Tab 15 is a resolution of the City Council of the City of Homestead, Florida granting a variance request from Section 30-114-1, Building Site Area Requirements of the City Code of Ordinances to permit a minimum lot width of 50 feet for certain single-family dwelling units where a minimum lot width of 60 feet is currently required 
for the development of 97 single family dwelling units out of the total 370 residential dwelling units proposed for the development of a new residential subdivision located on an approximately 42 acre parcel of land generally located north of East Maori Drive, east of Northeast 113th, south of C103 Canal, and west of Southwest 162nd Avenue, Farm Life School Road, as legally described in Exhibit A and providing for an effective date. Tab 16, a resolution of the City of Homestead, Florida, granting a variance request from Section 30-161, Patio, Terrace, and Balconies, to permit a deduction of the minimum patio or terrace living area requirements for two-story townhomes to 26 35 and 115 square feet where 150 square feet is required for the development of 280 townhome dwelling units out of the 377 residential units proposed for the development of a new residential subdivision located on an approximately 42 acre parcel of land generally located north of East Mary Drive east of Northeast 13th Avenue south of C103 Canal and west of Southwest 162nd Avenue, Farm Life School Road, as legally described in Exhibit A and providing for an effective date. Tab 17, is a resolution of the, City Count of the City of Homestead, Florida, granting a variance request from Section 30-152, lot width of the City Code of Ordinances to permit a minimum lot width of 22 feet, where a minimum lot width of 25 feet is currently required for the development of 280 townhouses and 97 single-family dwelling units within a new residential subdivision located on an approximately 42-acre parcel of land generally located north of East Maury Drive, east of Northeast 13th Avenue, south of C103 Canal, and west of 167 Avenue. Farm Life School Road is legally described in Exhibit A and providing for an effective date. Tab 18, a resolution of the City of Homestead, Florida, granting a variance request from Section 30-159A, Parking of the City Code of Ordinances, to waive the requirement that each, each two-story townhome dwelling unit provide an attached storage area that is at least 40 square feet accessible from the exterior, required for the development of 280 townhome dwelling units out of the total 377 dwelling units proposed for the development of a new residential subdivision located on an approximately 42-acre parcel of land generally located north of East Maury Drive, east of Northeast 13th Avenue, south of C103 Canal, and west of Southwest 162nd Avenue, Farm Life School Road, as legally described in Exhibit A and providing for an effective date. Tab 19, a resolution of the City of Homestead, Florida, approving a special exception request by D.R. Horton, Inc. for the development of a new residential subdivision totaling 377 residential dwelling units, which consist of 280 townhome dwelling units and 97 single-family dwelling units on an approximately 42-acre parcel of land generally located north of East Maury Drive, east of Northeast 13th Ave, south of C-103 Canal, and west of Southwest 162nd Avenue, Farm Life School Road, as legally described in Exhibit A and providing for an effective date, Tab 20, is a resolution of the, city, of the City of Homestead, Florida, granting site plan approval requested by D.R. Horton, Inc. for the development of a new residential subdivision totaling 377 residential units, which consist of 280 townhome dwelling units and 97 single-family dwelling units on an approximately 42-acre parcel of land generally located north of East Maury Drive, east of Northeast 13th Avenue, south of C-103 Canal, and west of Southwest 162nd Avenue, Farm Life School Road, as legally described in Exhibit A, providing for an effective date. Tab 21 is a resolution of the City of Homestead, Florida, granting tentative plat approval requested by D.R. Horton, Inc. for the development of a new residential subdivision totaling 377 residential dwelling units, which consist of 280 townhome dwelling units and 97 single-family dwelling units on an approximately 42-acre parcel of land generally located north of East Maury Drive, east of Northeast 13th Ave, south of C-103 Canal, and west of Southwest 162nd Avenue, Farm Life School Road, as legally described in Exhibit A and providing for an effective date. And finally, tab 30 is a resolution of the City of Homestead, Florida, approving a transportation proportionate share agreement, providing for implementation and providing for an effective date. Have at it, Mr. Corradino. <clears throat> yes, sir, I'll be brief uh, in comparison. Uh, no offense, man. Uh, as, as the attorney had mentioned, this is uh, the applicant is seeking the development uh, uh, approval of new residential subdivision with 377 residential dwelling units that has uh, 280 townhomes and 97 single-family units on about 42 acres of land. 
This application consists of 10, th this batch of applications consists of 10 different applications, six of which are variances, uh, a special exception, a site plan, tentative plat, and then there's a transportation, a fair share, proportionate mitigation. Uh, we, I'll, I'll briefly run through the variances. It's a, a site area variance uh, requesting a 5,000 square foot lot or 7,500 square feet uh, is the minimum requirements. A front yard variant, a side a front setback variance, we're f requesting 14.7 uh, feet where 25 is the minimum requirement. A, si uh, a, a lot width requesting a 50 foot width where 60 is the minimum requirement. A patio terrace um, variance requesting uh, 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 in various different units, 26, 35, and 115 square feet of the terrace where 150 is the minimum requirement. Lot width, um, again, where we are requesting uh, 22 feet, where 25 is required, and then the storage area, requesting zero feet, where 40 is required. Uh, <clears throat> there are no hardships, in our opinion, for those variances. Therefore, we are recommending denial of each. The special, special exception is called for uh, in the area to permit um, the development of single-family dwelling units on a vacant parcel of land so, so far as certain provisions in the code are met, um, like being adjacent uh, to properties, uh, R1 and R2 uses adjacent uh, or across the street properties. <clears throat> that criteria is met, um, but because we're recommending a denial of the site plan, because we're recommending a denial of the variances, we're recommending a denial of the special exception. The tentative plat, again, because of the, the variances caused the site plan to be denied, um, special exception to be denied, we are recommending denial of the tentative plat. And then uh, if we get there, the, the recommend that you just consider the proportionate fair share uh, mitigation. We have uh, their traffic engineer, our traffic engineer, are with us tonight to explain the details of that. And we can do that. So with that, um, I'll, I'll answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Ms. Scordino. You're welcome. Um, before we hear from the applicant, are there any questions to staff from council? All right, we're ready to hear from the applicant. Good evening, Mr. Arza. Just one second. <clears throat> Good evening once again, Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor, uh, Council Members, Hugo Arza, Law Offices at 701 Berkel Avenue. Pleasure to be before you this evening. Congratulations to those of you that were reelected and once again, up there, I guess we can't say reelected, but it's uh, nice to see you again, Vice Mayor. Um, I'm joined today by uh, numerous representatives from DR Horton, thank you, uh, as well as my colleagues, uh, Pedro Gassant and James Williams, uh, Carl Albertson uh, of DR Horton, Javi Tavel, and Cindy Caldevilla of DR Horton. And as uh, Mr. Gordino mentioned, we also have our traffic engineer here, um, as well as uh, I believe the city has theirs available too to discuss any of the concerns or issues that there might be with a proportionate share mitigation agreement. Um, I will try to be brief, hopefully somewhere in between uh, uh, Joe and Matt's uh, presentations, mostly because I think I've had an opportunity personally to meet and discuss to us, um, at some point with all of you. I mean, with every single one of you, I think I met at least twice. Represent <clears throat> Either I met with uh, you all twice or representatives of our team met with you all twice. We were scheduled to be before this body back in July. Um, through no fault of our own, we weren't able to move forward at that time. Um, we didn't even kind of get a swing at the, at the plate. Um, we uh, were dealing with a proportionate share issue with the school district. We thought we needed an agreement from the school district. We get, kept getting pushed back and pushed back. It turned out we didn't need the agreement. Long story for another day. We do meet school concurrency, but that pushed us into September. At that time, we met with some of you. There were some concerns raised um, regarding the project. We have made some changes to the project, so we deferred in September to be before you tonight, and I'll walk through some of these pro uh, proposed changes that we've made. Um, so I clicked on the big button, I'm assuming. So, um, as Mr. Cordino said, 42-acre parcel, farm life, uh, northwest corner of Maori and farm life. Is it better to? Yeah, I'm too tall. Oh, wow. I broke, I broke City Hall. It's on. Okay. So 42-acre um, parcel on the northwest corner of farm life and East Maori Drive, 320th and 162. Um, and uh, parcel well-known to all of you. It's, it's uh, unique in that it's surrounded by... Um, it's really, you know, it's either got a road or a canal next to it. So it actually doesn't necessarily abut any other piece of land or property 
um, without having to cross some right of way, whether it's a road or a canal. Very few properties that I've dealt with have those features. Um, that comes into play a little later when you see some of the dedications that have been made over time that have reduced the total acreage. Um, but, you know, a very noticeable uh, uh, piece of property. Uh, and this zoomed out aerial, I think, gives a, a bit of a better sense for all of you. Um, you know, just a lengthy discussion earlier today about the City Hall site, and it's just uh, up towards the northwest uh, uh, of our site. We're, we're in close proximity, obviously, to uh, US-1, um, just west of the, the turnpike, and I'll, I'll reference being west of the turnpike on a couple of uh, occasions because there are some, um, uh, some, some, some characteristics to this land that are important to note because the property is sort of west and closer to your more urbanized areas. Um, Current land use and zoning. Um, you know, I've heard a lot in the conversations that I had with all of you about, um, you know, that this project will increase density or this project will grant density. Um, in fact, it won't do either. Maybe it's just my sort of being technical about it. But to me, a project increases density when you are taking the master plan and adding density to it. When you are seeking a land use change, that is what increasing density is. If, if your land use, as it does here, already designates this property for medium density land use and for R3 zoning, which is your apartment house zoning district, then this property has density. It will be and should be reasonably developed um, and, and your city's anticipating and expecting that it will be developed with that, with those characteristics in mind. And so we, we've taken a different approach. We, we don't want to build apartment houses. We want to build something different and we'll, we'll show what we want to build. But I do think it's important to keep in the back of our minds as we talk about this tonight, and I would urge all of you to keep it in, in the front of your minds as you think about this project, that this property is not one in which we are seeking a land use change or to increase density from what your master plan calls for already today. And so, um, and maybe that's a distinction without a difference, you know, maybe, maybe nobody cares about that, um, but it is important because ultimately I do think this parcel gets developed and I, get, I think it gets developed hopefully this evening by approving this uh, terrific project, um, but it's going to get developed consistent with medium density and R3 type zoning um, one way or the other, either this project or another one. And it's just a reality because that's what your master plan calls for. So uh, for us, it's not about increasing density. It's about proposing the best project. Um, the area, and again, I, I wanted to highlight west of the turnpike, you have the area and you have the property up there, um, you know, in the middle. And then, and then you know, we've just kind of highlighted and, and pointed an arrow to a number of the uh, developments nearby. I'm not going to go through all of them. You all know them. It's some of your hold, older housing stock and inventory. Um, you know, a lot of things that were built in the 80s and 90s, maybe the early 2000s, which at this point, you know, remarkably is already 20, 30, 40 years ago. Time, time passes. And so, you know, this is an area that, that does see more um, density and, and what you have around it reflects that kind of density. And, and that tends to support why the master plan says what it says and why the zoning category is what it is. Um, in addition to a master plan that you have and in addition to um, a land use design or a, a zoning designation that you have on the property, you also have a controlling declaration of restrictions. This property went through its rezoning process just a few short years ago. Um, some of you sitting up there today were sitting up there when the, when the project was brought to you by the, by the owner of the property. And, um, and that controlling declaration of restrictions granted the rezoning to R3 and then um, specified that it um, you know, could be utilized for residential unit, units up to a maximum total of 398 dwelling units. So again, you know, in terms of increasing density, you'll see that our project is actually proposing less than what the controlling declaration of restrictions that this council approved um, just four and a half years ago or so uh, would allow. And of those 398, up to 150 of those could be um, garden styles, uh, apartments, which could be, of course, concentrated on less land, thus allowing for, for more development because the garden style tends to go higher. So, um, you know, we, we, we took that in mind, but D.R. Horton is, uh, you know, is a fee simple for sale developer, you know, one of the nation's largest um, and, uh, and well known to this community and to this council. Just, just recently, um, if, you, if I went back and I didn't mention it, um, the, the Maria Estates project uh, just eight blocks south or even closer than that, five blocks to, from, from the closest point to the closest point. Um, was, was approved by this council, by many of you that were sitting up there. And we've already incorporated some of those changes that we made to models and products and things of the like to incorporate them here. Um, and a lot like Marie, this is about a bit of a compromise. That was another project in which some of the underlying approvals might have allowed for townhomes and we were able to come in with an all single family home project. The project before you today could have 
apartments, garden style apartments, and we've chosen to go with single family homes and townhomes. And again, you know, we think it's a better fit for the marketplace. And I just wanted to, to make sure that we, we highlighted that we are incorporating those, those best practices, let's call them, from the last approval. Um, and here's the, you know, a landscape site plan. And I want to draw your attention to just a couple of big level <coughs> points. You've got a, a ring of single family homes around the entire outside, west, east, north, and south. So basically, we, we ring the property for, with, with single family homes, and then we concentrate in the middle um, the, the town home development, we, we landscape, you know, lushly, you know, consistent with your code and exceeding your code. And then we create at the main entrance on Maori, kind of right in the middle of the project, let's call it, we create a boulevard, um, a, an entrance feature boulevard um, with the clubhouse. And then you'll see some depictions of what's behind the clubhouse, the pool area, the recreational space and the open space, really giving a, a, a terrific sort of um, avenue for feel to, to this community and to this project. And then, and we'll have some, some um, renderings later that will show it, you'll, you'll notice that um, if you start from the top and you go down to the second left to right, you know, east to west movement, you'll see that those trees kind of jog. That's because that's a walkway that we've created in between the buildings. It was a suggestion of staff when we were working with them. Um, we appreciate their efforts and their time in working with us. We know their hands are a bit tied with um, respect to their um, recommendations and what they can recommend um, with respect to the variances and the like. Um, but we, that didn't stop us from working closely with them and taking their advice on uh, design elements and other elements, and that actually was one of their um, suggestions, and we were happy to incorporate it. Um, so, you know, you had them all read in, and, and so what I'm going to do to simplify matters is I'm just going to kind of talk a little bit about the three types. So we've got three that apply to the entirety of the property, which is the site plan, the special exception to allow for R1 development. Curiously, your, your city code requires us to ask for permission to develop a less intense project than what the zoning category allows. So in R3, we can't just simply develop R1. Um, and as Mr. Corradino ex explained, we, we meet that criteria, but for the fact that the site plan, they have to recommend denial on the site plan, but we do meet the criteria for the spe special exception. And then the T plat, which of course applies to the entirety of the property. The next three are variances for single family, um, uh, homes, and then the final three are for townhomes. So the single-family homes, um, we are providing single-family homes. Um, we are providing homes that start with 5,000 square foot lots rather than your minimum requirement of 7,500. So really, 2019-31 and 2019-33 are related. Um, you, you typically would need to have 60 feet wide, 7,500. We're providing minimum of 5,000. Doesn't mean that every one of them is only 5,000, but a minimum of 5,000 and a minimum of 50 feet. So. 2019-31 and 2019-33 kind of go hand in hand. 2019-32, um, the variance for the front setback of 14 feet, um, I'm actually going to withdraw this evening. We, we had a lot of conversations um, with, um, with all of you. Um, uh, you know, rather than uh, adding um, a, it, this, this particular variance referred to the single story home. So single story homes, which tend to be a little, I know it's not very PC to say it this way, but they're a little fatter, right? I mean, two story homes kind of go straight up and you can put them on a smaller footprint. The single story homes extend out a little bit. Um, this particular home was larger um, for plate, let's call it. And so we were asking for a, a modest um, variance um, to the front of 14 feet. Um, we are gonna withdraw that. We, we will commit because DR would like to still provide for a one story model. We will commit that we will go through the city's administrative process to provide for a one story model that meets all setback requirements. We can do that administratively. Oftentimes developers will change the models and there's criteria within which they can change. And we believe that one of the things we can do is propose a new model administratively that as long as it doesn't violate any of the setbacks, and we'll do that so that this project will ultimately provide for a one-story home. So, um, you know, uh, I think it's tab 14, if I, if I wrote correctly, um, we will actually um, ask for, um, uh, to be removed, and, and really the practical effect of that is that we are removing that one-story model from our plans for the time being, and then we'll bring another one. And then the final um, set of variances relate to the, um, the townhomes. And then, um, and, and, and a couple of them are familiar to you guys. The, the last one I'll pick up, which is the easiest one, is the storage unit requirements for townhomes. Um, you know, it, it, your, your code requires you to have an outdoor or a, a storage unit that you can access from the outside. We have garages for all our units. We have room to store trash cans and the like. Um, we have room to store shutters, but I will get to it in a minute. Um, I don't think this community will need shutters, um, given one of the proffers we're going to make. Um, but they all, have, they all have garages, and so uh, we think it's a reasonable 
um, variants. And then um, the other two really are, again, related, just like the single-family ones were related. Um, the marketplace has a wide range of townhomes, starting from as low as 18 feet wide up to, you know, 28 or 30 feet. Um, DR's model that they consistently sell, sell well, are selling in your city are 22 foot wide, but your code requires 25 foot wide. Um, it, you know, practically speaking, and we'll show you renderings and pictures, um, I mean, it's, it's a model that is, is very popular and, and, and buyers love. Um, and, you know, candidly, when you start to get, if you just make the model larger, you've got to kind of pass that cost along. Ultimately, the sale of homes just becomes something about, you know, square footage times, um, times, times the cost of, of construction. And so we can actually provide for large, you know, townhomes between 16 and 1,850 square feet with that 22-foot width and not have to make them so big that we're really forced to sort of, you know, bring up the price even if it's by like 15 or $20,000 just to make up for the fact that we're spending more to construct them. So we think it's a modest request. And the patio or terrace requirement, we are providing terraces, second floor terraces on all of them. We're not taking those out. Some of the patios are a little smaller because, of course, if the townhome width is a little smaller, the patio, you know, we just have a little less room to work with. We had a choice. We could have either given the slightly larger patios and asked for an impervious pavement variants, or we could have asked for a slightly smaller terrace, um, or patio, excuse me. Um, since all of the homes were going to get patios, no matter what, none of them were going to be left without a patio, we felt this request was probably a little bit more reasonable so that we didn't have to get into any kind of irrigation or, uh, you know, water issues or anything of the like where, you know, somebody said, well, you have an impervious problem. How are you going to drain your water? We didn't want to go there. We figured a slightly smaller terrace could work. So those are all the requests, and, and it is a lot. But like I said, um, we've explained a lot of them to all of you, I, th I think, in great detail. And, and we've tried to justify all of them. You know, at the end of the day, we're talking about um, a project that we think in its totality is a better project than what might come from a straight R3 project. And, and that's, you know, and, and no, you don't have one of those. I know you just spent a long time with the opportunity to sort of sit up here and compare two projects. I, I don't have two projects to compare to you. But I can tell you that I, I think that this community um, will we'll greatly benefit from a project that looks like this from a, from a home builder that's in your community already. Um, and that, you know, I, I think that the apartment house um, style already, you know, is in this area. There are a bunch of, you know, properties in this area already and that what we're proposing is, uh, is something better. Um, uh, you know, we think it's important. I talked about it. This is a property that's surrounded in all four directions by right of way, whether it's canal or road. And uh, as you can see here, I'm not going to go through all these numbers, but over time, this property has dedicated more than, more right of way to canals and roads than any property I've ever seen. I mean, it's dedicated um, almost four and a half acres. Um, so, you know, approximately 10% of the property, in, of this property over time by previous owners, current owner, whatever the case may be, has been dedicated from farm life, from Maori, and for the canal. So, you know, the property was, you know, four, almost four and a half acres larger at one point. And, uh, and, and so, you know, I, I think that that helps to also um, explain and justify some of the requests that we had this evening. Um, we removed this front setback variance after submitting the, uh, the, the uh, PowerPoint presentation, so I don't have to go through it, but we were just pointing out what they were, and it's the same with this one, so I don't have to do that. Um, so now the, the variance that we are asking for to not have an outdoor storage area um, accessible for the townhomes, um, we had provided this um, blow up of the garage so that you could see um, where you could have shutter storage as well as those 50.0, those are the, the big trash cans. So we're just kind of showing how you could park a car and still have, you know, uh, got, uh, trash cans and the like. Um, but I, I, I buried, I didn't do a good job of burying the lead. Um, we are prepared this evening to offer impact windows as a standard feature for all of the units in this project. Um, you know, I, I, I think we heard from some of you, it's, a, it's, a, it's nice not to worry when a storm is coming. Um, if you're older, you don't want to put the shower, uh, you know, you don't want to put them up for one reason. If you're younger and you've got kids and you're worried about making sure you have enough food and water, you don't want to be messing with shutters for other reasons. Um, you know, we, we, we think that if that's one of the, the suggestions and we heard it from some of you um, and we could do it and we checked and, and, and are um, happy to submit that. So the variance request remains because we're not going to provide that outdoor storage, but you now have even less need for shutter storage. We have no need for shutter storage. Um, and we believe that that can just be conditioned. I mean, the window types aren't called out in your projects, and so we'll just, of course, commit to doing that. Um, talked a little bit about that walkway, pathway, and I pointed it out in the, 
in the site plan, and here's just a rendering of what that'll look like, and again, a, a suggestion from staff to really provide for some inner connectivity from the sides, um, from, from the, uh, um, uh, for, for, for one side of the project to the other side of the project, and then back to that central boulevard point with the amenities. Um, the townhouse renderings, um, you know, the, the renderings don't do a great job, but we are also, as I said, carrying over, you know, it, it's hard to tell with the, the roof lines, but um, we are also providing for cement tile as we did with the Maria Estates project. And so if, if that's, you know, the renderings don't make that particularly clear, we'd like to just make sure the record is clear that DR will uh, provide for cement tile roofs. And then, you know, these are some of the renderings that we have. And then single family homes, which again, we, we submitted our um, PowerPoint presentation before we were able to, you know, get to the decision to remove the one story model. So we are showing here, you know, just sort of a mix. You know, oftentimes we hear about, you know, um, projects looking too similar to identical. I mean, subdivisions do tend to have some conformity. We, we appreciate that. But there is a difference in architectural types. And, uh, and here there was going to be a difference, and there will be a difference. We will have a one-story model, just not the one that you're seeing on the screen. We'll have one that's just a little bit smaller and respects your setbacks, and we're happy to provide that. But this gives you a sense of how it all works. And here you've got, you know, some more renderings. And so, you know, a lot of the details that we've pointed out in the past. And, and again, I remind all of you that from when that first Maria Estates project was heard by this council and then deferred for several months, we worked diligently to improve um, these, these models and we've carried them over to this project. So really, in some respects, this second DR Horton project is the culmination of two, you know, almost two year, if not longer, processes that saw improvements to these models. And so you'll see shutter types and you'll see different types of um, garages and the like. And it's hard sometimes with the glare to, to see it all, but I know I've had an opportunity to show this to all of you in, in, in closer quarters in your offices. And so I think you can see what this is. And again, the, the uh, one-story model will change slightly, but not, you know, radically. The construction and the, the materials will look very similar, but you can see the front doors are different, the, the shutters are different, um, some of the roof lines are different. Um, just going through and I won't belabor a lot of them. Um, renderings are great. I mean, computer generated and you can make them look like whatever you want. We thought it was important to actually provide photographs of a, of a single family home that, that, you know, similar footprint, the type of model that we're proposing here that uh, DR constructs. These are photographs. These are not, um, so, so if you focus especially on the top two and, and, and the bottom two, I mean, the, the, the four on the left are, you know, obviously beautifully staged. I have three kids. My room never looks like that, I can promise you. Uh, I don't think anybody who lives a real life ever has a room that looks like that. Um, but even if you just focus on the, on the two and the right, uh, on the top and on the bottom, I mean, that is what they look like. I mean, they get landscaped. They look like that. They have those color palettes, the, the stainless steel appliances and, and the, and the high-end finishes. This is what folks are getting. And so, again, when, when, when somebody talks about a project, you know, looking very similar or... Uh, cookie cutter I heard, things like that. You know, look, I, I, I think there's some conformity, but I think what buyers and what your future residents and what the young families who are maybe renting in this community and want to buy a home are looking for is the stuff on the right. They want a home that's pretty where they can make a family and uh, raise a family and, and, and make a life for themselves. And, uh, and hopefully they can keep it like those pictures on the left, but if they have kids, I doubt they will. But the pictures do, I think, tell a, a great story that the renderings maybe um, gloss over. Entrance of the community, um, and again, you know, just a celebrated entrance. This will not be a gated community, so it will be free and, and, and open for streets. Um, we've got a, uh, uh, a Councilwoman Avila, I see you smiling. I think I know why. Um, we, we have uh, found a place for the American flag, a, a recent uh, code change in your city. Um, and this, again, is the clubhouse area. And here's sort of the overview of the clubhouse area. So to the left is the entrance, and then as you can see, um, as you work your way back, we've got pool area and tot lot and, and open green space area um, to, with parking around it so that if, you know, this is parking that isn't for any one of the units. And so if you're coming down to work out, and I'll show you some of the renderings. Actually, before that, um, we are I'm gonna work with staff to incorporate um, a kiddie pool area to the pool area when we think that's a change that we can do sort of administratively as we go through permitting. But these are some examples that DR has done in the past. When we want this, we, we anticipate young families here um, and here were the amenities I was talking about, whether it's the gym amenities in the top right or, uh, or, or the uh, bottom in the center, middle, the, uh, the, the area, seating area to, you know, for, for a gathering or a meeting. Um, I mean, this will be the central hub. Um, this is, you know, several thousand square feet. I have the numbers in the back here. I think it's uh, 
uh, yeah, I mean, well, the, the recreational space is about half an acre there and about another 11,500 feet in amenities, um, so including the clubhouse. So, um, you know, ample amenities for the community. Um, you've heard, uh, again, teed up, and it's, one, it's your last item, item 30. We do have two proportionate chair amounts, so your, your code requires us to go through a concurrency process. It gets evaluated. Your traffic consultants and our traffic consultants um, evaluate traffic. They came up with two um, locations at which our project was, was triggering a, a failure of some type. In this case, it's four feet. So if you look at the, uh, at the lines up there, the one on the very top is the one with our project included. And again, at this, at this uh, distance, it's hard to tell. But in the bottom left hand, you can see that, the, uh, that what we are uh, um, you know, short um, on, the, on the right, the total condition with the project trip adds four feet to the queue. So, you know, I mean, it's almost a de minimis, but the code says you've got to pay no matter what, and that number comes out to almost $26,000. And then there is um, the Campbell and Farm Life intersection. And so that intersection is familiar to those of you who are sitting up there because the Maria States project actually provided for the improvements that we're showing in the top two pictures. So that's been approved already, and those improvements are coming. And so what you have there is you've got an extension of the northbound right turn lane, so think like right near Lowe's, that right turn lane is being extended already, that's something that's happening already, excuse me, um, and the westbound left turn lane from Campbell on to Farm Life is already being extended based on the first project. In addition to that, this project would create an additional payment of $158,000 to the city for the city to try and address um, other traffic concerns related to this intersection. We believe that that money can be utilized to also help perhaps farm life traffic in general because we think that part of what the problem is at the intersection is because farm life has that very quirky two lane, one lane, two lane back and forth and that bridge that only has the one lane. So you're, you, know, you get points at which you get choked, you get constricted. I spoke to the vice mayor about him dropping his child off at, a, at the day school there at the daycare and I, rode, I drove it today to, to see what you're talking about. Yeah, it's one lane. If you try and stop the turn, everybody waits. Um, we think that with this money, um, the city can, can do some good. Folks love to talk about, you know, traffic problems. We, they exist in every community in South Florida. Yours is not unique in that respect. But when you get some money that can start addressing some of those problems, we would urge you and we would work with you and your city to try and see if you can put that money to good use, leverage it with the county and see what improvements can be made. But you're starting out at least with nearly $160,000 at a minimum to do so. Um, you know, the, the typical increases, I mean, obviously, since the property is being farmed today, it pays very little in taxes. It'll pay over $2 million in the future after it's been developed. Um, the uh, uh, estimated impact fees, again, almost $6 million to the various agencies, including, obviously, the city. And you can see some of the city figures there, whether it's parks or police or the Public Works Department, art in public places will we'll max out. Obviously, a project this large will we'll max out and give into, into, the, um, into the fund. They'll pay that amount of money. Um, and then look at that top number. I mean, when you talk about there being traffic issues, again, and I come back full circle, this is a property that has medium density land use and that already has R3 zoning. It's going to have development at some point. When this property gets developed, I hope it's this evening, I'd love for it to be this evening, I work really hard on this project, a lot of money's gonna come to Miami-Dade County for uh, road impact fees. That number up there, you know, is what the number is today, $2.8 million. I think this city can leverage along with the proportionate share mitigation agreement and talk to the county and try and come up with a holistic solution for farm life. We know there are issues there, but those issues are there today anyway. And they're going to be there when this property gets developed, no matter what. It's not going to be, you know, developed with three homes only. It's going to be developed with something substantial. We urge you to take this opportunity to do that at this point. Um, so again, um, a, lot of, a lot of different requests, um, but ultimately, as I just was stating and, and, and closing out, this is a property that does enjoy, you know, you have only resolutions before you tonight. You would have ordinances if we were rezoning or changing the land use. That's, that's you know, my quick way of remem remembering that this property has already gone through some vetting and some discussion. And in fact, it did, and it was approved six to one, looking at Councilman Roth, because I believe Councilman Roth might have been the one no vote uh, when it was rezoned. He keeps reminding me he was the no vote when it was rezoned. But it was rezoned at the end of the day. And that declaration of restrictions allowing for up to 398 units was passed. And this wasn't 04, this wasn't 06, this wasn't the last boom. This was four, four and a half years ago. I mean, folks were building back down here. I think that it was reasonable to expect a project such as this would. We think that with what this property, given its location, could 
um, be developed with, consistent with the land use and the zoning that it already has, the request that we're making this evening is a better fit for this community. It's a better fit from the standpoint of bringing in um, and continuing to expand your relationship with one of the nation's best home builders. It's a better fit for getting your hands on some much needed dollars to make improvements. It's a better fit because we've made improvements to the products. We've added the impact windows, the cement tile roofs. We're, we're going to work on the amenities. And we're going to do all of that um, because we, we want this to be a really good project. Um, we don't want you guys just to have to like get a project that has no variances and you have no choice but to approve it down the road. We think this is a better option. The photographs of real projects show it. Um, the commitment of this developer in the community shows it. And so we would urge you to um, obviously uh, accept and, and approve all of the requests this evening with the exception of tab 14, which we're happy to withdraw um, at this time. I'm going to be happy to answer any questions. I suspect I'll have some, even though I've spoken with many of you in the past. Uh, but again, I thank you all for your time, not just this evening, but throughout this process. I met with all of you before the July meeting when we thought we were moving forward, and then we met with all of you again before this meeting, and I thank you for your time. I know it's important. Um, uh, your, your time is very important to you. Uh, happy to answer any questions, Mayor. Thank you, and uh, I'll save some time for hey, rebuttal. If thank you, fun. Mr. Arza. Well, um, let's open the public hearing and see if there's anyone either online or in the audience who wishes to speak on this matter before we go to council questions and comments. Anyone online? Anyone in the audience? All right, so I don't see anyone. We'll close the public hearing and I'll open it up to whoever wants to kick off the conversation. Councilwoman Kirk Fostager. Yes, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Hugo, um, for the presentation. I think last um, month we had an, an amazing presentation about a development um, coming to our community that we can all, you know, get behind. It was something that we hadn't seen. Um, it was very attractive, and I feel that it added a lot of value to our community. And tonight, we had two top developers here who brought forth projects that were exciting with amenities that brings value to our community. And considering there is not a lot of developable land in Miami-Dade County, I think is very incumbent upon us to make sure whatever comes in our community to be developed, that it is the gold standard or the platinum standard. And what is before us tonight, respectfully, is not that. It is very cookie cutter, as you referenced earlier. It has, you know, run of the mill amenities, nothing exciting and attractive about this um, development. And I think it's very important that we kind of push back on that and we speak up and advocate for first class projects. And this just isn't it. You mentioned, and it really annoys me when developers say, oh, well, we can build this. Stop calling our bluff, build it. That's what you wanna do, build it. But if we're going to give you variances, you gotta step up to the plate. You have to level up. And here, you haven't leveled up. And um, for, D.R. Horton to be one of the nation's top home builders, D.R. Horton has not been a, a community partner. And in the presentations earlier, and that was a perfect segue to this, you saw that commitment to our community and not just coming here, throwing up these developments and walking away and leaving, but establishing a footprint with our nonprofits, with our community. And since D.R. Horton has been here, D.R. Horton has not done that. Very disappointing. You mentioned that it's not increased in density. Okay, technically it's not increased in density, but you are increasing cars, you are increasing traffic, and I know you had all those glossy numbers about you know, the impact fees, but the impact that it is going to have on a community, and I will continue to say this, what they feel, they feel that traffic. They may not feel that money going to the police department or the money going to the parks. They feel that traffic. They feel the stress on our infrastructure every single day. And as long as I sit here, I'm gonna speak that truth to power and I'm gonna hold everyone accountable for bringing us something top tier. If it's going to be developed as you reference it, you better make sure that it is platinum status. And right now, it is not that. And I'll rest there. Thank you, Vice Mayor. All right, former Vice Mayor. I've, I've, I've got to get out of the habit of, <laughs> of referring to you as Vice Mayor. 
Thank you. Okay. Um, who's next? Councilman Fletcher. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, I want to echo my colleagues' uh, sentiments there. Uh, we had the discussion earlier, uh, Mr. Arza, you know, the, the, the bland architecture, square box, brown, gray, gray off-white, 12 feet apart from each other uh, in the single-family homes just doesn't meet the standard that I think the city of Homestead needs to demand. As she stated, we had two great companies here this evening wanting to give us a great opportunity and they're giving us all kinds of things to try and make this happen a month ago we had another opportunity that came before us and gave us a great park space uh, the cookie well I'm not gonna say it I told you I wouldn't say it so um, my main concern again here is 162 Avenue uh, we have to look at it from the city standpoint on what we're going to do with that roadway. Uh, again, the bridge itself is a single lane or two lane. We got to look at seeing what it's going to take to, to make a, a extension there so we can get a four lane traffic going on that, that parcel. Uh, I can tell you those bridges are a couple million dollars. I just installed one out, out at FPL, so uh, they're not cheap. And then it's about a million dollars a mile for uh, new road construction. So we, we, there's a lot of money there. You know, I, I know you're offering you know, the county impact fees are 2.1 or 2.9, I couldn't quite remember, um, plus the extra money. It's not enough to finish that roadway. We need to go after that infrastructure money in order to make that happen. Um, I would give the project a D minus at its current state. Um, let's look at something different in the future for Homestead. That's it, I can't support it at this time. Thank you, Councilman Fletcher. Councilwoman Avila. Thank you, Mayor. So I have a different perspective on the project itself, but I do agree that our standards are higher now, and I expressed that to you um, in conversation before. Um, I definitely want to see um, less cluster home building. However, I do think that this particular project is an upgrade for the area itself. I think that that area is dense in landlords and in tenants. Um, and what I think that this particular property can use is um, added home ownership, business owners, and family-sized consumers that are going to feed into our downtown area. And that's what our greater downtown area needs. They need that disposable income. Um, it's, it's the start of east side amenities moving over to the west side. And so I, that's my perspective and that's what I see. And, and I'm okay with the concession of allowing the variances to go from apartments to single families and townhomes if that trend is going to push the density to our downtown where we need it and bring more estate housing to the west side. I'm sorry, to the east side. So... I'm, I'm open to hear the rest of my colleagues, but I'm in the position to support the project for those reasons. Um, I think that the recreational space that you've provided in your project is different. I don't have open wide space in, in Malibu Bay to play a, a game of soccer with my kids. Um, I think that the dedication of 10% of that land uh, is, is something that should be accounted for and reminded, the, the impact windows, the garage. I don't think that the variances being requested are out of this world. Um, I do think that the standards could be higher. How you fit that in, I mean, that's your job as developers and designers to bring the product to us, but I don't want to lose sight of what we would be getting and what this area sorely needs. And, and having done multiple ride-alongs with our police department, our amazing police department, who frequently go through this area, it needs an infusion of quality. Um, I'm, not, I'm not speaking to, um, I'm not saying that our residents in the area um, are, aren't valuable, and, but the area does need improvement. And I think that this product does improve the area. It's not perfect. I don't think it's D minus, <laughs> but, but it's definitely uh, better than apartments for sure. So I'll rest there, thank you. Councilwoman Bailey. Thank you, Mayor. I agree that the standards could be higher. I also appreciate it getting a little closer to the west side of town. It's one of the first things I looked at when I saw the map. Um, 
And although I'm not, I wouldn't like to live in townhomes, I do realize that there is a need for it. And you were, I think, probably one of the first ones that said, you know, in, in considering these variances, and this is some prior project, you know, think of the elderly who don't want all that yard to m maintain. So that's what I threw right back at you and said, think of the elderly with the shutters that they're going to have to put up on that really nicely organized uh, new garage. So that is what I try to balance when these variances come before us. Is this going to be a product that you know, you take away three feet from the front setback or what have you, and we're providing something that would otherwise not be there. So some of these variances I am a lot more okay with than others. Obviously the outside storage, I do not have an issue with anymore. Um, I have one question for staff. Um, I've recent, my sister recently moved to Isles of Oasis, so I've been spending a lot of time there. There are no patios in her townhome. Is that something that might have been a variance? Yes, it, it may have been a variance from, from years past when those got approved, but because we have a, we have a patio requirement. And they create their own zoning yeah. as you go through the process. So every plan unit development, it's kind of a three-phase thing where they, they don't conform necessarily to the existing zoning code, but they create their own master plan and their own zoning uh, at that time. And so whatever is important uh, to the applicant and then goes through the staff and the council gets approved. And so it may, if it's a PUD, it may not have been a variance because it may not have been required. So there's another one that I really don't have an issue with. One of the things when looking at the elevations that I do have an issue with are the balconies being right next to each other. You know, for patios and backyards, you have a slab or you don't, you know, you can put in grass or landscaping. But to have a balcony where you're sitting right next to your neighbor, for me, that feels very uncomfortable. So I would probably rather see you skip a balcony and offer a little bit of privacy or be able to put some type of privacy wall, a little piece that jags out and adds some character to the building. Um, for me, that part was was pretty uncomfortable. I wouldn't want to sit out there. Um, and obviously South Florida, you want to sit outside and see the sunset and all that good stuff uh, through your impact windows. But um, the splash pad, we, our city desperately needs that. I think that was a wonderful addition. Um, I like the jagged connection between the two sides. And then the other part that I don't have such a big issue with is issuing variances when you could have easily put in more townhomes around the border or considered a little bit of a smaller single family home. Uh, for me, that is a pretty even give or take. Um, and again, being able to offer whoever's buying in there what type of home they would like to purchase. Um, I don't have an issue. I don't have an issue with that. Um, as far as the money going to the county for the roads, that is astronomical and we really <laughs> need to push for them to contribute that portion to Homestead. How is that not even a thing? Um, if, that part still is, I'm trying to wrap my head around because uh, Today was the first time that that number just really sank in, and I thought the city's getting that and the county's getting that. That's <laughs> um, my other request, if this goes through, is to consider doing more toward those road improvements so that traffic is alleviated towards, I'm sorry. towards improving farm life to make traffic a little. Um, I don't know what that answer is, um, I don't know what that total could be. But if we could pitch in a little more and just really push the county to help alleviate that, um, I think that this project especially would give us the upper hand in speaking to the county and having them do a better job with helping us uh, make that as uh, for, for Lane. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Councilman Ross, you've got your finger on the trigger. Uh, thank you, Mayor. <laughs> yeah, I just... Um, I too am a little dumbfounded at the uh, 2.7 million dollar impact fees to the county, and I had a conversation earlier today with Julio Brea, um, 
and was surprised that they he actually knew the answer to this question. And uh, if we were to improve all of uh, farm life from Campbell to uh, North Canal, we're looking at approximately $4 million, including the canal work. So that $2.7 million that the developer is paying to, to develop in our city, making that payment to the county uh, would certainly go a long way in approving north and southbound traffic through one of the, one of the roads that's becoming one of the main arteries uh, through that part of the city. So um, I don't know, Julio, if, if, if you're uh, able to speak on this, but is there a way for us to lobby the county for this impact fee that's designated for a city of Homestead Road? at $2.7 million? Well, there, there's always uh, an opportunity to try to get some money from them, but in, in essence, that money is regionally spent. We don't, the cities don't see where the money actually is being spent on. The way the county looks at it, they break up the county into different districts and each, that fund goes into that district to be used. Now, yes, can we ask for them to use the money on our city or within a, a reasonable distance of our city? We can do that, but they like to use that money on county roads, and this is not a county road. It's a city road, so more than likely they wouldn't. Uh, I'm just speaking off of just from history, uh, from what I've seen them do in the past. They would not transfer that money over to a city street when they could use it on county roadways that, they, that they're that they responsible for. It just doesn't seem fair, and I would assume everyone up here agrees with that process. However, if that is the process, that's the process. Um, the, the, other, the only other comment I have is, you know, when, 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 as you pointed out, I made the decision back in 2017 not to um, go along with granting the highest and most dense um, zoning we could have given to the property owner back then. Um, we could have done something different, but that wasn't the case. So now the property, for the most part, is entitled. Is that correct? Joe, is that correct? The property is entitled now, right, to to that many units. So potentially the, that that property owner has 398 units that can be developed on that property. Is that, that's right. So so it's no longer a a issue of are we allowing X amount of properties to be built on this vacant land, it's what kind of product do we want there now? The quality of product, what, what is it that we really want there? And, you know, I don't, I don't know what the answer is to that. Um, if, if this is denied tonight and they go back to the developer and say, listen, the city doesn't want less built on that property because if you come here and you proffer up everything with no variances, you're going to get nearly 400 units versus 375 units. So, uh, or maybe potentially 350 units, depending on the next developer that comes along. So there is a, a slight risk in denying the, the variances in order to get a different product. And I'll let that be my final comment because that's basically what we're dealing with tonight is do we want some single family and townhouses or do we want townhouses and apartments? Because that's what they could do without a single variance. Similar to the Maria project down the street where we had to begin to understand that the variances weren't 
necessarily bad for the area because by granting those variances, they got a, a better quality product. They got single family homes at Maria Estates versus potentially uh, townhomes only. So it's something to consider. The density um, that is allowed there today versus um, this project or the next project that may come our way. So eventually something will be developed. Unfortunately, the max is 398. They're proffering up 370 something. So 377. So um, I think that's kind of the thought process I have is, you know, do you want 25 more units there? Or do you not want 25 more units there? Or maybe we take out another 10 units out of the project. I, I don't know what the answer is, but that's just what I'm thinking right now. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilman Roth. Vice Mayor? Current Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, I, um, as per some of our conversations, I've had issues with traffic in that area. Uh, you mentioned the story about me dropping off my son to school and traffic backs up. So it would be great to see if there was four lanes on both sides, you know, then, that's, then it's more acceptable. But there isn't four lanes on both sides. Uh, and it'd also be great to see that you've, you've flipped the ratio of single family versus townhouses and townhouses a single family. Uh, would your client consider reducing the number of townhomes and increasing the number of single fam? That's one question. And um, what, can there be other concessions made in terms of part of the dedication become a road on, for the length of the project on Maori. So I think that would help mitigate you know, traffic going to Maori, even though there is a traffic light that's going to soon be at Maori. So those are the two questions I had for you. Okay, I didn't know if you wanted to go mayor. Um, so um, I'll have to turn and consult with my client to see what options we have to reduce. I'm sure that Ms. Lopez is shooting daggers at me right now because when it goes into um, changing up the number of units, it calls into question the site plan you have before you and what you can do. I mean, I, I think there's a way we can do that this evening. It's important for us to try and do something this evening. Um, on the second question, we've look, actually looked into it in more detail in terms of having like dedicated turn lanes because of the land that we dedicate. Um, we could do that. We, we have the room, we confirm with our engineers, we have the room to provide for dedicated turn lanes. When we looked at the value or benefit of those dedicated turn lanes, meaning that those would only be used then by the folks that were just coming into our property as opposed to through traffic and all of it, it didn't seem to be worth it. I mean, that you know, the money that we can proffer or that you're getting for proportionate share, um, and to speak to the councilwoman's point, she seemed to allude to like, you know, maybe there's and, and maybe we can we can add some some additional dollars and try and leverage those dollars, and I think my client would be willing to do that. Um, I don't know that the bang for the buck would be there just to create turn lanes for our project as much as maybe getting that money. And again, this is our traffic engineers telling us you're gonna gain a little bit of the traffic that's coming into your project. You're not really gonna benefit as much as trying to use that money to see if you can't do some larger scale changes. Um, to the larger scale changes, my, my colleague, uh, Pedro Gassant reminds me, um, the county, uh, one of your county commissioners, Commissioner McGee, is actually sponsoring legis legislation at the BCC to provide for impact fees to be spent within a radius of the project that generates those fees. I would urge all of you, I think you'd appreciate having some support. I think municipalities need to get behind stuff like that. I and mean, we're aware of it because we practice in multiple jurisdictions, but um, that could be the kind of thing where that, I know, that number, well, a lot of you said, that's a huge number. Um, you know, if you knew that it was gonna be spent within half a mile or a quarter mile, away, you know, you might all feel more comfortable, like, hey, I, we're gonna get immediate effect. Right now, I think it's like three benefit districts, is that right? Yeah, it's three benefit districts in the county, and you guys are in the south one. I think the south one starts on like 200th Street. So this money, we understand, could go anywhere from 200th Street south. It may not benefit anywhere near this particular project. So, um, you know, I, I just think coming up with a collective solution to traffic on farm life is better, and maybe utilizing the resources that we have is better than just a turn lane for our project that'll just help 
our residents and nobody else because they're the only ones that are going to be turning in. Maybe they'll get into our property a little quicker, but everybody else is still stuck in the same line kind of thing. Um, but we could, we could use the dollars that we have. We could use them towards that instead of maybe providing for something more, uh, a more holistic effort to try and fix because farm life is broken, but it's been broken for as long as I've been practicing down here because it's been that one lane, you know, and a lot of projects have come in and I don't think it falls to just this one project to be the one responsible for fixing farm life because it's not, I mean, these the folks on this property aren't even there yet and it's already a problem. So clearly there are, you know, this is a problem that already exists. Maybe we can use the dollars to do that, but I will get back to you. I am going to take a second and, and speak with my client to see what options we might have and then I'm going to dare talk to your city attorney and uh and your zoning folks to see if it's something we can do um to do that so i'll rest there mayor. yeah thank you vice mayor council woman thank you mayor before you go to ask that question can you confirm the timeline for construction like when will we start to see the impact is it 2022 20 when would you start to see the construction or when would you start to see Both. residents living there all the above Back to the microphone. I forgot. I don't know. Well, I'll just speak into this one. Um, it, site work would start in March of 2022. If we were successful this evening, uh, DR has to finish closing on the property, and obviously there's permits and lots of things they got to get. Site work can take up to a year, and then construction would start in early 23, and homes would be, you know, with, with new residents. Uh, it sounds like the third quarter. Is that about right? Third quarter of 23? Yeah, third quarter, August, September of. 23. So I guess about a year and a half, a year, nine months from now. And when do you pay those impact fees? To when the you county? pull building permits. So as you pull permits, you pay impact fees. So you'll be pr pulling those permits before the site work or that's part no, of No, no. I, I think they only get charged with building vertical permits, correct? Yeah, they, they only get charged. So, so it'll be towards the end of next year. Okay. I mean, you know, what would be. I appreciate that. So uh, fall of 2023, and that traffic light, do we know, um, question for Julio, do you know when the traffic light's gonna get put in? I know you know. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's gonna say. On this, okay. It's on this year's So budget. hopefully 2022, well, that traffic light will be functioning and in place. Um, you know, as much as I would love to see, um, you know, grandiose development, as, I, as we've all kind of expressed or we've all expressed our, our, our standard is, is our bar for standard is going up right? right we have to keep in mind the feasibility of there is a such thing as overbuilding a community and we, when you have an overdevelopment in terms of quality for example if we put properties that are five hundred seven hundred thousand dollars in value in this little pocket in the middle of that subsection of homestead will it appraise Will there actually be buyers that can get the financing for the property? The answer is no. You won't be able to sell those types of units. So we're going to be asking for something that is feasibly not an option. And so being realistic, although this is not a community that I personally would buy in and live in, not because I don't like B.R. Horton's product, but because my family size would require something different, it is suitable and an upgrade for that area. So, um, and, and on top of that, we have until fall of 2023 for maybe Julio to get us some county dollars to fix, <laughs> to fix the, the traffic problem there. Um, so, I'd like to hear those answers to those yeah, questions. Yeah, no. I'll rest. Thank you. Um, we, we agree. I mean, obviously, you're in a unique position. I know you um, are in the industry and in mortgages, and so you understand affordability and how to qualify folks for homes. I mean, I will give you one statistic from a, you know, from, from a presentation, from a statistic that I got that, that we talked about this morning at the county. Um, home prices in Dade County went up by $133,000 last year. One year, the median home price increased by $133,000. It wasn't that long ago that you could buy a home for $133,000. Now, the median price is going up by that amount in a year. It's at half a million dollars today it's affordability to some extent too and so yeah i mean we can we can and, and you know we can see if we can do some more single family homes and, and, and some fewer townhomes but the townhomes do cost a little less and for entry level buyer that first home as i liked and i said to some of you you know i, I mean i wish that the first place that i lived in looked like any of these because it didn't 
It didn't. I mean, I'm just I'm being honest. Um, and so, you know, you've got to just realize what, what that is. I mean, I, I think we can make it better and, and hopefully, whether it's the impact windows or the changes we made to some of the architecture, maybe we haven't gone as far as uh, the councilwoman would like and a couple of you would like and, and I appreciate that and I look, hopefully I can try and ask some questions about what, if anything, we can do to try and make this better. Um, but we are taking steps in that direction and we think whether it's impact windows, whether it's nice amenitized community, whether it's a linear park, it's, it's about community, not just about the home. Um, we showed you the pictures of the homes inside so that you would see what people are going to spend most of their time looking at, right? You're not going to be outside looking at it. You're going to be looking inside. So hopefully on the balance, all of that um, plays out. But the cost and affordability of homes is it's a huge issue. And, and it's, it's an issue for everybody. It's an issue for any of you who might have a family member trying to buy a house or for any of you, you know. It's, it's, I mean, that's staggering to me that it went up by $133,000 in one year. I mean, that's a staggering figure. Um, but, you know, and it doesn't seem like it's abating. And uh, so I, I mentioned that. I think you had a follow-up, Councilwoman. I saw you kind of. I just wanted clarification on the en entrance and exits. How many are there? There are two on Maori and one on uh, Farm Life. So the majority so if, of the flow I, will go on Maori. Yeah, I'm in a few. Okay. I don't know if this is still activated for me, but I can just pull the site plan quickly. If you had a question, it does not look like I'm. Well, yeah, there's two on. Go back. Ah, here we go. Right, we'll There's 1,055 units in my community, and we have one entrance and exit. So three for 277 or 377. So that's one on Farm Life and two on Maori. You okay. See. No, thank you. Yeah. Councilwoman. Thank you. So a couple of things. I respect, you know, the perspectives of everyone. And I think we make decisions up here filtered through our perspectives. So for me, I'm having a hard time reconciling why would this project be good for this area? Because I feel if the project isn't good for the east, it shouldn't be good for the west. That gives me a little indigestion because there's a level playing field. Even if we put a commercial component to this, this wouldn't be good for that city hall site. So why is it good for here? And I think about those that live at Monterey Point. I think about those that live in the Sea Grape community. And to them, this is not adding any value to their community. I recognize that you can build apartments there, but in my heart of hearts, no one's gonna build apartments there. They're not gonna do it. So to dangle that carrot, oh, but I can build this. No one's gonna do that, my friends. I recognize that you're entitled to develop something, but I'm not gonna settle. I'm not going to settle. And I love you, Hugo, but I'm not settling. <laughs> I'm I not. It, I don't take it personally. And I think we have to push back. You have to do more. Why do we have to give you a variance of going from 7,500 square feet to 5,000 square feet? And I asked that because it made more financial sense to you. I didn't ask you that, I asked your team that. Because it made more financial sense to you, to DR Horton. But what makes more sense for our community? So if you're entitled to build it, build it at 7,500 square feet so that we don't have to give you that variance. So I'm trying to determine, you know my motto, is to what? Meet where? In the middle. What can you all do to A, bring a better product that would be good for the East and the West? Now the whole mortgage and affordability, that's not my shop. So I'm not even going to go there. I am here advocating for Monterey Point, for Coco Walk or the Boardwalk, for those communities who this is adding no value. And I want to be able to go to them and say, listen, we can rally around this because this. And if I don't feel comfortable or it's not good enough for me and my daughter and my husband to go over there, I'm not gonna support it for anybody going over there. That's just how I am. So how can we bring a better product and how can DR Horton be a better corporate citizen? 
because I told you they're doing nothing. How can you be a better corporate citizen? So the elevations, they need to be reworked. The amenities, the splash pad is cute, but you need to do more. So what can DR Horton do moving forward to make this a better project? I mean, the, the only thing I'll comment, I, I wanna, I'll turn around and talk to my client in a second. Um, I hope I didn't, I know you mentioned something about if this is good enough for the East or the West. I hope I didn't say anything. Oh, okay, I, I didn't, sorry, I lost, you know, I'm, I mean, I think it's a great project anywhere in your city, I'd be happy to present it, but um, I will talk to my client and see what options, I mean, whether it's in the amenity sphere, whether it's in the size of the single family home lots, um, you know, maybe there's something that we can do about that. Again, I'd like to confer with your city attorney and see what options we have to be able to do this. We're under a strict contractual obligation to move forward. Some of the delays were not our fault at all. We were ready to move before you in July and August and we couldn't get the school board on board uh, to get us the proportionate share we ended up not needing. It happens. And then in September, we started hearing some concerns, but it could have been that you know, we heard these concerns in July and could have been done three months ago. Unfortunately, we do have to move for forward on this property um, by, you know, early to middle of next month before your next meeting. So, um, Mayor, I know you haven't spoken. I'd like, obviously, I know you saved for last, and I'm uh, keenly waiting for your comments. I didn't get to meet with you this time in person. I met with you like three months ago with this in person. I didn't get to meet with you this time in person. I did get messages of what, what you said. I suspect yeah, I'm, I'm sure hear. you did. Um, I um, but, um, but maybe when, once that occurs, I, I indulge you in a two minute um, request for me to turn around and speak to my client and the city attorney. I know it's a super long night, mm -hmm. but you know, if we're gonna have a chance to maybe get out of here with something that's a win-win for everyone, I just would, you know, it's a big project. It's a big project. It's every bit as many units and traffic and you know, money impact to your city is the stuff you heard earlier today and, and we respect that. So that's the only thing I would ask at, at the end of your comments, which I, I mean, Appreciate that, but, but really quick, we need to divert, and we need to vote to extend the oh. meeting for another hour. We have a move by Councilwoman Bailey, seconded by the Vice Mayor. All in favor of a one-hour extension until 1130? Uh, any opposed? Okay. All right. Um, and, and maybe, maybe, maybe you want to bring out your calendars and write this down, because <laughs> I'm going to start with the words, I agree with Council Woman Fair Paul Staggers. <laughs> okay. What's that? 1029 on November oh, yeah. 17th. Okay. Is that you want me to? And, it, and what I'm talking about is we're talking about the product and the product mix. And you know, I've had a lot of conversations where, you know, Council Woman talked about filtering through our own perspective. And my perspective is, is we are flush in this community with townhouses. If I had my druthers, there would be no more townhouses approved east of US-1. Now, is that financial and logistical reality? No, but that's, that's my right. filter. Um, I would love to see more single family, but, but to the councilwoman's point, I, have, I too have a problem with the product. And to, to borrow a phrase that your newly registered lobbyist used to use a lot with me and up here, bring your A game. And no disrespect, but I personally find the appearance of the product uninspiring. And it's, for my money, it's not even the B game, it's the C game. And if, if the majority of this council is going to approve this project with these kind of variances, it needs to look and feel a lot different and a lot better. But in the bigger scheme of things, you know, I was almost burned at the stake last month for approving 231 units that brought something to the table that we've never, never seen before. And again, to borrow some of the conversation we had on our city hall conversation, people don't really care about density, the, the word density, they care about how many units. They don't care if it's six units or nine units or 10 units. It's like they approved another 377 and there's no road work done and, and traffic done. You know, so I've, I've kind of got to respond and, and respect that. Um, you know, and I would invite you to drive up and down Mowry Street from City Hall to Farm Life on any given weekday from three o'clock to six o'clock 
and see that that is a failing road. And for me, the approval of this project at this time, while philosophically, I think is a, for, for my taste, a subpar product. I understand that we're not going to build $800,000 neighborhoods down the street from, from subsidized projects. I, I get that. But to echo what someone said, if we're going to be even consider these kind of variances, it needs to look better and feel better and be a little bit smaller, a little bit lower in the sheer number of units. And I don't know what that number is. Um, also, one thought I had, and I'll ask the attorneys to chime in, and, and you know, let's say hypothetically, well, not hypothetically speaking, one of the biggest complaints that I've received over the last several months is the failure of timely garbage and bulk waste service. And every one of these subdivisions further burdens our, our crews. We all know that additional crews and additional trucks aren't given away down, down the street. They're very, very expensive. So and I'll ask Mr. Pearl to kind of chime in here. If this were approved, and if at some point pending their final plat, we adopted a, an amendment to the existing ordinance that provided that new subdivisions in a geographical area must provide for privatized garbage service so that we can maintain the level of service that we have now. Um, would that need to be built in or is, is there a waypoint in the future that if we were to amend the ordinance to provide for that, that it would encumber or burden an initial approval that was, let's say, given tonight? I mean, what, how would that fit together? Um, so I, I know you had reached out and, and asked whether or not this was something that we could impose and just for the benefit of the council, um, currently the code requires that all, um, residential units receive their, their sanitation service through the city and there, there isn't an exemption for, for any residential properties for any reason. If we wanted to open up the market. It's it's more com it's a little bit complicated because you would also I presume if you open this up to private vendors be looking to implement some sort of franchise fee for the vendors who are going to be operating within the territory. Well, with, without getting into the nuts and bolts of it, I'm just kind of <laughs> thinking a way to not further burden our system, not send the message that we're reducing would be reducing our, our footprint that, that what we're obligated to do now we would continue to service, but that we're potentially, you know, larger subdivisions in a general geographic area may in the future be required to contract for private services. Uh, the concern I would have with opposing it on a, an applicant that we, uh, approvals that you gave tonight is that you'd be imposing a retroactive application to the, on the obligation because we don't have that ordinance before us mandating those requirements as to, for, for new subdivisions. That, no, does, but, that doesn't currently exist. But if this were, if that, let's say we had, just hypothetically speaking, if we adopted that amendment prior to final plat approval. I, I honestly, Mayor, I'd have to look because I don't want to, to promise you that I, we could enforce it at that stage. I, I would have to do a little bit of research. Okay, because just, you know, for the benefit sure. of council, I'm kind of thinking how, how can we get creative about not stretching our services and be able to, you know, new people have no expectation of city sanitation services. You know, they, they move in and they know that, you know, XYZ provider is their garbage man and we're not taking anything away from, from our crews. Uh, just, you know, kind of trying to think ahead to, to how we're going to address those as this and other developments come come forward. Well, if, if you'd like us to look into what options are available to us in the future, I'm, I'm happy to do that. I just, on the fly, I don't want to over-promise you something that I, I'm not sure we'll be able to deliver. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Arger, do you have a response to, I think, the councilwoman's, probably a couple different council members' questions. Um, 
I didn't think that I owe anyone an answer. I, 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 think, I think what the product oh, mix. Oh, no, no, no. The product I, mix. I'm, no, I don't yet have a firm answer, a final answer, because I want to talk to your city attorneys. That's why I, I want to ask them what we can or can't do. Um, so I, I'm sorry. I was listening to, to Matt's answer to the, to the uh, question. But like I said, when you finish, if you'll indulge me for a couple of minutes, I want to have – I want to have – because. It, Candidly, I mean, obviously certain changes that we could propose doing this evening can be conditions to an approval this evening. Others, I think, but I do want to have this conversation, which I guess we can just have publicly um, based on prior conversations um, with your city attorney. If, for instance, we were to remove a variance that impacts sizes of lots, it renders, to use a legal term you'd appreciate, your site plan uh, void ab initio, right? Like now all of a sudden you couldn't approve it because I'd be telling you I'm going to do a different configuration than the site plan and the plot that you have. And in the past we've been told, and Matt's shaking his head, saying yes, that unfortunately, much as I would love to say, we'll, you know, we'll get rid of this, we'll make the lots a little bit bigger, we couldn't do that tonight. Like I wouldn't be able to do that tonight and we have some constraints and pressures. But um, Perhaps there are other things that we can do where maybe we eliminate a section. So maybe not as pretty, but if maybe we eliminate, and that's what I want to talk to my client about, and maybe we do bring down density a little bit by eliminating a section that isn't redistributing all of the geometry. Because if we redistribute, redistribute the geometry across the board, we, we, can't, we can't get approved tonight. And if we can't get approved tonight, they're not going to get another extension and we're not going to do anything. The other thought that I had um, talking to my client is, um, I mean, we, we could... Um, agree, I don't know how we condition this, but we could agree that we'll um, resubmit all of the elevations for administrative review. They review elevations all the time anyway um, because people change up elevations, so, so the council can approve a set of elevations and then within certain parameters, staff can review them administratively. We could offer for aesthetic and design purposes, although I'm not sure that I got clear, clear direction. I mean, obviously, I heard the balcony comment. Uh, I've heard general comments about not being, I mean, I'd love to get maybe more specific. I'd like to see this or that because maybe we could agree, listen, we'll, we'll commit to going to staff and we've got some lead time with site work and other things. We'll, we'll improve these, these renderings, um, these elevations, and we'll, we'll, we'll build a nicer product. Let's, let's call it like it is. That might be something. The final element that I did talk to my client about, and again, money doesn't solve every ill and you're not going to be able to leverage every last dollar. But, you know, in totality, we're offering about 183000 I'm not good at math. That's why I'm a lawyer. But between the two pro proportionate share mitigation agreements, um, as this council has done in previous times, you know, maybe we can add some additional dollars that can be utilized at the city's discretion for traffic in the area. That one isn't an impact fee that the county gets to keep and control and you're, you know, you're going in hat in hand and hoping they'll use. Um, but, you know, I... I worked on a project a couple of years back and many of you were sitting up there and that project made an additional payment and it was kept there because it was made in connection with that project and I think we would be happy to, like I said, we're at like 183. My client has said that we can um, go up to 300,000. So 183 we'd have to do anyway, that's the proportionate share, but we would add another 100 and whatever to, to get it up to a round number of 300,000. Again, that would be 100 and something thousand dollars additional for the city to maybe go to give to Julio to go talk to the county and, and maybe leverage those dollars. Things that allow us to get out of here tonight um, are all on the table. I think, you know, we're not, if the city attorney confirms, and I think he has by nodding in the affirmative, that if we change lot lines, um, we can't get approved tonight, uh, you know, we're not going to get more time. So we're really going to do this for no reason. We'll, we'll, I'll tell you I'm going to do it and kind of come back next month, and I'm not because I'm not going to, I don't think I'm going to have the time to do that. So. Um, but I do want to have one last conversation with my client regarding if we can remove any section, perhaps of townhomes or something like that, and maybe we can, you know, that'll add green space, and then maybe we just reduce the density that way. And I would respectfully offer to the city attorney and to, to Joe and Michelle and David. If, if that we could have a special call on December 2nd, would that help you at all with your contract timelines? I mean, we... I mean, we, we, you're, you have passed the summer second, right? Yeah, so, I mean, we could, Mayor. I mean, if... if so if we can get a quorum on December. I know December 1st is touchy. We've already had that conversation. Right. That's all Manavilo is But thir Thursday, hey, if, if that's solved... And I, I, look, I'm reading between the lines and hearing that you've got a contract 
situation. Situation. You're a, you're a, you're yeah. a real estate attorney. The, I think the, you know what those are. It's going to be a real problem if it goes to December 15th. Right. Is, does December 2nd solve your problem? That problem is solved by December 2nd. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so our, you don't debt, yet have that problem. Yeah, we would not have that if we, you know, an approval on December 2nd would be inside of our contract period. So yes, that would solve that problem. If it allowed us to speak. Now, candidly, and again, they're going to confer, again, I mean, how quickly they could evaluate or review or revise site plan if we agreed to something or elevations, I mean, um, versus considering some sort of approval if it's the wish of this council that allows us to seek some of those changes through a different avenue like the administrative process. You know, I mean, I guess those are the two sort of options. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm open to either one, and I think that we'd like to not lose the opportunity to develop this property, but, you know. Go ahead, Councilman. Council. Sorry. Yeah. No, 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 you're fine. No, no. Mayor? Yes, Mr. White. <laughs> James from the... Uh... I, I, I've been listening. listening. Um, if I could chime in for just a moment, which may help facilitate moving this along. Um, we are not going to be able to make major substantive changes to lot lines uh, with respect to moving pieces on the puzzle around this evening uh, on the site plan or the key plan. Those changes will need to come back to you in a revised format. We can, uh, we, we could make some conditions that uh, deal specifically with some of the plans list, the elevations, um, specifically the one model that Mr. Arza referenced in the beginning of his presentation that was the subject of and necessitated the variance request for the front yard setback that he's no longer seeking. So that's something that we could work with um, that, you know, I think a simple condition to that effect would be enough for them to administratively come back to staff and work on those elevations. But um, yeah, I mean, trying to now move around density, get rid of density, um, switch around the configuration, all of that's something that we're not going to be able to do tonight on the fly. Thank you, Mr. White. All right. well, that's what I said. So I, I, I suspected, and I didn't realize James was listening in. I kept turning to Matt, but I knew it was James that I'd had that conversation with on many occasions. Um, one of the things, you know, Mayor, one of the easiest, and, and Council, one of the easiest locations at which it might make sense for us to lose some units, and I'm sure James will chime in, but I think we can do this, um, because we could honestly leave the platted lots and just not build, and, and the condition could be that you don't build it, is you have... If I have, um, it's up on your screen. There is a row of townhomes just north of our clubhouse and our park. So in that central boulevard, we've got one more row. It has an 11 next to it. Can you all see that? That is six townhomes. We would remove those. I won't touch lot lines. I'll just, I'll plat it that way. If you want me to plat six empty lots and we'll put a condition that we can't build them. And some HOA will own six platted lots rather than one recreational tract. I mean, that's, that's a distinction that doesn't matter for anyone, except that it does, I think, matter to this council that you would get the double bonus of six fewer units and now truly all the way up to the top, connecting the dog park, the tot lot, the, the park area would increase. Um, you were doing, Carl, how big is that area? I know you were just scribbling numbers. Give me one second. Um, that the removal of those six, um, that number 11, six townhome building would be about an additional 17,000 square feet of open space. So that's almost another half an acre. Um, and I think just geometrically would provide for the entire central boulevard to be from north to south recreational amenity. Um, you know, it obviously is a reduction in impacts, reduction in density. I don't think your staff has to evaluate. I mean, it's fewer cars, it's fewer everything. But, um, we could, to avoid site planning and T plat issues, we could simply say, we'll plat them. Like what you have before you will plat, just place a condition that the building immediately to the north 
of the recreational area containing six units, and we can identify it, shall not be built, no permit shall be issued for that building. We would accept the condition like that, and you would have our word that we would have six fewer units on this project. Um, I already made the, I was reminded to, to make the, again, the comment about adding some dollars, um, up to $300,000, so adding, adding some additional dollars. And then I think to, to James' suggestion, we would um, happily accept the condition to improve elevations. Perhaps we could meet with you, Councilwoman. I mean, I'd love to see, um, but we know we can do that over the next couple of months, three, four months. We gotta do site work. I mean, if we know we're gonna get to build our project, we have a lot more flexibility and less time constraint because we can start site work and we can close on the property. And Again, it. if I could speak to that issue, I think um, if we're going, going to do that, we're gonna have to see a legal instrument that's declaration of restricted covenants that needs to be part of and made uh, as an exhibit to the site plan. So there are lots of moving parts here that need to consider. And if these are all things that Mr. Arza and his client are willing to do, then I think the best course of action this evening, in my advice, would be to defer the item until the early December meeting and come back with a revised plan and revised documents that would be properly before you to address those instead of trying to uh, figure last new things out and miss something this evening. Because I think there are other issues that, that several other of the council members had concerns with. And I, I don't necessarily know that those are all addressed. I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure the council members will let me know if I'm not addressing their comments, James. I have no doubt that this body will uh, remind me if I'm not addressing any comments. To your other point, I mean, I'm asking the question of um, Mr. Cordino. I, I mean, I'm hearing that it might be. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Would you be able to review a revised plan if we got it to you? I mean, we would need some time to prepare it for them to review it and then to come back on December second. I'm not sure now. Before you answer that, if it's merely to come back to proffer a legal declaration of restrictive covenants that requires us to go back in for evaluation of elevations and that we commit to not building those six units and that we commit to the additional dollar amount and I guess we can put in the cement tile roof uh, and, the, and the impact windows. I mean, that's just between the lawyers. I mean, I, I'm confident that, you know, the lawyers can figure out how to draft a document quickly, but revising site plans and T-plots. I mean, unfortunately, that process just takes longer. I, I would offer up, we could do the latter. I, I think to change the site plans, we wouldn't be able to do it, but we could remove those six units, I think, through a declaration of restrictive covenants and just say, we're not gonna build them. It's a legal document or we'll attach to the land. I, I think that would give you guys security. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. So the question I had about increasing the number of single family homes would change the site plan, which you just said, it's basically impossible to do right now. Contractually, we would be unable to do so. Increasing the number of single family homes or <laughs> eliminating the size of, you know, or making the, the single family homes all larger. I mean, I asked my client, is that something we could do? We, we can't do it and still buy this property. So it's really a moot point, unfortunately. Based on some of the comments that I made earlier, there are residents out there that are been saying throughout the whole campaign, Overdevelopment, overdevelop. I mean, it was across the board. So the timing of this is is, is <laughs> definitely not not good, especially with the time constraints that you have. But there seems to be so many concessions that we're making. All of these moving parts again makes me feel uncomfortable the way it was presented. Right. You know, for those reasons, I can't support the project. Appreciate that, Vice Mayor. I think we just need to move forward as these items are presented tonight. Yeah, subject to, you know, if it's approved, uh, obviously we'll accept their proffer of additional dollars uh, as a condition. But at which one would that be appropriate to tack on to? Which item? Probably the site plan, right? The site plan. Uh, well, Mayor, I think it would definitely need to be a condition under the site plan. Um, and whether or not we memori memorialize that um, as part of the transportation crop share agreement, um, I don't know, but but I'd have to look at that. But 
it definitely it would be a condition for site plan approval. I mean, I think our intent would be for you to have more flexibility to use that money, and I think the proportionate share mitigation agreement, by definition, is referring to a failure that occurs somewhere. This project and dollars calculated with a formula to address a particular problem. I think if we just add it to that one, it'll in theory just say, well, there's more money to solve one issue. I'd like to try and see if you you all can't use that money to tackle any issue along farm life, not just the one on the intersection. For instance, it could be that you use that along with other dollars to widen another portion of, of farm life. I, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I think if we tie it to the prop share, that would be, I don't much care because the money gets, it's the same amount of money either way, but I would just suggest that maybe it makes more sense to have that just be a standalone contribution, not part of the prop share agreement. I don't know if James, you know, feels the same way, but that would be my only suggestion. Mayor. Thank you. Yes. Mayor. Uh, just, just real quick, uh, Hugo, would a deferment help you right now? Because it doesn't sound good. To the 2nd of December to try and address and see if we can't come up with a way in which we're not changing the site plan, but we can address some of these comments. You know, obviously I would take that over not, you know, over being done tonight because that we do have enough time. Um, Mayor, I'm going to make a motion to defer this to December 2nd. Second. Okay, now, Mr. Pearl, do we need to do that on a tab by tab basis? Um, I, I'm comfortable if we say we're going to, we're, we're doing everything, right? We're, we're going to defer tabs, I believe it was, I'm sorry. 30, right. Oh, sorry. 13 through 21, including tab 30. So there's 10 items associated with this project. Mr. Cordino sees himself reviewing plans over his turkey dinner. Um, uh, Joe, you don't have to. We're not. We're, no, we're, we're not going to submit um, any plans. plans. There'll be no plans okay, to review. So no, 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 no. Yeah, I don't. I don't think we're proposing any plans. Michelle just gave a hooray, and she's going to get to eat cornbread. <laughs> but um, uh, we we would just work on maybe a declaration of restrictive covenants with the city attorney. If you tell me when that deadline is, we'll work on that agreement to get it in time for you all to have it as part of your package for December second. Um, let me ask you, we've been talking about December 2nd. What's the latest possible date that we could have a special call? I believe the contract runs through the 15th, and I think you have a meeting. Right. That's Their closing date is the same day as your regularly scheduled meeting. Right. Your regularly scheduled meeting is the 15th, correct? Yeah. That's their closing date. Exactly. We, we can't close at 5 o'clock and show up here at 6 o'clock and hope to get an approval. So yeah, with, with sooner the than that, I mean, we yeah, can, but with the intervening holidays, it just may not be logistically possible second. to get everything done and circulated. So I, I guess that at some point, there'll have to be a request by either the department head or yourself for a special call to bring this forward sometime prior to the 15th. Yeah, the, the only concern I have is advertisement. We wouldn't want to have to re-advertise. I'd like to see if we can't set a specific date this evening, because otherwise we'd have to re-advertise. Yeah, I'm getting a lot of nods. I've been doing this long enough to know when they're going to nod. Um, would, the, so, would, would the 6th or 7th give us more breathing The Day room? of the Cow, Mayor, may cow. be the best. The Day of the Cow, I think, is the 7th? Cow's seventh, yeah. the 7th? Yeah. I believe so. Are we okay doing it prior? Are we okay? That gives the attorneys and our professionals more time. So we'll do it to the date certain of December 7th. Let's just waiting for the applicant to indicate that that works for them. Yeah, the 7th? It, it, does, it does. Sorry, I was just, yes, so our closing date would be. Councilman the Roth, you, you moved to defer to December 7th? Change the date to the 7th, yes. Okay. All right, and we had a, did we have a second? Second by Councilman Fletcher. All right, is there anything further from Council? Yes, Councilwoman. Thank you, Mayor. So real quick, we're going to include which conditions to be discussed and proffered? Uh, so I'll try, and, um, I'll try and summarize everything I've said, and if anybody in the, the you know, either you, any of you or, or the members of or your staff remember differently, um, impact windows throughout the entire project, a, yes, both in the single family and the townhome project, so the entire project will have impact windows. Um, cement tile roof in the entire project, no shingles. Um, we've got, I had a list, I don't know why I'm not referring to it, give me, so I apologize. Um, Taking out building 11. We, we, we have removed, I don't know how you want to handle the removal of the one variance, 
We did ask for one, the front setback variance, you know, 15 hours ago I withdrew that one. Um, and it feels that way. Um, I guess you don't have to carry that one forward. I, I don't, we're, we're not going to provide for that model. We were gonna go through an administrative process to come up with a new model, which process we're now gonna go through to try and work with all of you and staff on a better elevation. So I guess that's a condition also. Um, we would, I mean, the kiddie pool isn't shown today. We're gonna include it as part, part of the pool area. So we'll, we can include that we will include a kiddie pool in the recreational area. Um, and then I think the last one that came up is the removal or, or the, we will not build the last building that's got the number 11 next to it at the north end of the Central Boulevard. We will not build that six unit townhome building at all, and we will leave that as open space, green space, recreation. But space. landscaped, yeah, green, green space, space. Yeah, yeah, with no, some no, benches. We'll, just, and we'll, extend, we'll extend the park. We'll, we'll, okay. ex we'll extend the park okay. area that's immediately to the south of it, and the only thing that will bisect it is that little linear path, so you can cross it. Oh, that, yeah. so, and then to the north of that is our, um, is our uh, dog park. Anyway, so you go dog park, regular park, kid area, pool, clubhouse from north to south. Just for the record, I was holding off on asking to remove Building 11 for the end, seeing where the oh. discussion went. Oh, we've been asked to see if we can, and again. It, just, it makes sense, it's gonna be a much better product. Yeah, so. I think it'll just really create a boulevard. So. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. I don't know if there were any other conditions, sorry, if you had anything else. I just. Yeah, I need, I need I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sure I do. James, if you can give me just a moment. I wanna just clarify, um, you know, I wanna, mentioned that this project reminds me a lot of my first home which was a townhouse community and it does have that long central park in the middle of it so this is having these conditions are, are going to be um, a blessing to those residents um, but what i wish i did have were three exits i wish i had the splash pad you're saying kitty pool now but the splash pad right. is important it's two different things a uh, splash pad, sorry, okay. not the kiddie pool, yes, and, yes I, um, I should know better. I, I wish my community had to, uh, impact windows mm -hmm. and open park space. So I want to just clarify, and I don't know who said it, but if there was any impression that this project was not good enough for the east side, in fact, this is superior to what I purchased on the east side when I became a homeowner for the first time. And um, this is something that I appreciate all these extra conditions and I'm I'm happy to support that request and the deferment to, to have the rest of my colleagues feel more comfortable about it. I think I missed one. Um, oh, what the, else? The dollars, the mm -hmm. additional the dollars of the 300,000. The mayor wasn't going to let me forget it. Um, I um, yeah, so we would, again, the only question is whether it gets added to a prop share agreement or whether it gets contributed through some other vehicle. Like it, I think in the last project when I did it, we just gave the city a check within a certain amount of time. We didn't have an agreement, a separate agreement for it. Um, my, so I, I'm okay with that, Hugo. If okay. we want to list it as a condition, I just need to know at what point uh, are we going to pay this general uh, impact mitigation uh, money uh, to the city? Is it within 30, 60 days from the effective date of the site plan, or is it going to be at the time prior to building permit? Yeah, my, my, Carl, my client just said we'd pay it before the first building permit. I, I mean, it seems to be like an easy thing to remember. Hey, we've got this additional payment to make. So we would offer if, if the council's, um, you, know, uh, you know, happy with that timeline, you know. But, I mean, we haven't discussed that, so if any of you have any other suggestions, we'll take them into consideration. Otherwise, we would offer that we'll make that additional payment, um, the difference between the mm -hmm. prop share amount and 300,000, which by my math is like another 115,000, give or take. But I think the record will be clear that it's 300,000 total. We'll, we'll put that additional amount in a paid to the city um, by the time that we pull our first building permit. So city will have it long before anybody lives in these units or anything like that. All right. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Fletcher, not to belabor the evening, but maybe Julio, I can take Hugo and hang him upside down and get all the change out of his pockets. <laughs> this is just unbelievable that we're sitting here doing, you know, minute by minute, negotiating over costs. I think I think we've lost our way. That's it. 
Any further? All right, so we have a motion and a second to defer items 13 through 21 and 30, 30. 30 to a date certain of December 7th. Correct. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Councilman Fletcher. No. Councilman Raw. Councilwoman Fear Claude Staggers. Yes to defer. Councilwoman Daly. Yes. Councilwoman Avila. Yes. Vice Mayor Guzman. Yes. Mayor Lozner. No, because that's how I'm going to vote on December 7th, even with these concessions. <laughs> Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Arza Thank and company. All. Thanks for hanging in there with us See you, uh, tonight, this ha happy morning. Happy Thanksgiving to all. I uh, wait you. to wish everyone a, a Merry Christmas in December. Should, should we make the analogy that I think we just had our turkeys tonight? But anyway. Okay. Next item. Is it tab 22? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. Tab 22 is a resolution of the City of Homestead, Florida, granting final plat approval requested by SR Acquisitions Homestead LLC for the development of 16 dwelling unit residential subdivision on an approximately 3.959 acre parcel of land generally located south of Northeast Third Court, east of Southwest 162nd Avenue, Farm Life Road, west of Homestead Extension of the Florida Turnpike and north of Southwest 320th Street, Mowry Drive, as legally described in Exhibit A and providing for an effective date. Thank you, Mr. Cordino. Yes, sir, we are, we're recommending approval of the resolution for the final plat. The property is uh, currently zoned R1 and has a future land use map uh, designation of low, LRU, low residential use. Um, the the property is currently vacant. Uh, the city council approved the site plan and the tentative plat um, in 2015. The site plan subsequently uh, expired and was reapproved in 2020. So the applicant is now back uh, to reinvigorate the uh, the final plat. And again, we're recommending approval. Thank you. Um, yes, applicant's representative. Good evening. Can you hear me now? Yes. I'm Thank you, Mayor. I'm just going to recuse myself due to my relationship with the with your client. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Good evening. And I am definitely not as tall as Mr. Arza, so I definitely have to lower this mic. Uh, again, good evening. My name is Alessandria San Ramon with law offices located at 701 Brickell Avenue. I'm here today on behalf of the applicant, SR Acquisitions Homestead LLC. With me is the applicant, um, the representative, Mr. Tony Gonzalez. Again, I'm going to keep this presentation very short and sweet. I know everybody wants to go home, um, but I just want to emphasize that uh, the applicant has already received the necessary underlying zoning approvals uh, for this parcel. As staff has indicated, they are, re they are recommending approval for this project. Uh, the applicant will also be complying with all the conditions in the city code for the final uh, plat. Um, so we're here to answer any questions that you may have. Again, thank you, and we respectfully request approval for this application. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Council. Any initial questions or comments? I'll be open to public hearing and ask if there's anyone in the room or online wishing to speak on this matter. None? All right, so I'll close the public hearing and ask for a motion to approve this item. Moved by Councilwoman Bailey, seconded by Councilwoman Fairclaw Staggers. Are there any final comments from Council? Roll call, Madam Clerk. Councilwoman Fairclaw Staggers? Yes. Councilwoman Bailey? Yes. Councilman Raw? Yes. Councilman Fletcher? Councilwoman Avila? Yes. Dice yes. Mr. May Lozma? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, next item, card number 3204, tab 23. Uh, uh, Mayor, tabs 23 through 27 are all okay. related to the same application. Thank you. Um, per usual, I'll read each of them into the record. We'll have a collective discussion, and you can decide. 
Tab 23 is a resolution of the City of Homestead, Florida, accepting a right-of-way deed conveying title for right-of-way purposes from Public Supermarkets, Inc. for approximately 2,284 square feet of property located along Tennessee Road, Southeast 12th Avenue, Southwest 167th Avenue, south of East Palm Drive, Southwest 344th Street, as additional right-of-way property needed for public access, providing for an effective date. Tab 24 is a resolution of the City of Homestead, Florida, granting site plan approval requested by Public Supermarkets, Inc. for the development of a 40,606 square foot commercial retail supermarket and an ancillary 1,400 square foot package store on an approximately 4.848 acre vacant parcel of land located at 1200 East Palm Drive, Southwest 344th Street within Homestead, Florida, as legally described in Exhibit A and providing for an effective date. Tab 25 is a final order of the City of Homestead, Florida, granting a certificate of use requested by Public Supermarkets, Inc. to permit the sale of beer and wine for off-premises consumption in conjunction with the operation of a commercial retail supermarket on an approximately 4.84-acre vacant parcel of land located at 1200 East Palm Drive, Southwest 344th Street within Homestead, Florida, as legally described in Exhibit A, providing for an effective date. Tab 26 is a final order of the City of Homestead, Florida, granting a waiver of location requested by Public Supermarkets, Inc. to permit the sale of beer and wine and alcoholic beverages for off-premises consumption in conjunction with the operation of a commercial retail supermarket ancillary package store on an approximately 4.84-acre parcel, uh, vacant parcel of land located at 1200 East Palm Drive, Southwest 344th Street, within Homestead, Florida, as legally described in Exhibit A and providing for an effective date. Tab 27 is a final order of the City of Homestead, Florida, granting a certificate of use requested by Public Supermarkets, Inc. to permit the sale of beer, wine, and alcoholic beverages for off-premises consumption in conjunction with the operation of a commercial retail supermarket ancillary package store on approximately 4.84 vacant parcel of land located at 1200 East Palm Drive, Southwest 344th Street, Homestead, Florida, as legally described in Exhibit A and providing for an effective date. Thank you. Mr. Corradino. Yes, sir. We, we're recommending approval of the set of applications. The set of applications, again, consists of five different applications. Um, we have a site plan for the Publix. Again, the, site, the, pub, the Publix is going to consist of uh, a grocery store, about 40,000 square foot. Uh, it, it, they're selling uh, liquor, in, uh, they're selling uh, beer and wine inside, and they have a packaged goods store on the outside. So we've got the site plan. We've got the uh, certificates of use for both the uh, the the beer and wine in the grocery store and the beer, wine and liquor with the package store. We have a waiver of location because several government facilities are within and, and schools are within a thousand square feet of the uh, of the public. So we're, we're, we need to do waiver of location. And as a condition of the site plan, we're doing a, a right of way deed. As a condition of the site plan, the applicant needs to provide an executed right of way deed um, for uh, recording within 20 days from the effective date of the resolution. So it's uh, kind of complicated, but it's not so complicated. There's five things we're recommending approval, and we think they meet the code on all of those. So we'll answer any questions. Thank you. And the applicant is here. Any council questions for staff before we hear from the applicant's representative? Come on down. Josh Remedios from the law firm of Greenspoon Martyr. Firm address is 600 Brickell Avenue, Miami, Florida, 33131. Uh, thank you for bearing with us through this uh, long night as well. I'm gonna keep this short. Um, as staff mentioned, this is a multi-step, multi-component application process here, but essentially we talked about many things in this board's mentioned that they want a the gold standard and a good community operator and a good corporate citizen. There's no better standard than public supermarkets at that location. It's a good team player. They've done a lot of things for the community. We're at 1,200 plus locations in the Southeast United States. Um, you know, one of the things that publics make sure that they do is they're always involved with the community, listening to the needs of the community for whether it's additional items on their store shelves or whatever they can do on the outside of the store. So we're hoping that this board votes to approve this application here tonight. Thank you. Um, is there anyone in the audience or online wishing to speak on any of this group of items in this group of applications for the publics? All right, we'll close the public hearing. Any questions or comments from council for the applicant? Councilwoman. 
Uh, to be brief, my, my, I appreciate this uh, project coming to the neighborhood, um, but my main concern, as with multiple supermarkets, is how, do you, how are you going to control the shopping carts? We have multiple supermarkets in front of our community, my district, and that is a major issue. Um, Matt, if you could clarify um, whether or not the, de the declaration of the shopping cart has been submitted, and when does that get submitted? Um, I, I'm not sure if you know, they have, I think, yet to submit a shopping cart, the, the shopping cart plan. It hasn't, it wasn't requested during the development process. I'm sorry? I, I know it's elsewhere in the code. The code currently requires yes, one to be filed, elsewhere. correct? Uh, yes. Um, it has yet to have been filed, but I'm sure if the applicant would be willing to submit their shopping cart um, management plan. Yeah, I just want to make sure yeah. that as we continue with our conversation with development and right. that we are claiming the gold standard and the higher standards, that we um, are able to execute ongoing maintenance as such. Um, right. Oftentimes, I find that we receive um, construction pro projects here, but then when it comes to maintenance or collecting sure. the shopping carts, it just doesn't happen. We're forgotten. So, you know, we're letting you come in and build, and we invite you, and we're happy that you're coming. But please, you know, make sure that those, um, those, those issues are addressed as well. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Any further? All right. So, um, we have a motion for approval on um, tab 24, the uh, site plan approval. Sorry, one more thing, Mayor. I apologize. On the site plan, did you... Um, did you include a flagpole for an American American flagpole anywhere on the site plan? Would the would your clients be um, opposed to adding an American flag to your site plan? We recently passed a resolution to promote the patriotism in our city on businesses and residences, and that's just one thing I would like to ask. I mean, it's the first I hear of it. If we can accommodate it without having to modify the site plan, <laughs> is that a yes? Find a place for it. Wonderful, thank you. And this is the first time we've met, so I apologize. If, if we had met sooner, I would have, I would have asked. But thank yeah, you. We could have put it in the plan. We would have, I'm sure. But. Thank you very much. I appreciate you accommodating that request. Um, we have to add the yeah. Um, we have to, um, with respect to the site plan, um, the condition that we get the executed right of way deed um, pro within 20 days of approval. Um, we just we have the the deed. We just need it executed. So that'll be added as a condition to the site plan approval. You have the draft poles, correct? And the flagpole. Well, did we have a motion for approval of the site plan with the condition well, of the? Did we take tab twenty three yet? No, we didn't. We didn't take a vote on tab twenty three yet, which was um, the accept the acceptance of the right of way. So if we can start there. Oh, you need to start on the right of way. If we can take, which is tab 23. 23. Okay, I'm sorry. All right. So do we have a motion on tab 23 accepting the right of way deed? Move it. Move. Second by the vice mayor. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Councilwoman Avila. Yes. Councilwoman Faircourt Staggers. Yes. Councilman Fletcher. Yes. Councilman Raw. Yes. Councilwoman Bailey. Yes. Vice Mayor Guzman? Yes. Mayor Lozner? Yes. The motion carried. All right, so now we're tab 24, the site plan approval with the condition of the... the submittal of an executed right-of-way deed within 20 days of approval, if the time frame works. Should be fine. Um, and did we want to add the filing of the shopping cart uh, plan to the condition of approval? Absolutely. All right, so and, do we have a motion to that and, effect? And, uh, wait, Woman? I'm sorry, one more. And the flagpole? Okay. <laughs> so three conditions. Okay. So moved by uh, Councilwoman Avila, seconded by the Vice Mayor. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Councilman Raw. Yes. Councilwoman Bailey. Yes. Councilwoman Avila. By, uh, Councilwoman Faircourt Staggers. Yes. Councilman Fletcher. Yes. Vice Mayor Guzman. Yes. Mayor Lawsner? Yes. The motion counts. Thank you. Next item would be car number 3205, public hearing 2020-28A, 
This is granting a certificate of use to permit the sale of beer of wine for off-premise consumption. Do we have a motion to approve? Moved by the Vice Mayor. Second by Councilwoman Bailey. Any further discussion? Roll call, Madam Clerk. Councilman Fletcher? Yes. Councilwoman Steerclaw Staggers? Yes. Councilwoman Bailey? Yes. Councilwoman Avila? Yes. Councilman Roth? Yes. Vice Mayor Guzman? Yes. Mayor Lozner? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. Need a motion on tab 26, car number 3207. Uh, public hearing 2020-29 for the waiver of location to permit the sale of beer, wine, and alcoholic beverages for off-premise consumption. Have a motion? Moved by Vice Mayor, seconded by Councilwoman Bailey. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Councilwoman Bailey? Yes. Councilwoman Avila? Councilwoman Fairclaude Staggers? Councilman Roth? Yes. Councilman Fletcher? Yes. Vice Mayor Guzman? Yes. Mayor Lozner? Yes. The motion carries. All right, next item, car number 3206, public hearing 2020-28B. Um, final order granting a certificate of use to permit the sale of beer, wine, and alcoholic beverages for off-premise consumption. Motion to approve. Moved by the Vice Mayor, seconded by Councilwoman Bailey. Roll call vote, Madam Clerk. Councilwoman Fearclaude Staggers? Yes. Councilwoman Bailey? Councilwoman Avila? Councilman Fletcher? Yes. Councilman Roth? Yes. Vice Mayor Guzman? Yes. Mayor Lozner? The motion carries. Mayor, Thank before you. you do, before the next yes. tab, if she, oh, I'm sorry, please. <laughs> Thank you. I, Not a manager, I, yes. I apologize. Um, I just want to ask if you could please take tab 31 first, which is the art piece in Lozner Park, because we're going to lose the artist who's on the line before we do 28 and 29. All right, any objections? All right, so Mr. Pearl, tab 31. Yes, Mayor, tab 31 is a resolution of the City Council of the City of Homestead, Florida, approving the Professional Artist Services Agreement with CR Gray LLC, providing for implementation, providing for an effective date. And it's Mr. Which is this you, Madam Manager? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Staff recommends that the Mayor and City Council approve the attached resolution authorizing the City Manager to enter into an agreement in substantially the form attached with C.R. Gray for the animal sculptor and paving art at Lasner Park for a price not to exceed $75,000. This is an agreement for the installation of public art at Lasner Park pursuant to City Code Section 32-48, which requires the city to provide public art equal to 1.5% of the construction cost for new projects for Lozner Park. That amount is $75,000. The art and artist we're asking you to approve tonight was found via an open call for artists posted on the Miami-Dade County Art and Public Places listing service on September 6, 2021. Due to the timing of this project, the Public Art Committee was not involved since their master plan was only approved last month. Some of you have previously seen the concept for animal sculpture and paving art in the Lozner Park plans, which were part of the bid award for construction of the park at the October 2020 council meeting. The art design concept is inspired by the Everglades. There will be two life-size sculptures, sculptures and an American alligator and a snapping turtle, which will be carved from solid blocks of granite. There will also be an animal track design that will be inlaid throughout the hammock garden area of the park. Included in your agenda packet is C.R. Gray's proposal. Staff can go through a very, very brief PowerPoint presentation and the artist is on the line if you have any questions. Thank you, so I'll quickly walk through this PowerPoint presentation, uh, which is just a reiteration of what is already in your agenda packets um, and was submitted by C.R. Gray. So the um, first detail you see here is for the um, gator animal sculpture. It would be roughly 108 inches um, long, 54 inches wide, and 16 inches tall, and carved from a solid block of granite. Um, you, here you see a view from above. The other sculpture here is the um, snapping turtle. This um, measures roughly 72 inches long, 54 inches wide, and 22 inches tall. Once again, um, carved from two solid blocks of granite, one with a green color and one with a darker gray. Here again is a top view. The um, ash gray sample color for the American alligator is seen here. 
and the two sample colors for the um, snapping turtle are seen here. The next um, portion of the art installation would be the animal sculpture tracks. Um, so these would go throughout the Hammocks Garden paving installment, um, which is in the front of the park in the Everglades Garden. And you can see here um, on the left are photos of the actual tracks of, um, of animals. And then on the right are sketches of how they may look uh, installed in the concrete. And if you have any specific questions, um, as mentioned, CR Gray is on the line, um, but we do lose him fairly quickly. He has a 7 a.m. installation. <laughs> questions, comments? Nope. Yes, Council Woman. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just to the artist, I love all the detail. I think that the tracks are going to just add such... It's just going to be, I am incredibly excited to see this. Um, I had one question because there were two renderings. One had a base, and then these new ones do not have a base. So I just want to confirm these are without a base. Are, are you asking me? Yes, please. So when you, I, I believe they sit on top of a, a concrete footing provided by the city. Is that correct, Zachary? Yes, uh, there, there is a footer that is um, going to be, that's going to be anchoring these, but um, the appearance will be that it's level with the ground, if that clarifies. So no longer something for the children to climb over and... So the sculpture itself is climbable, and the height um, is uh, determined by the um, underlayment of the port-in-place um, play rubber that is um, the same that you'll be seeing throughout the um, the rest of the, the play structure area. Okay, no, I was just curious because then the tracks would, it would look a little off if it was up on a pedestal or something. Okay, and then the last thing I just wanted to throw out to my colleagues is especially with the sandblasting opportunity here, that this is a very nice opportunity to possibly do something for Councilman Shelley and his longtime dedication to the Everglades. Just throwing that out there, not sure if there's an opportunity for a little plaque or something to pay a little homage to somebody who spent 12 long years in advocating for the Everglades. It was just one of the first things that came to mind when I looked at these renderings. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. So you need an approval from us on this item? All right, uh, Vice Mayor. Uh, the approval that <clears throat> we're going to offer up now, would that go based off what Councilwoman Bailey just referred to? If we wanted to add that? This, this approval would be for the item to, for approval of the art piece. Um, we, we can follow up on Councilwoman Bailey's request. Okay. And, and we can just bring that back to you and let you know. Any further? All right, so moved by Councilwoman Bailey, second, second by the Vice Mayor. Any further? Roll call, Madam Clerk. Councilman Roth? Yes. Councilwoman Bailey? Yes. Councilman Fletcher? Yes. Councilwoman Fearclaude Staggers? Yes. Councilwoman Avila? Yes. Vice Mayor Guzman? Yes. Mayor Lozner? Yes. The motion carries. Now, since Mr. we're Mayor. back to uh, tab Mr. 28. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, I think we need to yeah. have another motion another. to extend the meeting for another 30 minutes. Right, so let's do a uh, Until 12 ask for a motion to extend the meeting to midnight. I'll make the motion to extend to midnight. Moved by uh, Councilman Fletcher, second by the Vice Mayor. All in favor? Any opposed? All right. Tab 28, Madam Manager. Oh, um. I'm sorry, tab 28 is an ordinance for first reading. It's an ordinance of the City of Homestead, Florida, amending the budgets for each of the several funds and departments of the city for the fiscal year beginning October 1, 2020, ending September 30, 2021, by increasing the total budgeted revenues and expenditures by $2,375,467, providing for severability and an effective date. Staff recommends that the Mayor and Council approve and amend the fiscal year 2021 budget as outlined in the staff memorandum and our finance director is here to further explain and answer any questions. 
Yes, Mayor and Council. Um, normally, these are uh, housekeeping items that come to you on an annual basis in November. This first one is basically an amendment of the 2021. By state statutes, you have within 60 days after the end of the fiscal year to amend your, 20, your previous year uh, budget. Um, and this one's composed of three, three parts. The first part is basically to true up any departments within the general fund that may have exceeded their, their budget appropriations. This year we have three departments. We have the city attorneys, the city manager, and the development services department. The funding from that will come from the contingency account. The second part of the amendment is basically in the disaster relief fund. Last year, if you recall, last year we had the amendment for about $8 million, primarily from the FEMA obligations. This year we had similar obligations made. So basically the appropriation is to cover the expenditures within that fund and also to return monies to the general fund and electric utility for the contributions that they had made originally after the disaster occurred. We needed funding prior to any FEMA obligations happening. So now this is returning the balance of those funds that had been contributed by them. And then the last one is the one that's a little bit unusual for, for this year. It's not normal one. We're requesting the general fund basically return $1.8 million to the water and sewer fund. These were contributions that the water and sewer fund had made between fiscal year 2012 and 2014 when the general fund was being balanced primarily through budget stabilization contributions. So we're asking the council to approve this amendment tonight. Thank you. All right, any questions from council? Okay, so tab 28, car number 3380, do we, well, let me open the public hearing. Is there anyone in the audience or online wishing to speak on this matter? All right, so do we have a motion to approve car number 3380, tab 28? Moved by the Vice Mayor, seconded by Councilwoman Bailey. Roll call. Councilwoman Fairclaude Staggers. Yes. Councilwoman Bailey? Yes. Councilman Roth? Yes. Councilman Fletcher? Yes. Councilwoman Avila? Yes. Vice Mayor Guzman? Yes. Mayor Lawson? Yes. The motion carries. All right. Um, you read this one? Do you yes. need to read this one? Uh, tab 29 is an, another ordinance for first reading. It's an ordinance of the City of Homestead, Florida, amending the budgets for each of the several funds and departments of the city for the fiscal year beginning October 1, 2021, and ending September 30th, 2022, by increasing the total budgeted revenues and expenditures by $8,336,560, providing for a repealer, severability, and an effective date. Thank you. The purpose of this amendment is to roll the amounts encumbered primarily for ongoing capital projects at fiscal year end 2021 into the current fiscal year's budget. This amendment is done annually. It's another housekeeping matter and it's typically done during the month of November. Staff recommends that the mayor and council approve and amend the fiscal year 2022 budget for various funds as per the attached schedule. And Carlos is here if you have any questions. Thank you. Questions from council? All right. Is there anyone online or in the audience wishing to speak on this matter? Not appearing, I'll close the public hearing and ask for a motion to approve. Second. Moved by Councilman Bailey, seconded by Councilman Fletcher. Roll call. Councilwoman Avila? Yes. Councilman Roth? Yes. Councilwoman Bailey? Councilman Fletcher? Yes. Councilwoman Fairclaude Staggers? Yes. Vice Mayor Guzman? Mayor Lozner? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. And finally, first reading on car number 3381, tab number 29. Mr. Pearl? No, that's the one we just did. We're, on, we're jumping to 32 now, because we've done 30 Sorry and 31. About that. Okay. So, car number 349, settlement of claim by Sierra Dina Cross and Curtis Keith Manning, tab 32. Mr. Pearl? Yes, Mr. Mayor, uh, tab 32 is a resolution of the City Council of the City of Homestead, Florida, approving the settlement of all claims made by Sierra and Dina Cross and Curtis Keith Manning, providing for implementation and providing for an effective date. On October 2nd, 2019, Sierra, Adina Cross, and Curtis Keith Manning were involved in a rear-end motor vehicle accident with the City of Homestead customer service truck. Mr. Manning and Ms. Cross alleged to have suffered personal injuries and incurred medical expenses as a result of the accident. 
to avoid the uncertainties and expense of litigation is in the best interest of the city to extinguish all claims of Mr. Manning and Ms. Ms. Cross arising from the accident for the settlement amount of $50,000. Staff recommends that the mayor and council approve the attached resolution settling all claims asserted by Mr. Manning and Ms. Cross and authorizing the city manager to execute all documents necessary to provide payment of the settlement in the amount of $50,000. Thank you. Mr. Perrault, anything further? No, I mean, we had an executive session on this, on this particular matter. It was, you know, they had incurred significant medical expenses. We were supposed to go to trial this month. We were rolled forward, and in the intervening time, um, the plaintiffs were amenable to uh, resolving their claims. So we recommend uh, moving forward with the settlement. Thank you. Close the public hearing and ask if there's anyone present or online wishing to speak on this matter. And appearing, I'll close the public hearing and ask for a motion to approve. Moved by Councilwoman Avila, seconded by the Vice Mayor. Or a question? I have a question. Second with a question. If it's a, <clears throat> if it's a uh, accident, right, a rear end accident, isn't uh, insurance cover that? The city has uh, self-insured retention, which is the, I guess, uh, the equivalent of a deductible. Equivalent of what? A deductible. Oh, okay, got it. Um, and so this, this settlement falls underneath the city's deductible. Understood, thank you. Sure. Okay, thank you, anything further? All right, it's been moved and seconded. Madam Clerk. Councilman Fletcher? Yes. Councilwoman Bailey? Councilwoman Fairclaw Staggers? Yes. Councilman Raw? Yes. Councilwoman Avila? Vice Mayor Guzman? Yes. Mayor Lozner? Yes. The motion carried. Uh, tab 33, car number 3410, settlement of claim for property damage by Jorge Cazares. Sorry, just Mayor. I just wanted to put on the record, I'd like to recuse myself because I work with his wife. Okay. Thank you. you. Mr. Pearl? Uh, yes, Mayor. Tab 33 is a resolution of the City Council of the City of Homestead, Florida, approving the settlement of all property damage claims made by George Cazares, providing for implementation and providing for an effective date. Manager. On March 11, 2021, George Cazares was involved in a motor vehicle accident with the City of Homestead QRT Ford F-350 truck. Mr. Cazares' vehicle, which totaled and alleged to have suffered personal injuries and incurred medical expenses as a result of the accident, Mr. Cazares is willing to execute a property damage release extinguishing any and all property damage claims arising from the accident for the total amount of $15,000. This property damage release will not settle or extinguish Mr. Cazares' personal injury claims, which will remain pending in the lawsuit. Staff recommends that the mayor and council approve the attached resolution settling the property damage claims asserted by Mr. Cazares and authorizing the city manager to execute all documents necessary to provide payment of the settlement in the amount of $15,000. Thank you. Any initial questions or comments from council? Is there anyone wishing to speak on this matter? Not appearing, we'll close the public hearing and ask for a motion to approve. Moved by Councilwoman Avila, seconded by Councilman Fletcher. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Councilwoman Avila? Councilwoman Fairclaude Staggers? Yes. Councilman Raw? Councilman Fletcher? Yes. Vice Mayor Guzman? Yes. Mayor Lozano? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. Next item, car number 3408, Compensation and Benefits Analysis, tab 34. Mr. Pearl? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Tab 34 is a resolution of the City Council of the City of Homestead, Florida, approving the proposal of Evergreen Solutions, LLC, to conduct a compensation and benefits study, providing for an exemption from competitive bidding, providing for implementation, and providing for an effective date. Earlier this year, Mayor and Council directed staff to retain a professional consultant to perform a citywide employee compensation and benefits market study. After review of recent bids and proposals awarded by other municipalities for similar services, staff determined that it would be in the city's best interest to contract Evergreen Solutions, who was awarded a similar project by City of Marco Island via competitive RFP process. Staff recommends that the Mayor and Council approve the attached resolution authorizing the City Manager to enter into an agreement with Evergreen Solutions LLC for a citywide compensation and benefits study in the amount of $49,500. Thank you. Any conventional questions or comments from Council? Well, in the public hearing, is there anyone here who wishes to speak on this matter? And appearing, I'll close the public hearing and ask for a motion to approve. Moved by the Vice Mayor. 
seconded by Council of Warfare Fair Cost Staggers. Any questions or comments on this item? It's a good step forward. Thank you. All right, so let's have a roll call vote, Madam Clerk. Councilwoman Bailey. Councilman Roth. Councilwoman Avila. Councilwoman Faircloth Staggers. Yes. Councilman Fletcher. Yes. Vice Mayor Guzman. Yes. Mayor Lawson. Yes. The motion carries. Next item, tab 35, car number 3395, purchase of three 2022 Toyota Tacoma pickup trucks. Mr. Yes. Pearl. Mr. Mayor, uh, tab 35 is a resolution of the City Council of the City of Homestead, Florida, authorizing the purchase of three pickup trucks for the City of Homestead Parks and Recreation Department, recognizing applicable exemption from engaging competitive bidding pursuant to City Code Section 2-411.1A5, exemptions from competitive bidding, providing for an effective date. Thank you, Madam Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Staff recommends that the Mayor and Council approve the attached resolution authorizing the City Manager to purchase three 2022 Toyota, Toyota Tacoma pickup trucks. Total purchase cost is $81,717. Two of the trucks are part of the City's Capital Improvement Plan, CIP number 2275 and CIP number 2323. The third truck was not part of the City's Capital Improvement Plan and will be used for the new parks inmate crew that was approved for the fiscal year 2022 budget. This purchase will be made in accordance with the Florida Sheriff's Association and Florida Association of Counties contract FSA 20-VEL 28.0 in order to ensure that, ensure that local vendors had an opportunity to participate in this purchase. The procurement division issued a notice of intent to utilize the FSA contract affording local vendors the opportunity to provide a quote and no responses were received. Thank you. Council Fletcher. Yes, Mr. Mayor, thank you. So uh, just a couple of quick questions. So I believe this is going to be our first purchase of a Toyota vehicle for the city of Homestead. I am not 100% sure, but um, I, 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 I'll make that assumption because I believe it is. So I just want to make sure are we going to re start refitting the entire fleet with new pickup trucks because now we got to send somebody to go get trained on how to work on Toyotas eventually, uh, not, not immediately, but at some point in time, we're going to have to get some new tooling and, and things specifically for these vehicles. So uh, yeah, I just, why I'll, do we pick Toyotas when I, I'll follow up, Councilman. I, I apologize. I don't know if it is the first time. If it is, in fact, I can certainly follow up and find out why there was a change. Hey, Councilman, this was recommended um, by the fleet manager as being the most cost-effective and um, the most reliable um, version at this time and we'll certainly get you those additional answers okay i appreciate that just uh again it's it's something new to what we have it will require additional tooling and additional training thank you thank you councilman i had a similar question and concern that, you know my understanding is these you know have a reputation to be gas hogs and uh probably a little more expensive than some of the other smaller uh pickup trucks so that was that was my concern as to what the background was for for going to a to a Tacoma rather than sticking with the Fords or the Chevrolets so can we move forward on a conditional basis that we get additional information or do we hold off until we get that information with this this purchase manager well, we can certainly move forward and approve it on the condition that we get the answers to these questions. Um, whether it's a gas guzzler and or it's going to require new training and different maintenance technique, techniques. And if, in fact, it does, then I'm assuming it could be, the motion could be such that it then would not be approved. Um, well, it's kind of hard to do without specific um, parameters in terms of if we meet what, 17 miles a gallon, then it's, it will move forward. Uh, I'm sure, what conditions would you like to place on the approval? So we My can, condition would be, uh, is, there, is this a time-sensitive purchase right now, or can we hold off until the next council meeting to have this discussion? I, I, don't, I don't think it would be a problem to hold off to the next one, but I, I, do, I am being told that it's more fuel efficient that the 21.5 <laughs> miles per gallon, um, 20 city, 23 highway. I don't know what the other trucks get. Mr. Mayor, I move to defer this until the next meeting. Until I'm, we get some I'm assuming that it's okay to defer. Okay. So we have a motion to defer. We have a second. second. Mm -hmm. A second by Councilman Avila. Well, let's buy American if we can. 
Do we need a roll call on that? No. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Moving right along. Tab, tab 36. Our number 3404, Florida Department of Transportation Occupant Protection Grant. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Tab 36 is a resolution of the City Council of the City of Homestead, Florida, accepting a grant award from the State of Florida Department of Transportation in order to address the high rate of automobile injuries and fatalities due to the non-use of occupant protection through enhanced law enforcement activities, approving the grant agreement, authorizing the City Manager to execute the grant agreement, establishing a budget in the amount of $55,000, the expenditure of grant funds and providing for an effective date. Thank the you. police uh, department has applied for and received this grant from the Florida Department of Transportation and this is a grant we have received in the past. Staff recommends that the mayor and council approve the attached resolution authorizing the city manager to execute the contract agreement with the state of Florida Department of Transportation for a grant in the amount of $55,000 which will fund occupant protection enforcement and educational activities. Would it be fair to say that this is going to be utilized to pay overtime to assign officers specifically to a to an enforcement detail? Is that what we're really looking at here? I need to confirm. I'm not sure if this is one of the grants that authorizes overtime. Chief, do you know the answer to that? Actually, I apologize. I know the answer to that. It is police overtime. It is, it is. And in fact, um, the grant, it does fund police overtime and certain fringe benefits. And do we have an idea? Is that going to be limited to just a couple of our members or is it spread out? How is it targeted to, to certain positions? I'm assuming because it's traffic control, it would be among the traffic division. Okay, thank you. Okay. Is there anyone in the audience or online wishing to speak on this? Nope. We'll close the public hearing. Any further questions or comments from council? We have a motion to approve. Moved by Councilwoman Avila, seconded by the Vice Mayor. Roll call, Madam Clerk. Councilwoman Fairclaw Staggers? Yes. Councilwoman Bailey? Yes. Councilman Fletcher? Yes. Councilman Roth? Yes. Councilwoman Avila? Vice Mayor Guzman? Mayor Lozner? Yes. The motion carried. Next item, tab 37, car number 3406, State of Florida, Office of the Attorney General, Victims of Crime Assistant Grant. Mr. Pearl. Yes, Mr. Mayor, tab 37 is a resolution of the City Council of the City of Homestead, Florida, accepting a grant award from the State of Florida, Office of the Attorney General, in order to provide victim advocacy services to crime victims, training of victim advocates, and approving the grant agreement, authorizing the City Manager to execute the grant agreement, establishing a budget in an amount of $168,502 for the expenditure of grant funds, and providing for an effective date. Thank you. Madam Manager. Thank you, Mayor. The Police Department has applied and received a grant award from the State of Florida Office of the Attorney General in the amount of $168,502. The grant will fund three SOS victim advocates. The victim advocates will work in collaboration with law enforcement in order to provide support services to victims of crime. There is a cash match of $39,236.68, which is met through a Homestead Police Detective salary, 30%, and the Detective Supervisor's salary, 10%. The three advocates will serve 2,400 victims during this grant period. This is also a grant that we have received in the past. Staff recommends that the mayor and council approve the attached resolution, authorizing the city manager to execute the contract agreement with the state of Florida Office of the Attorney General for a grant in the amount of $168,502, which will fund the salary of three victim advocates. Thank you. All right, is there anyone in the audience or online wishing to speak on this matter? All right, do we have any questions, comments from council? I have a motion to approve. Move it. Moved by Councilwoman Avila, mm -hmm. seconded by the Vice Mayor. Any further, roll call, Madam Clerk. Councilman Roth. Councilwoman Avila. Councilwoman Fairclaude Staggers. Yes. Councilman Fletcher. Yes. Councilwoman Bailey. Vice Mayor Guzman. Yes. Mayor Lozman. The motion. Thank you. I'm glad we don't have tab 38 now. All right. All right. Is there anyone still here who signed up for public comment? I think Mr. Kraft left us a little while ago. Anton's gone. David Goodwin. The 
mic's on, give us your name and address for the record, and we'll put you on the three-minute time clock. Welcome. Thanks for staying so late. Yeah, it's, uh, good grief. It's four hours past my bedtime. <laughs> okay. Uh, but there's several issues there, but I want to deal with the major ones. And basically this, uh, I want uh, uh, 30 to 60 days additional to finish uh, getting my property cleared. Uh, uh, the, the thing is, is this, is that uh, I'm my age, I'm 75, and I've been dealing with high health problems, uh, sciatica, which I've cured. I uh, still got prostate, I'm doing research on and three different forms of arthritis. arthritis. I have no reliable help. Uh, the only one I did have, he died and uh, two months ago, and all the rest of them are on there just been stealing from me. and. Uh, and there's no one to depend on uh, except for me, but I'm getting my body in shape so I can take care of business. Okay, the other thing has to deal with uh, the charges from this towing company that was uh, laid on me back in 2019. And the thing is, is this, is that it's... Uh, it was, if it wasn't for the police officers here, uh, just uh, waking me up, and I managed to get a trick, and got my, my license was okay, and I got a plate for my vehicle, but it's got everything else blocked up, you know, trailers, my other vehicles, the whole nine yards. And uh, I want uh, the city to go and tell this tow company to knock this thing off because it's a, it's a, a uh, it's blocking, it's a block on my license and blocking on my plates and everything else. And the thing is, is they've been compensated. The city of Homestead compensates that towing company on a yearly basis, that's one. And two, they took my vehicles and they got compensation for that. Uh, I, you know, I'm crazy, David. <laughs> I was, did an experimentation of getting diesel engines to run off of cooking oil. And, uh, and what they did is the, the city, on an unannounced uh, thing, they had this towing company and take up uh, eight of my vehicles along with trailers and everything else. But this, the, the ma that's something else. The major thing is this towing company, they need to get off of it. And I've talked to people at the state and they don't know what to do. And uh, I mean, it's just, it's just something else. And I don't want to take the, the, the city to court and, the, you know, the state to court and that kind of those, them also. So. Well, your first issue, though, apparently this arises from a city homestead code enforcement issue and you have a deadline that's passed or looming. I'm sorry, you're talking too fast. Okay. I was way before As, I was, I was right. a lot of Mine too. Um, your first item, I'm assuming, has to do with a city of homestead code enforcement issue where you were given a deadline within which to comply. I need additional time on that, yes. I need additional time. And uh, 30 days more, but 60 days would be really great because I've got to do it myself. And I've got my body to a point that I can do it. But uh, that's the thing. Okay. And, Let and me have the manager chime in here. Yes, what we can do, sir, we can have someone speak to you right now and get your information. We'll find out what the code issue is, and we'll follow up and see what we can do. Yes, I have some paperwork on it, too. Okay, oh. so we, okay. we'll get that information from you, and we'll follow up. Okay, fine. Good. Thank you. And the other thing has to do with this towing company, because basically, I can't put a legal plate on my trailer, and I need to use that to get the stuff off my property, and and to do a whole bunch of other things. And this is just ridiculous. Just if it was a killing company under contract with Homestead, perhaps, you know, when staff helps you out with the other issue, maybe we can help you sort through that. Okay, great. All right. Thank um, you. Uh, I'm impressed by you guys. I'm retarded. I mean, retired. Well, same difference. <laughs> and uh, you, 
you've done wonderful things. But right now I'm freezing. <laughs> and I'm tired. <laughs> I'm extremely tired. <laughs> so, thank you. Good night. Good night. All right. Oh, thank you, thank you. All right. Is there anyone else wishing to speak? I don't have anyone else who has signed up. Is there anyone else wishing to uh, make a public comment tonight? All right. Anything further, Madam Manager? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, I have one thing. I would like to express my thanks to every member of this council and to the many staff members and friends and colleagues who have been so incredibly kind to me this past week for your words, for your encouragement, your support. I don't know if I have words that can express how deeply my heart has been touched by what you've given me, but I do know that I'll never forget it. So I thank each and every one of you. Thank, thank you. you guys. All right, I think we have one more person who wanted to speak. If you wish, you can pull down your mask. We might be able to okay. understand you a little yeah, better. Please. Give us your name and address, please. Okay, Dominique Jones, um, 1250 Southeast 31st Court in Homestead. This is my first time doing this, so I apologize if I'm not in protocol. Um, so my issue or what I would like to address is uh, it's three things, but they all kind of fall in the same place. Um, so the first thing is, I live in Gardens 2, um, which is around Gardens 2, Gardens 1, Keys Cove, and I think the Groves. Uh, I'm fairly new to this, so I had to pull up the map so I know the exact uh, streets. So I think that's 13th Avenue when you go into, you know, all those places. We have no, we have street lights, but they don't work. Um, and we have a bunch of kids that go to school there, and it's completely dark. Um, there's not a real sidewalk there, so I just wanted to see what I would need to do to maybe get some lights on that road for the kids and possibly me. Um, there was a speed bump at one point in time. It was removed and never put back, so it's just a bunch of people just driving all fast. Um, so that part. Um, the next thing was for the Homestead High School, Senior High, which is across the street. Um, I don't know how crossing guards work. I know it's a high school. Um, I do know that we do put certain protections for bike riders and different things, which is great. Um, but they're high school kids, and that is a very difficult and complicated little walkway there. There's a roundabout. There's a back way with trucks and stuff that I don't even know if that actually has a street name. But there are no crossing guards, there's no light, um, there's just no direction of traffic, they just kind of walk wherever they can. Um, so that was the second one. And the third thing is there are school zone lighting, but they don't work. So those flashing yellow lights that tend to work in the school down the street, they don't work for Homestead High School. Um, so I was trying to see if we can get that fixed as well. So. Very good. Well, if you could uh, speak with Mr. Good and, and pinpoint perhaps where those lights are, and if they're ours, we'll see what's wrong. And if they belong to FPNL, we'll okay. get on the phone with, with Florida Power and Light. And I think it's, it's a county issue for the flashing lights. And again, if you can help us pinpoint where those are, we can, uh, can work with the county public's works uh, group to get that done. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. That's it. Any further, Madam Manager, on your end? No, I just wanted to say thanks. We only have three minutes left and probably not going to get another extension. Mr. Pearl? Uh, no, we're, I'm fine tonight. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, Councilwoman Bailey. Thank you, Mayor. First and foremost, I would like to offer my heart felt condolences to the friends and family of our previous councilman McCormick. It was incredibly surprising and sad to hear of his passing and I just wanted to extend that to his friends and family. At our last meeting, we had quite a few residents here from Homestead Gardens. Um, thank you, Councilman Roth, for helping me get in touch with uh, one of the ladies that stayed after. I ended up going the next morning and visiting two of the residences there. I spoke to a third. 
And to say that the living conditions in those two apartments were deplorable, there's just no, no better word to describe it. Um, since I visited, they have been, um, they did get an appointment with their maintenance or whatever they call it. Um, I know it's a county facility, but I just wanted to put it on the record, and I'm sure that I speak for all of us up here, that if any of our Homestead residents ever have issues, including lights at Homestead High School, even if, it, if it's a county issue and you are not getting the responses that you need, that we are here and will listen. Um, please, 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 I hope that you could join me on November 20th, there is an amazing Haiti Praise and Benefit concert. I know that 100% of the proceeds are going to help the families that have just been dealing with way too much that any family should ever deal with. Um, so November 20th, there's more information on our Southwest Advisory website. And lastly, December 19th, we are hosting a cookie and crafts holiday event at Roby George Park and are looking for different organizations. And of course, my colleagues, I would love if you could join. Um, any organization is welcome to host one of the stands and offer something for the community and be able to share the resources that they are providing. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Councilman oh. Roth. I'm sorry, really quickly, happy birthday to my favorite nephew ever. <laughs> I'm missing his party tonight. Thank you. Councilman Roth. Good. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I had a couple things, but I'm only going to bring up one item tonight, which is, uh, I think, very important for us to begin the conversation of uh, in relating to Kate and her re resignation. Um, you know, most of you know that uh, I'm a proponent of hiring from within. So um, when we did this for Kate, she was the next woman up. And I think in this case, we have a, a very talented assistant city manager uh, that's earned a opportunity to continue the legacy that Kate will leave us beginning February the 10th. And I was just wanting to uh, put it out there that um, this is, a, to me, is very important that we have stability in the city, that we have uh, continuity, that the staff going into the new year understands that the council supports them, supports the leadership that's in the city now, and um, there's always an opportunity from within to succeed within the city itself. Jerry's been extremely loyal to this city. Jerry's worked for this city for well over 25 years. He's worked his way up through the ranks and has been in the city manager's office for at least six years. And I would really like to hear um, comments from the rest of you and if you uh, feel the same way I do that it's important for us to hire from within whether it be at the city manager's level park and recs the police department or whatnot that we seriously consider giving Jerry the opportunity asking the, the city attorney to prepare a contract and allow for the city to continue to move forward as it has uh, over the last six, seven years. And I'd like to hear what anyone else here has to say in reference to this. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Vice Mayor, you can put your hand on the trigger. Um, I agree with what Councilman Roth is saying. Uh, it gives a good message to just about every department that we work with, saying that you could start, you know, 25 years ago and work your way up the chain. Um, so I, I'm in agreement with uh, Councilman Roth. Thank you. Councilman Fletcher, did you? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I don't believe I'm at the good point to make a decision like that at 12 o'clock at night on a, on a, sorry, a Thursday morning now. Um, 
I think we need to have this discussion at length. Uh, I believe that uh, we need to uh, collegially come to an agreement on, on who's going to be replacing Ms. McCaffrey. Um, I think we need more time than a rushed vote at midnight on a th Thursday morning. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Fletcher. Any further? No. Council Walden? Um, is this on the agenda for the COW meeting, or is it, uh, what did you have in mind, Larry, or Councilman Law? Well, if, if it were to go the way I feel it would go, is that, that we would give the city attorney uh, directions to draw up a contract similar to what Kate received, and then um, at the next available meeting, we would ratify that contract and allow Jerry to take over February the 10th. So Proce procedurally, Mr. Pearl, that's not even something that we can vote on tonight because it was not a specific agenda item. Is that correct? Well, no, you can certainly vote to give me direction to prepare something and, and bring back to you for ratification. I don't have a contract to present to you for approval. But if you want to vote to give me direction to prepare something to bring back at uh, the subsequent meeting, then you're free to do so. Thank you, Mr. Pearl. I think I'm comfortable with um, bringing back a contract for consideration so we can discuss it at the next meeting. And we're not making any votes tonight. Somebody needs to make a motion. I'm sorry? Well, for, for, for protocol, what, what should we do? If I, I'm going to request that a contract be brought forth, that be, one be prepared for um, Jerry Estrada to uh, segue into the city manager's position beginning the day um, of her resignation, which I understand is February 9th. It's actually February 8th, just February for clarification. 8th. So to, to align with that so that there's stability within the city, there's continuity that city staff will not be uh, interrupted in anything they're doing. They've proven to us that they're all professionals. Jerry would be a professional leader and it sends a signal to city employees who are loyal, that have worked hard, have served with integrity and transparency, will always be rewarded for their efforts in the city. And that's exactly how I feel whenever I make a decision when it comes to personnel. So that's what I'm asking for. If it has to be in the form of a motion, then I'll make the motion to give direction to the city attorney to please draft a contract for Jerry Estrada for us to review at the next opportunity, whether it be a Cal meeting. We have a special call already December the 7th. We can add that to it. And ensure that the city doesn't skip a beat. Staff understands who their manager will be. We understand who our manager will be. And we can continue to move the city forward. That's the motion I guess I would make. We have a second? I'll second for discussion. Okay, thank you. We have a motion to second. I wish to weigh in. Councilwoman Fairclough Staggers. Yes, thank you. I wanted to weigh in a little bit. Apologies if I'm not as polished, but when Councilwoman Bailey mentioned Melvin McCormick, and I, I too give my condolences, as you know, as my ex husband, um, almost 20 years together, so kind of threw me off. But God is good. So to weigh in this a little bit, I believe there is value when you have the talent from within. I am a part of an organization that values promoting from within. And if there's an opportunity 
for you to lateral up into those positions, we're given that opportunity as long as you're qualified, competent, and credentialed. When I think of, of Jerry Estrada, I think of someone who is homegrown, who has put in the sweat equity and the work um, from, I believe, a computer tech to um, over the IT department. I don't know his resume off the top of my head, but he's worked his way um, up in the system. He has worked collaboratively with various departments, so he understands this city from various perspectives. He has been a part of the growth of this city in good times and in bad, through Hurricane Andrew, through all the, the storms, during COVID, when he worked on the virtualization of city departments. He was very instrumental in that. And I believe that Jerry is his own man he stands on his own merits. The past 10 years I've worked with him, he has been very efficient. He's respectful, he's responsive. And I think that he would be an amazing leader to lead over the 500 employees here in the city of Homestead. I believe um, they will coalesce and galvanize and, and work alongside of him. And I think that's critically important. I thought about a national search. And when I thought about that, I'm like, if you have that talent from within, why not reward that talent? And then with the national search, this is the holiday season, it's going to take months to eventually agree on somebody and then to bring them on board. And they won't have the opportunity for a smooth transfer, a smooth transition from with um, our current city manager to with them because you'll be gone on February 8th and we won't have anyone by then. So I think in some instances, a, a national search is definitely in order. But with this one, when we have a clear, homegrown um, candidate who can carry this city forward and continue the projects because he has that institutional knowledge, he's not beholden um, from what I've seen to any one of us. He's very fair and efficient and um, responsive to all of us. And I mean, no disrespect when I say this, Kate, but if I believe I'm a little bit more excited, <laughs> um, laddering, well, promoting Jerry into that position, um, for the mention, for the reasons um, that I have just stated. So if we decide now, decide later, I'm going to stick with Jerry um, for those reasons. So I, I would support bringing back a contract to move forward with Jerry Estrada, um, at which time when you retire on February 8th. So thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Jerry Estrada is the safe choice. I have a good working relationship with him. But I do not believe that in the big picture of where this community is headed and the potential we have, he is not the best choice. I guess some of y'all probably read my email when, when Kate left. Jerry's very near the end of his career. He does not have a spouse or children who are involved in this community. He does not live in this community. He doesn't run over the potholes we have to run over. He doesn't have to face people in the grocery store. And I believe we need somebody younger with a lot of years of career ahead of them that always want to work harder and do better and be more aggressive. And no disrespect to Jerry. There's a lot of a lot of second fiddles in this world, but very few top bananas, and not everybody is meant to be a top banana. And I believe that if we're going to reach the potential that this city needs to reach, we talked to the City Hall proposers tonight about bringing your top game. We talked to D.R. Horton about bringing a better product. We're, we're always talking, we've got the the uh, blockchain guys coming. Maybe we're going to have some city hall people coming back. I think we need somebody who is less comfortable in the position and will be more aggressive and think more out of the box. And quite frankly, I think it would be beneficial for our entire staff to work for someone who knows them all equally, and that is without predisposition. And I believe they will all rise to a higher level. Um, I really think this is a, a rash decision. I would support naming Jerry as the interim city manager 
for as long as we need to, but really, are the guys that work and girls that work out on the street, does who the city manager is really impact their lives? No. Their supervisor and their department head impacts their lives. So I don't buy into this stability and confidence and all this kind of stuff and upheaval that a, that a managerial search would bring. I think it's time to get out of our comfort zone. And I'm, I would support hiring Jerry on an interim basis, but I believe that we need to go out for a national search and bring in some new thinking, new talent, at a different point in their career that is going to live in the city limits and, and see what we see in our residents see rather than getting in their car and going back home to Palmetto Bay or Kendall, wherever it is every day. And again, no disrespect to Jerry. He and I have already had phone conversations. That's, that's where I am. Is there, a mo is there a motion? Was there a motion made? Was it seconded? Yes. And the motion made. is to direct the attorneys to prepare a contract for Jerry to be hired and named as the city manager. The way that I heard it was prepare an agreement um, to, for a December 7th special call. Um, the agreement would become effective upon Kate's uh, resignation, so February 8th. Is that... Did I get that correct? Mr. Mayor. Councilman Fletcher. The way I understood the motion was to bring the contract to us for review, not as for approval. I thought that, you know, contracts are meant to be reviewed and, uh, you know, length of term on some of these contracts that we provide, I tend to believe are, are longer than necessary. Let's go back just one step. Recently, I, I've taken a new position within my company and I'm replacing myself. I've looked within, I've looked outside, and the current state of that organization, I believe we need somebody with a fresh set of eyes. I had a discussion with Jerry the other day. You know, he was not uh, feeling 100%. You know, we, 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 we scheduled an additional time to talk next week. And I think I need to give him that opportunity to have that discussion with me one-on-one -on -one before I make that decision. And I think each of us would want to have that opportunity to have that one-on-one -on -one in phase conversation with, with the gentleman to ensure that uh, we all understand what his vision is for the city. Because sitting here tonight, I don't know what his vision is. I don't know what his outlook is for long-term employee strength and, and growth. So we need to have that opportunity to have that discussion before we start granting contract to employees. Uh, that's my two cents for the evening, thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Anything further? So, Mr. Just, Pearl, I, you want I, to repeat the motion, please? I, I, because um, Councilman Fletcher raised a question as to whether when it's presented, it's for approval. Is that the motion? Or Okay, so when it's presented to Council, then it would be for uh, approval. Um, and it would be placed on the agenda as an action item. To that presupposes or, that Mr. Estrada would accept the terms of the contract. All right, so let's have a roll call vote. Councilwoman Avila? Yes. Councilwoman Fearclaw Staggers? Yes. Councilman Roth? Councilman Fletcher? Councilwoman Bailey? I just want to state for the record that I do support bringing Jerry into the position. I don't think that we get any more A game than hiring from within, but I do think we should have some time to review the, con the contract. So I'm gonna say no. Vice Mayor Guzman? Yes. Mayor Lozner? The motion carries. All right, anything further, Councilman Roth? That it? All right. Councilwoman Faircloth Staggers? Yes, I just have one question for staff. Um, a resident contacted me regarding the lighting at um, Roscoe Warren Park. Because, you know, the time has changed, it gets darker earlier, and she tends to walk that area in the evenings. So she inquired um, or asked, was it possible to keep the lights on, um, the lights that we have there, we can keep those lights on 
a bit later. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Okay, thank you. And I wanted to commend Councilwoman Bailey on her Thanksgiving um, dinner in the Southwest community. I enjoyed that event with Bailey and Councilwoman Avila and our children, our family out there. It was a wonderful event um, for the community and I thank you for the invitation to attend and I look forward to your cookies and crafts on December 19th. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilwoman. Councilman Fletcher. I would just like to say how excited I was to see all the former council people in the chambers tonight while we were discussing these uh, very important items. We had uh, Vice Mayor, former Vice Mayor Burgess, former Councilman Maldonado, and I believe former Councilman Maldonado was here. And, and, and they were all providing their insights, you know, into the future of our town. And I wish they would continue to stay involved and provide us uh, and reach out to us rather than just show up at a meeting and, and, and stand in a corner and look at us. So I would hope that they would reach out and have discussions with us in the future if they want to continue to be active in the city. I, I'm going to tell you guys tonight, I'm just beside myself with the way we handled a few things this evening. I think we might as well have had a gun pointing at some of these individuals tonight, asking them for, for additional money for roadways. You know, we, we held them hostage and they're back there making deals in, in, the, in the last minute to give this city additional money. We should be ashamed of ourselves. With that, that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and good night. Thank you, Councilman Fletcher. Councilman Avila. Thank you, Mayor. I have a resident here that uh, would like to request, I have a special request, and uh, I have other things to talk about, but you've waited so long. Just a little, huh? It's only been seven hours. You ready? So I, I give you the floor. Where else can you get the show that you got no, tonight? No, absolutely. You gave a great show. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> there is information in your packet behind tab 39 if you want to reference while he speaks. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. I'm only going to speak for another 30 minutes, and we're good to go. No, just kidding. My name is Benjamin. I'm a resident of Homestead for a little bit over 20 years. I moved down here when Waterstone reads, uh, opened. I'm a resident of Waterstone. But I also run, uh, I'm a director of a, a non-for-profit organization called Hombres con Propósito, Men with Purpose. And what we've been doing since then is serving our community. I've had the privilege and the honor to have some of you in our events, um, like, for instance, the Man of the Year event. Last year uh, and this year through pandemic, we were able to feed over 20,000 uh, uh, homes here in Homestead. And we continue. And it's a group of men, professional men, that are residents of Homestead that Wherever there is a need, we get together as professionals. We gather, you know, from our, from our resources and talk to people, and, and we're here to serve the community. We believe that it's not your responsibility only to help out the community. It's also our responsibility to contribute. Um, and I've had the privilege to be with Chief Rose, serving uh, the police officers, um, bringing out some breakfast. And, I'm not gonna continue because it's late, but the reason why I'm here, it's because we're putting together an event for the past four years, but last year, it grew the event. We had over 300 children open to everyone in the community. Um, and I'm requesting if this year, you guys will grant me the, the City Hall Plaza so we can give out toys for the kids. It's gonna be December 18. I'm only requesting maybe three to four hours it's not going to be a major event. It's only we're going to bring the toys. Maybe we'll bring Santa Claus. Um, and then we'll give out toys for about an hour, two hours, about two to 500 toys. And I'm just requesting permission. I have no people in the city that they have done it without permission. Uh, but I think since we've been growing and it's a right thing to do it, it's, I think it's worth coming out here and, and, and asking permission to all of you. Please. Thank you. So I support this request. Uh, has, he, has he alluded to, I, I have driven around our, our city hall in the evenings and I've seen people hosting small gatherings with microphones uh, in the evening hours and I know that I haven't seen that come across our desks to approve. Um, so I commended him when he reached out and said, hey, can we use the, the, the plaza in the courtyard the at court, city yeah. hall? So I support this request. I know that um, we had some, some brief discussion on it in the past with some other events, and so we don't have a policy per se, so it's really up to us as to whether or not we're going to prove it. And um, as we have had a history of working together with the Man of the Year event, 
I can um, confirm and I have the confidence to know that they're not going to leave any messes, they're going to be responsible, and they'll be able to um, clean up after themselves or even leave it better than the way they found it, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yeah, very good. So with that, I'd like to make a motion to approve this request, and I uh, would ask for a second and approval. Thank you. Second. <clears throat> All right. Mr. Pearl, was this one of those situations where we may be better off to turn a blind eye to them being here? Is this opening a can of worms of insurance and security and all those kinds of things versus the groups that just show up spontaneously? Um, we don't typically treat, as with all city hall plaza issues, um, as I've said, we've had this conversation several times now, we don't have a policy. Um, you have on occasion allowed people in one-off situations to, to operate. Um, with, sometimes you've put conditions on that, other times you, you have not. Um, you know, I, in the absence of the, you know, speaking with the risk manager and what we're covered for and not, you know, people can trip and fall walking across that whether we're giving out toys or not. So, uh, I, I'm, well, I'm let, not over let me let me ask man. How do we handle concerned. the menorah lighting, for example? That's a that's a known event. They have permission to be here. Let's let's make that analogy. How how do we handle that? I I think that's a great analogy because I don't I think we just gave permission. I don't think there were any specific requirements with respect. And actually, there was almost a pretty serious accident, as I recall. At the last one I went to with you, Mayor, when you almost fell off the ladder, if you may recall. <laughs> In any event, I don't think we required anything special for that. Well, I think there's your answer. Well, thank you. And yeah. if there is anything that comes up between now and the 18th, I'm sure that you can organize it and they'll be happy to um, satisfy. Absolutely. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks thank for staying. You. Appreciate it. If I may continue, yes, Mayor, yes. I'll try to be as brief as possible. Um, I want to invite everyone to come out also on the 20th, which is this Saturday. Uh, Waterstone Community is having their um, annual tree lighting ceremony. It's a huge event in a large community, and it is open to the public. Uh, I'm an official sponsor. It'll be from 5.30 to 9.30. They've also um, advertised pictures with Santa. Uh, that you have to sign up for on Eventbrite. I think they might have been booked up with 600 reservations. So this is a huge community event. It's not just from my district. And um, they have asked for um, a slight consideration for assistance with their solid waste services. Those fees come in just under $500. And so they did ask if there was a way for our solid waste department to either waive it or if we as a council um, would want to do it. So I I open it up for discussion. Thank you. I don't believe we can waive those funds, but I think that you guys can fund it, correct? Thank you. So if um, I, I'm seeing some head nods, so if my assistant I'll, can reach I'll out. I'll sponsor half of it, $250. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate that. Um, so thank you. Uh, Mayor and Councilwoman. All right, and I just want to say happy Thanksgiving to everyone, okay? <laughs> Let's try to leave this on a happy note. Happy Thanksgiving. I'm very happy for all of you, for my colleagues. We don't agree on everything, but it is a pleasure to work alongside of all of you, and I look forward to um, getting through the holidays. Um, take, take a moment to thank your garbage worker, your garbage collector, your postal worker, um, as well as your local police officers. They're so amazing, and they work very hard, and the holidays get tougher for all of those departments. Uh, so uh, I appreciate you, and I thank you. Congrats to Councilwoman Bailey on that awesome dinner event. It was inspiring. I want to do something similar, so I'll probably partner with you in the future. And um, I wanted to ask if over the holidays, if we can come back in January, please, with um, uh, follow up on some of the requests that have come up in the, the last couple of months. Specifically coming to mind is Councilman Roth's request for an analysis on the Showbiz Plaza commercial space. I, I frequent there often with my family to the Cyberium, and it is a beautiful jewel, but then when we start to walk from there to Showbiz Cinema, 
and we're passing through those vacant spaces, it's very eerie. It's, it's been it's just been way too long, and I don't recall having a, a conversation as a follow up to Councilman Roth's request as to what's going on, what is the problem, what are their prices, the market is booming, what's going on there. Um, I can tell you that from observation, I'm walking by pavers that have sticky um, uh, gum on the floor, dirt, garbage, um, I don't know if it's pet droppings, whatever, but the windows as well, they're dirty, they're dusty, they've got cobwebs. That's not great curb appeal when you're trying to market a property uh, for rent. So please, if we can get that back, and also the parks master plan and development services workshops, please let's continue to make that a priority. We're, we've, we've only had a few discussions on it and then it's like, it goes away. Let's keep it a standing item on the agenda so we can get an update on these items every single meeting, whether there's something for us to discuss in, at length or not. And when you do come back for the parks master plan, um, can you have them weigh in please on the multimodal transportation options that we're hearing about with regards to the old city hall site, such as the bike path. Um, and some of the other items that they've mentioned from the old city hall site to the downtown, how that incorporates with our JD Red um, uh, Park and um, how that just adds to the parks master plan in general. So I'll rest with that, thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. You sure? Okay, save it for December 7th. All right, a long night. All right, my first item of business is the appointment to uh, Two seats to the Homestead Housing Authority Board. I've circulated some background on Mr. Baronis and Mr. Accursio and would appreciate your approval of their appointments to uh, fill expired, uh, one expired term and a resignation on that board. Moved by Vice Mayor, second by Councilwoman Bailey. Are there any objections? Okay, thank you. All right, and a reappointment of Mr. Compton to the Planning and Zoning Board to fill out um, the unexpired portion of the term that he had to leave in order to uh, file to run for office. Is it moved by Councilwoman Bailey, second by the Vice Mayor, all in favor? Thank you. And a new addition, uh, Dorinda Darnell Garbars. You may know her as Designs by Dorinda. She is a resident of the Northwest. Uh, any objections? We have motion to approve. Move to approve. Okay. All in favor? And appointment to the Public Art Committee. I guess Katie could only hang out for so long. She still, there she is, still back there. Thank you for hanging in there with us. And she comes to us at the recommendation of Councilwoman Avila to fill an empty seat on the Public Art Committee. Any opposition to her appointment? And finally, again, another um, request from Councilwoman Avila, an appointment of Margaret McGarty, who's been a longtime downtown activist to the Historic Preservation Board. Any objections? All right. I have nothing further that would not just be a repeat of the other holiday greetings and uh, compliments that have been extended tonight. If anyone is in opposition to a motion to adjourn, they're welcome to sit here for the rest of the night. Thank you all. Good night. <laughs>